And the word. What's the okay. word? I've called? never done this on air. No. So the word virgin, you would think he'd use the word alma. So look up the Hebrew that he's using. The word betula will appear in the Hebrew of Franz Delic Price. This oh my God. Betula. Christian Septuagint that was used to then correct or back up to wipe away the dirty fingerprints of the New Testament and back up all the corruption in the New Testament. Lucifer doesn't appear anywhere in the Christian Bible. It's nowhere in the Greek. It shouldn't be in the Hebrew Bible because it doesn't say that in the Hebrew Bible. If the Jesus of the Talmud is the Jesus of Christianity, then Jesus was conceived through adultery and did not have a human Jewish father because his actual biological father was a Roman soldier. Could it be that the Joseph character, being Joseph, the husband of Mary, was a later invention to cover this? Where do we find Joseph, the husband of Mary? Is he mentioned in the letters of Paul? None of them. to the Gnostic Informant, and today you are about to attain true Gnosis. Today I'm joined by Rabbi Tobias Singer, who I'm a big fan of, who I've been watching for some time now, who, um, I don't know if you, I didn't tell you this yet, but I was a Christian, and I was one of the, you know, evangelical, Baptist, born-again types, you know, the Trump-loving types, and uh, watching you, man, really helped me find the truth. You know, deconvert and and understand the biblical history better. It really did. Like you probably are like high on that list of people who I learned a lot from that actually let me look at what I'm doing. Is this true? Am I going the right path or not? And I, I checked into everything. I I literally looked, checked everything you said to make sure if it was true or not. And I've never. I don't think anything you've ever said was false. Anything. So I'm glad to have you on. Well, thank you for having me on. As it turns out, the my viewers um, are people who are audiences that are highly variegated, and many of them are Christians and different faiths. So it's really important for me not to appeal to scholars and any of that stuff. Just like go right to the text itself. Yeah. And we're lucky to be able to do this today because two hundred years ago. We would have both gotten killed for having this conversation, yep. so it's good that we're able to do this freely. So I'm, yeah. I'm grateful to join you. Thank you. It, it is. Um, I want to talk about the, the, uh, the Christian Bibles and the original Old Testament for the Christian Bibles being the Septuagint is uh, trans supposed, supposedly was translated under Ptolemy. Uh, they were trying to translate the Hebrew text into Greek so that the Gentile world can have can join the Jewish faith, and you know that led to basically the soil for Christianity to grow out of. And I want to get into basically how for for I want to talk about how Christianity is almost diametrically opposed to Judaism. But I also want to first I want to get into where is the Septuagint mistranslating the text, and where is it doing it on purpose, or what is like, let's get into that. All right. So we need just a quick history lesson. You're quite right. Roughly 2,250 years ago, 72 rabbis were commissioned to translate the Torah, that's just the five books of Moses, into the Greek language for a a Greek empire, and Greek was the like English today. And this translation was done for the famed library in Alexandria. Okay? And that was called the Septuagint, meaning 70 or 72. Now, that Septuagint of just the five books of Moses is gone. We don't have it. We only have 14 quotes from it that are recorded in the Talmud in Tractate Megillah, 
9A and B, if someone wants to look it up. This actually becomes very important for a reason that I'll explain. Now, the, the Jewish Bible is huge. It's much more than the five books of Moses, although the five books of Moses, to give your viewers an understanding, the five books of Moses is still larger than the Christian Bible. In fact, the first four books of the five books of Moses is much larger than the New Testament. So Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, is nearly 24,000 passages. It's enormous. So subsequent to that original translation, let's just say 20, let's just say 270 BCE, subsequently there was a need in Jewish communities in throughout the empire and in Africa to produce a translation of the entire Tanakh. And everybody, this became a cottage industry to translate it. And everyone was attempting it. But here is the point that the viewer must understand. So when after the King James Bible was completed in 1611, there were many other attempts to translate the Bible into the English language, right? And you're familiar with them. And there are many that are recent in the 20th century. But they didn't call themselves the King James Version. They called themselves the New International Version, the NIV, the New American Standard. They gave them different names. Or they even would say the New King James, so you knew it was something, it was the King James, but it was newer somehow. So there's all these other translations in English, and but they gave them different names, so you knew it wasn't the KJV. Well, this didn't happen back then. When anyone subsequently translated the Hebrew Bible, Tanakh, into the Greek language, they just kept calling it the Septuagint or the LXX, meaning 70. This creates, this is where all the confusion comes in. And in fact, to the credit of the King James translators, 47 men of the Church of England, in their preface, to the King James Version. You can go online, it's, it's, it's copyright free. They write about this problem, that there were so many different iterations of a Greek translation, all calling themselves a Septuagint. They were committed, committed to translating from the Hebrew and not translating from the Septuagint. They're not the first people to discover the Septuagint was a nightmare, completely corrupted because the church got their hands on it. That means it wasn't just Jews who were doing this. Now you had famed Christians. The most famous of all was probably the most brilliant Christian apologist in history, Origen, the third century church father. He's very important for many reasons, but one reason is enormous, and that is he was one of only two church fathers, that's it, who is completely conversant, completely literate in both Greek and Hebrew. Only he and Jerome uh, were completely fluent in Hebrew. And therefore, what Origen did was he created the final version of the Septuagint in what's called the hexaplo. We lost it, but it was a, a multi-panel, multi-column Bible. And ultimately, that was used, a Christian Septuagint that was used to then correct or back up, provide a to wipe away the dirty fingerprints of the New Testament and back up all the corruption of the New Testament. So here is the, the good news. As that, those words, good news, was coming out of my mouth, I realized there was a pun. Here is, here is the good news. The good news is that the writers of the New Testament did not use the Septuagint in order to create their translation. You're going to get that from your professors, either because they're evangelical fundamentalist Christians or because this is just standard, this is standard fare in the, in, this is what their professors are taught. This is how professors, this is, they are according to the Septuagint. There is not a single place in the Christian Bible where we are told that the Septuagint is being quoted. The Septuagint is not even mentioned. Moreover, in Luke 4, 18 is an example, when Jesus, we are told, is reading from the prophets in a synagogue on Sabbath in Nazareth. He's reading from a Hebrew scroll. He's reading from a Hebrew scroll. And here's the crazy spin, crazy, crazy. So he's reading Isaiah chapter 61, verse 
one, that, uh, that I come to bring you the good news for the Spirit has been put upon me and to free the captives. And there's an insert in there because Luke needs Jesus to say to heal the blind, to provide sight to the blind. Because Jesus is doing many miracles in the Gospels, but the big one, there are a lot of them, but the big one which you find all over the place is Jesus is healing blind people. So he actually inserts in healing the blind. This is really big because throughout Tanakh, there is not one mention of the Messiah performing any miracles. And the Septuagint, therefore, in Isaiah chapter 61, on the Septuagint, you'll find healing the blind, giving sight to the blind, to, in order to comport with the scam in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, but it's not in the Hebrew, it doesn't exist. So that's just, this is, a, I'm giving you, the, view, the viewer, a shocking example. So when people say that the New Testament authors were quoting the Septuagint, Septuagint as show me the evidence for it. What's then going to happen is they're going to say, well, open up a Septuagint. The Septuagint agrees with the New Testament. But the Septuagint was written later, our version of Septuagint that you can buy on Amazon, on Kindle or in hardcover. That Septuagint is a product of the church. And so it's the other way around. You, you, you could not have possibly have, but um, Mark Twain could not have copied Barbara Tuckman. It's the other way around. Origen was adjusting his Greek translation to comport, to back up, to bolster the filthy corruptions found in the Christian Bible. <laughs> I, that, was, that must have sounded really offensive to a Christian. I, but I, I say it because you got to know. What am I going to tell you? I can't, I can't make up stuff. The reason why I wanted to interject, though, I want to ask you this because you, what you're saying makes perfect sense. Like if you're if you're a crime investigator and you're looking at this, everything that's quoted in the New Testament seems to match the current Septuagint. I, mean, I use air quotes. Um, so, but the question is, like if you if what you're saying is true and they they actually retranslated the Septuagint later times to to fit the New Testament, where what is Luke quoting from? Luke isn't quoting someone. You see, we're, 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 we want to believe that people are honest to some degree as we are. And because you and I, what we're doing is we're projecting, because you and I would not run a scam. Presumably, you and I would not, you know, would never write a lie and as though it's true. We then impose it onto others. And then we wind up encountering people who actually are not honest. Now, one caveat, of course, you know, we don't know who wrote the book of Luke. But it is unlikely that Luke and Matthew were these two scheming geniuses who just came up with this stuff. Because, in fact, Luke 4 is an L source. It's not to be found in the other Gospels. And there are many M sources. These were oral traditions that were developing in the Greco-Roman world, not only in the land of Israel, but in the surrounding areas in Rome, and they developed over time. Remember, from the time of the crucifixion, let's just say that occurred in 30, the time the book of Luke is written, that's 40 years, 45 years. That's an enormous amount of time in the ancient world. So Luke is then gathering oral traditions, as is Matthew. They're both using Mark. They have Mark in front of them. Both of them will almost copy Mark, all 600, not all, but almost all 679 passages of Mark. And then they'll make adjustments because Mark is awkward. They'll, they have another source which did not survive, and that's called the source. It's a Q source. It's a Q source. We don't have the Q source. It only survives through Matthew and Luke, and those are less than 300 passages that are common to Matthew and Luke but don't appear in Mark. So they had that. But then they had other traditions. So this, these stories were oral traditions running around, and they then, whoever wrote it in the sense that we have, we have it today, now we don't by the way, don't have a copy of the book of Luke for 200 years after it was written. It's not like we have a first century copy. Our earliest complete manuscript of the book of Luke is fourth century. Is, excuse me, is, right, is more than 200, is Codex Sinaiticus. I mean, that's the oldest. I mean, we're talking hundreds of years after the book of Luke was written. How we date Luke and Acts is a different matter, but 
this is end of first century, but we have no manuscripts in the first century. I believe we have 12 fragments from the second century. Fragments, very, very little. I mean, until we start to see any is the third, and then the fourth century, of course, we have more because we have the, the major codices. But um, so wh what's happened here is these authors, these are editors who are collecting, accumulating information, then sewing it together in their versions of the Gospels. That's why we find common material and material that's completely different, LM and so on. So oh, that's actually a good point. Because do you, do you think, like, let's say the rubber rope marker Q, the earliest versions, do you think that they're, because I was, and it's funny, because you ever seen a movie where, Someone's at a job interview. It's like a comedy and they're being asked questions. That they don't know the answers. They're looking around the room and they just, whatever they see, they'll be like, oh, and they see a picture of a car. They'll be like, oh, I worked on cars or something like that. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Like, they have no yeah. idea, but they're looking around for answers. That seems like what the New Testament is. There, it seems like every passage is being taken from the Old Testament from somewhere. For example, um, Jesus being sold for 20, 30 shekels. Well, you see that in Joseph being sold. To, he's sold by Judah. G Jesus is sold by Judas. The entire New Testament is sort of these little mini allegories of the Old Testament. And that the, the reason, and I think what I'm getting at, the question I'm getting towards is, it, do, did, did the original writers of Q or Mark, did they have fragmentary scrolls? Did they have a Bible? Did, what, did they have an Old Testament? What, what was their source, basically, is what I'm trying to get at. So, so Q is a very different type of book than the book of Mark, because Q is sayings of Jesus, um, Mark is a lot more than sayings of Jesus. In fact, Mark, in contrast, is so different because Mark is only 16 chapters. The first eight chapters, and see, almost no one on the planet ever read the book of Mark but has not yet read the book of Matthew. That's why this is so difficult for people. So every when everyone gets to Mark, they've read Matthew and they just seem to see Matthew in Mark, and they just fill it in because they are similar. But what's unique to the book of Mark is that who Jesus is is a huge secret in the book of Mark. Eight chapters, it's the biggest secret in the world. Don't tell anyone who I am. It's the big secret, right? So, you know, so that's very, very strange stuff. Mark, of course, has the vicarious atonement of human sacrifice and, and, Spirit and and cannibalism, the ritual cannibalism of the Eucharist is in the Book of Mark. The vicarious atonement, which is manufactured by Paul years earlier in Mark chapter ten, verse forty-five, you have that same kind of vicarious atonement where Jesus dies as a as a covering, as a ransom. The same text in. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Notice, by the way, it's not Luke. We have no uh, no equivalent in the book of Luke because Luke doesn't believe in vicarious atonement, that Jesus died vicariously for your sins. So it's noticeably, ab that text is noticeably absent in the book of Luke. So, so Q and Mark are really different kind of book. Very, very different. Why is it? Some, okay, let's say, let's say let's, we go back in time to first century Jerusalem. And we go to some Sadducees there and they have their Torah and their Tanakh and there. And we walk up to him and we're like, hey, we, the Messiah is here is Jesus. And he's going to die for you or he died for your sins on the cross. What are they going to say to that? Is this going to be what are they going to say? They, they would say exactly what an American would say if you claim that David Koresh, who died in Waco, in a confrontation with federal agents was the Messiah. And there are branch Davidians in the United States who still believe that. And his name was David. Do you think that's just an accident? And he visited Jerusalem. David Koresh spent plenty of time here in Israel studying in yeshiva among Jews. Don't you get it that David Koresh is really the Messiah? But he had to die. He had to die with so many because he gave his life for you. And in, how would an American respond? They go, you have lost your mind. There is nothing about David Koresh's death, violent death, along with so many other souls in in right outside of Waco, Texas, that bears no resemblance to anything in the book of Isaiah. I encourage you, the viewer, 
to consider just looking at the claims of Christianity of the New Testament and then looking at the Hebrew Bible. Does it match or not? See, Christianity can be falsified easily because it's making claims that it's the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible. So when we open up Isaiah chapter 2, let's say you're, you're in New York City for a moment. You're driving on the FDR Drive. You might have done this. You're, you see the United Nations on First Avenue. And you see at 42nd Street on the northeast corner the quote from Isaiah chapter 2. It's engraved. It's called the Isaiah Wall. Okay? People, millions of people come there to visit just to see that. And it says there that the nations, it's a messianic passage, it'll be at the end of days, the, that the Messiah will rebuke nations. They will take their swords and beat them into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. Okay? Pow! That's a you. So, see, the Jewish Bible is very comfortable about making highly falsifiable claims. Uh, it'll just stop raining if you don't listen to me. Not you'll go to hell because you can't check that out. There's no verification. If you are not loyal to the God of Israel, I'm going to send you into exile 70 years. That's highly falsifiable. And then they're going to be exiled again. It's going to be a long exile, but you are going to return to Jerusalem. Those are the kinds of claims that whoever wrote the Jewish Bible is making. The Christian Bible is saying that we are the true version fulfillment of the Jewish Bible. Luke 24, 44, 2 Timothy 3, 16. This is all over the place. I mean, John, you know, if you would have believed in Moses, you would have believed in me because he spoke about, he wrote about me. Really? There is nothing weird. Not only that, hear the epic, the epic messianic prophecy in Isaiah chapter 2. I mean, Isaiah chapter 2, these are the, so famous that even the United Nations, I'm not a fan, okay? But even the United Nations has it on a wall, okay? Do you know that Isaiah chapter 2 is never quoted in the New Testament? It's not even quoted. It's never mentioned. The, it's a scam. The whole thing is a scam. So what they do is they put in healing the blind, which is nowhere in the Hebrew Bible, and they don't quote the stuff that would be... If Jesus brought about a world peace, would nations would stop fighting and there'll be a worldwide knowledge of God? We'd know about that today. Moreover, has there been another religion that's been more bloody than the church? The bloodiest religious war in human history was fought between Christians. It was an intra-Christian war. The 30 year war that lasted from 1618 to 1648, Protestant, Christian, Protestant Catholics slaughtered each other. Other Christians for not being Catholic. You got you got inquisitions on the Jews. You got crusades on the Muslim. You got witch trials on pagans. They're killing everybody, and they're going to war against anybody who opposes them. So it's not an era of peace. In fact, it's an era, of, in my opinion, in my in my own history digging, the thousand years from four hundred, I'd say, or around the time of Jerome, and to like fifteen hundred is a backslidden time for the West. I think. Even in the Christian Bible, they're fighting like crazy. I mean, in truth, you know, that we can doubt many things about the New Testament, but one thing that definitely passes that high bar of the, of the criteria of embarrassment is that the earliest Christians were fighting each other. You know, in the letters of Paul, Paul is generally not fighting with Jewish people who are not Christians, people like me. Paul's um, battles that he had is with, with fellow Christians. I mean, almost all of his writings are about fellow Christians. He couldn't get along. He couldn't get along with Barnabas. I mean, he's the guy who introduced him to the apostles. He wouldn't travel with John Mark. He embarrassed Peter to his face in Antioch, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. It is inconceivable that this would have been invented. This is so embarrassing. He mocked the so-called pillars of the church in Galatians 1 and 2, and in Philippians, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He questioned, not only mocked them, but questioned if they're saved. There's no way in the world that someone would have invented that. So in reality, Paul was this guy. You must have met people like this who just can't get along with anyone. I mean, just people who just, that was Paul. Paul was a guy who was not fighting with Jews, like religious Jews. There's very little of that. It is, but very little. 
almost all of his his the the nasty things that he had to say were were fellow Christians, fellow believers in Jesus, who did not hold to Paul's Christology. So let's get into the text now. Let's get into, for example, it says that the, the, most Christians will point to, but what about Psalm 20? Or what about Isaiah 14, where it talks about, uh, I think it's Isaiah 14, whatever it says that the, a, a virgin shall be born. Let's start with that one. Let's start, let's start with that. What is it? Let's get into this. What does it really yeah. say in the Hebrew? And what, how did it go from what it says in Hebrew to what it says in Greek? Yeah. So how do you like, you know, like people fake their driver's license to kids do that to get into an R-rated movie? I mean, how do you do it? You just change it. I mean, how do kids, how do 15 year olds who want to see an R-rated movie? I don't know exactly how the movies work. I think you have to be 17. Like, so what did kids do? You made up a fake ID. Like how do people cash checks that were never written to them? They forge, they change text. They Printed out. They have 3D printers that can do it. I mean, how, what? All right. So the text in Isaiah 714 says, Behold, the Lord of his own will give you a sign. Behold, the young woman, and in this case, Isaiah is pointing to to his own wife. Hineho al behold, the young woman is pregnant, the yoyled is bane, and she's going to give birth to his son, the karos shemo Emmanuel, and she will call his name Emmanuel. That's the text. Let me just jump in. Let's say I'm a Christian on the street, and you just, right. you just told me that, and I'll say, right. well, why can't it say, why can't the word Alma be mean virgin? What do you say to that? Uh, so what we would do is we would, Fine. Where is? Let's say you don't know any Hebrew at all. Like, how do you know the Jews aren't making this up? Okay, this is good. This is real. So let's think. I want to think this through with you. So, you don't presumably you don't speak Hebrew. So, like, how do you know? Now you can go to any Israeli in the world. Say, like, how do you say virgin Hebrew? Virginity is really important in faith in the Bible. It's a word that appears nearly a hundred and fifty times. Isaiah uses it numerous times. So. Being a virgin is a real big deal, and it's the same word in both biblical and modern Hebrew. But how do you know? I mean, there's a lot at stake, because if Matthew in chapter 1, verse 23 lied about this, then the whole New Testament loses its credibility, and Christianity is is the biggest fraud that that was perpetrated on mankind. So how do you know I'm telling you the truth? There's a lot at stake. I'll tell you a lot, a lot of stuff. First of all, so what we would like to do, even though it's a very well-known word, what we'd like to do is we'd like to use take the word alma which appears many times in the hebrew bible and see how it is used in other places that means for example in proverbs chapter 30 verse 19 okay we're told about derech gever bialma the way of a man is with a young, with a young woman and then it continues discussing that she is actually a an adulterous woman, and after they commit an act of fornication, all she has to do is wash herself up and say, I have done nothing wrong. That's some virgin for you. That's so that uses the word Alma there, right? Yes, of course. Derek Gabriel the Alma. Sweethearts. That is a good example right there. Wow. Bing Bing Bongo in in first Samuel chapter 17, verse 56, King David is called in Elam, that's the masculine version of this. So what was King David, then a virgin too? I mean, this is this is outrageous. And it, it is women, look, it is, it is young women that get pregnant and have babies as opposed to old women. This is really simple. I'll tell you something I never told anyone publicly. I mean, I just never came up. I'll tell you something really interesting. The the Christian Bible was translated into the Hebrew language in the in the 19th century. It's a very, very famous translation. And it was done by a guy named Franz Delich. Franz Delich was a was a, a genius of a Hebraist. He was a Christian, a devout Christian. And he translated, he was one of the in the Christian world, he was one of the greatest, if not the greatest Hebraist of the 19th century. He his commentary, he's his commentary 
on what he called the Old Testament is necessary for all scholars to understand every Christian view of all this stuff, okay? He's just, right now, he's just huge, okay? He embarks on translating the Christian Bible into the Hebrew language. Why he does it? Well, he would like, he would like people to, you know, to believe in, in Jews to believe in Jesus. So he translates New Testament in Hebrew. Now, here's what's so interesting. I, I don't know if this is the same version, but this is, I was going to show you this at the end, but I used to get, I, these, they used to pass these out of my church. They're Hope for Israel Bibles. They're New Testament. Okay. This is, this is going to blow your crazy mind away. The, what I'm about to say, I, I've taught, I've never said on air before. Okay. So you're going to get this and this is going to pow. Okay. So right now, just take my word for it until you Google it. Franz Delich is a, a giant. He was the, and his translation really is so well done. And it is, it's like just, just so well done that it is still the Hebrew translation of the New Testament to this day. I mean, it's every year. And you, we didn't arrange this. You happen to have one in front of you. Okay, this is beautiful. So here's a very interesting thing we can do. See, what Christians are arguing is that's the word Alma that means a virgin, but like a married virgin. This is such a scam, you have no idea. So if you go to the book of Luke, now I don't know, because I can't see you, for the viewers know that I can't see you, so I just hear. So, so if you go to Luke chapter 1, verse 27, in that Bible done by Franz Delish, was given up by whatever, New Hope, there are a lot of places that give this out, okay? That is the text where it says where Mary is called a virgin to a, a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay, that's Luke chapter 1, verse 27. I plead with you to look this up. I got it right here. Uh, Luke Bingo. chapter 1, Lucas, verse I actually, 27. I actually know how to read a little bit, a little bit of here. I can't like say it, talk, I can read the words though. I know you can't see, but just so people, people can see, see it says on the top, it says El Lamech. Vav, Kof, Samik. That's Lucas. All right, so Lucas chapter 1, what is it? Verse 27. Verse 27. So, you, so okay, so he's, you're saying that he translated it back to Hebrew? Yeah, so he took the Greek and he translated it into Hebrew, okay? Got it? That's what Franz Dulwich does at the end of the 19th century. This is a very famous thing, okay? Okay. I'm looking right, at the he, verse, but let me see if I can find the word. What's the okay, word? I've about? never done this on air. No. So the word virgin, you would think he'd use the word Alma, because after all, it's the word Alma that means a virgin. Yeah, I don't but see the word was, Alma here. But what you do see is Betula. So look up the Hebrew that he's using. The word Betula will appear in the Hebrew of Franz Delich twice. It says in in Delich's translation, it says El Betula Maorashal Ish Ashashmo Yosef Mi Beis David Mishem Habesula Miriam. I'm going to show so, it right now. Hold on, I'm, I just found it. You look, found it, right? So am I making this up? Okay, look at am I, whoever's watching this right now. Verse 27. It says Gazarat El Betula. Betula, bingo, bingo. This is mind blowing. You know, I was You're always a little this nervous. You're not playing this out. I, I'm, I'm not. This is not like we didn't arrange this. You had no idea I was going to discuss this. I've never discussed this with anyone on air. It just sort of never came up. That's but crazy. here, that's crazy. Do you see what I'm saying? This is look. There's a lot at stake here. I mean, if Christianity is a true religion. Everyone should be in church. And if it isn't, it is the worst human iteration in history. It's the worst thing in the world. And here's the scam. I'm showing to you quite literally uh, Dude, in my black mind and white. Right now. So, Isn't it blown away? I, I mean, one second. This I is, explain this to people who might not please understand do. what I'm talking about. Take your time. Go the for word it. Betula is not in Isaiah. In this, in this particular Hebrew New Testament, he's quoting Isaiah. But he's changing the word from Alma, which means young woman. He's changing it to the word Betula, which means virgin, showing you that the verse is wrong and he had to fix it. It, it gets even naughtier, a little naughtier. I'm going to edge of you. How can it get naughtier than this? So as it turns out, 
Luke is, doesn't quote the verse. He just says it, and that's the way Luke does. He just says it. Matthew actually says, like it says in the prophet in Matthew one twenty three. So you'll notice in Delich's translation, which you have in front of you, in Matthew one twenty three. so he's forced. If you go there, he uses the word Alma because he's stuck, because he's saying he's quoting Isaiah in Matthew one twenty three. You have to keep a finger in Luke one twenty seven. You see what I mean? This is more scammy. Than, this is... This is so over the top that if you're pregnant, if your mother was ever pregnant, if you could spell the word pregnant, this show is not for you. This is, could just flip you out, what I'm showing you. This is like the scam of, not of the century, of the last thousand years, two thousand years. And here, again, I am using a hostile witness. That means Franz Delich was a devout Christian he translated the Christian Bible to Hebrew to convert Jews to Christianity because it was in Hebrew. And it is, a, it is just the most, by far the most famous translation. Of the, other people have tried it after him. No one got close. And it actually reads very well. He did, a, he did a terrific job on the translation. But he knew himself. When Luke is going to use the term virgin about Mary, he knew that the word to use is Betula, not the word Alma, thus uncovering the scam of Matthew. That's how mind-blowing this is. Oh my God. So, so, I, I, so this is actually happening still today with Christians. And I'm not going to... I don't want to. Okay, so I want to talk about the young, the the, the uh, they pierced my hands and feet. Let's get into this one. But before you say anything about that, I want to mention something that I've I've uh, I've done Go some ahead. work with with uh, Dr. Kip Davis, Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, and he is pointing out to me that the 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 score when the scrolls were found, they were given over to a bunch of Christian scholars, and these That's Christian true. scholars just said we're just going to be completely honest and unbiased. Well. Well, this is what happened. This is this is a big deal. And I think this needs to be talked about. And I was actually going to ask you, I think you should go and look into this because you're over in Israel and the scrolls are over there. And I think you you and your people should go and look this up. But anyways, there's a scroll fragment that literally because all of the Hebrew, um, all of the Hebrew says that like a lion it doesn't say they pierce my hands. And feet. It just says like a lion. And I'm going to let you get into that in a second. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, Peter. I think his name is Peter. Uh, I can't remember his name. Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, Christian. Um, you know the guy from Canada you're talking about? Yes, yes. He no, took I know the, scrolls, the professor, right? He found a scroll fragment that was almost ineligible and then said that he did his work unbiasedly and said, it turns out that it matches with the Septuagint version, which is the like a virgin. Which now, is the, which is the creepy Davis, translation, right? Chip Davis did an amazing job. He took the scroll and he showed it and said, look, it doesn't say that. Not only is it ineligible, it probably is like a lion. It doesn't say, uh, it doesn't say, you can't even see it, first of all. Right. Even a little right. bit that you can see, so, it looks like lion. Yeah. So let me, let me help you. I have an entire chapter. I'm not trying to sell books, but volume two of Let's Get Biblical, I have a whole chapter devoted to this, and I name all the names, and I have the manuscript there for you to see. Okay. So, this whole thing is a complete fake. So let's sort this all out. The, the Psalm 22 was very important to Christians because in the Christian Bible, there are passages that are quoted from Psalm 22. And let's get a look at what's Psalm 22. So you need to know this. King David is speaking. He's crying. He's got a lot of problems. King David had huge problems. He had a son who wanted to kill him. He had friends who betrayed him. He had a wife that didn't respect him. He had problems. His father-in-law wanted to kill him. And basically, in these chapters, dialing it much, much earlier, he's saying that basically all my enemies are around me. And he compares them to lions, to dogs, to bulls. And that's what you're using. He is employing a metaphor of wild animals that are all around me. And this all brings us to the famous Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Why is this the most striking chapter in the Bible? Because King David says, ultimately, the Lord is my shepherd, and therefore I have nothing to fear. You comfort me. And the key is that we're supposed to learn from King David that even though lines are surrounding me, my enemies, dogs, okay. So it's somebody speaking in the first person about his own suffering. It's not a future prophecy. 
So when King David says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me in the beginning of chapter 22? So of course, the Christian Bible is going to take that text, misappropriate, and put it in the mouth of Jesus when he's on the cross about to die. Very famously, the cry of des dereliction in the Book of Mark. And when they cut off his clothes and they parted it, so they use that because that appears in Psalm 22. But the idea that it says in Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and meat, feet, for dogs have encompassed me, a, a company of evildoers have surrounded me. And then if you have a Christian Bible, it'll say, they pierced my hands and my feet. That sounds like a crucifixion. But in Hebrew, it says, Ko'ari and Ari is a lion. So this is the Nachal Chever, right? This is the Nachal Chever scroll. Nachal Chever, people just, you know, just a little history. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was found in the 1940s. So that's in Qumran. In Qumran, we do not have Psalm 22, verse 16 in the Jewish Bible, 17 in the Christian Bible. Uh, um, right, excuse me, 17 in the Jewish Bible, 16 in a Christian Bible. I just need to make that point. In a Hebrew Bible, the verse counting is one later. So Psalm 22, 17 in a Hebrew Bible is Psalm 22, 16 in a Christian Bible. You just got to know that, okay? That text does not, did not, was not found in Qumran. There is a later text in the Dead Sea area, probably 30 kilometers from Qumran, so it's still in that region of the world, where another, where a younger text was found called the Nachal Chever, which, uh, which is younger. It was written between the wars. So there you have this very, it's not like Qumran texts that are relatively, not all of them, but the great Isaiah scroll, relatively easy to read. It's relatively uniform words. It's, it's not that. It's just almost impossible to read what it says. Very, very difficult. So by, so some characters went, and so you have the word ko'ari, which means like a line. If you remember, George W. Bush had a press secretary. He's a famous, famous guy in America. His name was Ari Fleischer. You may know him, okay? Ari Fleischer was the, he's, he's a Jew, and he was George W. Bush's press secretary. Ari is an is a Jewish man's name. Ari means lion. Ko'ari, that preface, means like a lion. I mean, this is like really rudimentary words. So what they went and said is that the, the last letter is not really a yud, which is a very tiny letter, but it's rather a vav, which is more elongated. This is all fake, because you would have to remove the alf at the beginning, and the next word is misspelled in nachal chever, Cave. I illustrate this in volume. I, I'm not trying to sell books. I have a whole chapter where I go through all the manuscripts. It's all a fake. It's all a fraud. Here's the wacko one. Are you ready for this? Deep breath. If you're a, a vegan, this is not for you. If you've had anything today that has molecules in it for dinner, this is not for you. <laughs> Do you know that this scam wasn't even thought up by the writers of the New Testament? It's never quoted in the Christian Bible. Do you know that if you can go through the entire Christian Bible and you'll never find this verse quoted? This is a later scam. This is a second century scam. That means the writers of the New Testament, whoever wrote it, never thought, it never dawned on them to, to misquote this text and mistranslate it. This is a later machination. This is a later dirty deal. This is a later false shuffle. This is a later shuffle from the bottom of the deck. Now, I, I need you, the viewer, to understand the ramification of this. In order to believe that it says they, that means really it said they pierced my hands and my feet. And the Jews are just so blind and we just don't, that we change it to like a lion. You have to believe the following scam. You have to believe that the writers of the New Testament knew it said in Psalm 22, verse 16, that they pierced my hands and my feet, yet none of them, not Paul, not the writer of Hebrews, not the writer of the Gospels, not whoever wrote the letters of, of, of John, no one thought that those 
That verse would have been important enough to quote in the Christian Bible. The most nonsensical verses are quoted in the Christian Bible. They have nothing to do with what the original, but it really said pierced and the New Testament authors never thought of it. Now, what I'm saying now, if you're a Christian and you're watching me, this will blow you away because you're going to look this up because you won't believe me. You've been taught in church ad nauseum that this is a quote about Jesus. Well, then why did Matthew, Mark, and Luke quote it? And they're quoting Psalm 22. It's like it's not like a chapter that no one knew about. They liked this chapter. That's how scammy this is. That means this isn't in this didn't even make it a New Testament because it wasn't thought of. No one thought of this in the first century. That's how insane this is. Wow. So this is what happened then. So you get the the New Testament gets written, Jesus is crucified. Now the church comes along and they're they're revising whatever Septuagint version they have at that time. And they're adding things that sound, they're, they're going backwards and they're retranslating the Old Testament to fit exactly. the New Testament. So therefore, they see, they see a perfect opportunity. They can change the word Koresh to, or Koresh. Kari. They could just translate Kari as peers. And then they have to do one other thing, make sure that no Christian school teaches Hebrew to kids. Make sure you talk Latin, a ridiculous language. Like, who do you need to speak Latin to, an Eskimo? Like, why are they teaching Latin? Look, Christians, this doesn't make sense. You look at the church uh, banning Talmuds, banning Hebrew, yeah. banning Hebrew Bibles. Right. There's a, there's a, you, you can see everything starts to yeah. add up after a while. We start looking at the stuff. This is why I care about Christians. This is why, if you're a Christian, I care about you. And I'm not angry at you. And I understand why you might not like me. I don't care. I understand what's been done to you. You see, every Jewish kid, you go to Hebrew school, they want to teach you Hebrew. Now, maybe you learned Hebrew, maybe you didn't pay attention. If you went to a yeshiva, a real day school, Hebrew is a mother language, okay? The reason why they're cramming, they want you to learn Hebrew is because they don't want you to trust anybody. Here's the original language. They want to empower you. So you couldn't get away with this scam among Jews. Because even though we would produce translations because there are people who convert to Judaism, who just can't read Hebrew, we need to have them. But every religious Jew can read Hebrew. I mean, not like can read it, like you have a guy who took two courses of it. No, 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 like bang, that's how we pray. I mean, we just can read it. So you can't get away with this kind of false shuffle with the Jewish people. And the church got away with it completely because its parishioners, they weren't going to, they didn't have access to a Bible. Moreover, in the ancient church, as in the Orthodox churches today and the Catholic church, these services are highly liturgical, which means that they're highly structured services. And the parts of the Bible you hear about are only what the priests read from the pulpit. That's from the lectern. That's it. You're, there's no encouragement in the Greek Orthodox Church to go home and read the Bible. And if you do, you're just going to be getting, if you're, if you're a Protestant, you're just reading a King James or NIV, and you don't even know that you've been scammed, and you think the Catholics have been scammed because they don't read the Bible at all. The Protestants are the ones who have been scammed the most because they think they're reading it, and they're reading a scam translation. Point. So that that is awesome. We just, we just demonstrated two huge examples of parts of the New Testament that were, or part, I'm sorry, parts of the Old Testament that were changed by the church for example, Alma, meaning young woman, could change the virgin. And then you got, uh, they pierced my hands and feet, which really was really said like a lion. So, I mean, you could talk to any, go to any um, pastor in an evangelical church, King James only church, and you'll say, what's the, what's the pure Old Testament in Hebrew? They'll say the Masoretic text. They'll all say that. It's like, okay, now if that's the case, then why does it say like a lion and Alma? How do you answer that? And they'll say, oh, you're just looking at it too much. Stop doing that. Stop. I'm not, I'm not kidding. This has been my experience. This is how I left my church. Another example of this, and I want to get your opinion on this. Who is Lucifer? And is he, does he, did Isaiah write about Lucifer? How did Lucifer end up in the Bible? No, it's in a King James Bible, but it doesn't actually exist. It's an invention. So Lucifer is really the name for the, uh, for the planet Venus. And in Isaiah chapter 12, um, Isaiah refers to the kings of Babylon 
that they hold themselves high. The planet Venus, for those who don't know, is the brightest celestial body that, from our vantage point in the sky. Okay? It's, it's called the morning star. Why? Because let's say it's day. Like I'm in Jerusalem right now, so it's night. Where you are, it's in the United States, so it's day. Right, so during the day you can't see the stars. Not that because you, they're not there; they're there, but it's too bright. The sun is too bright, so the stars are no are not visible during the day. Even at night, there's too much light pollution. Here's the key: so at night you see the stars, and you, that planet of Venus is the brightest thing in the sky. What happens is as the sun starts coming, it's a, it's a magnificent. Just a gorgeous metaphor that Isaiah employs. All the stars begin to disappear. We can't see them any longer because the sun is getting bright as sunlight starts coming in. Okay, the last celestial body to hang in there that's still visible is the planet of Venus. Okay, Halel Shachar, the morning star. Okay, so Isaiah is really beautiful. Isaiah is referring to the king of Babylon who is so arrogant, who thinks that you're just going to hang out there and you'll be seen and you'll be worshipped and I, you're like the planet Venus. You're like the morning star, which will disappear. The planet Venus, of course, disappears as the sun comes up and you're going to be gone. What does the King James Version now? King James copied earlier versions that did this in other languages in Latin. Don't ask, all over the place. Is to put in the name Lucifer, the la- lucent, like the word light. So that's the name for the planet Venus. Lucifer doesn't appear anywhere in the Christian Bible. It's nowhere in the Greek. It shouldn't be in the Hebrew Bible because it doesn't say that in the Hebrew Bible. We live in a time where we can look at our watch, we can look at our cell phone, know what time it is, know what direction we have GPS. In the ancient world, people were much more aware of the stars than we are today because they really depended on it. They didn't have accurate clocks. I mean, this was a very big deal. Like, what direction am I going in? You know, an Israeli soldiers are trained in navigation. They've got to be able to read the stars to know which way to go because they can't have anything light up. In the ancient world, these were very powerful metaphors. So Isaiah is employing a powerful metaphor. There's no Lucifer. This whole word, then that word became, the morning star became to be you for Lucifer was added in. And strangely, in Revelation, Jesus is called the morning star, which is really Satan, which is really it gets really crazy because you actually crazy, right? putting, it, putting it all together. You find right. out this Lucifer, he's like synonymous with Satan, but Satan didn't really Satan's not a fallen angel. It's not there's nothing that's not in the old testament. No. It has no. nothing, it's completely Christian. It's, it's a dualistic. We talk about Gnostic. That's so Gnosticism really at its core is a dualistic, highly dualistic idea that is much older than scholars typically attributed to. That means the idea of dualism is very old, very Persian. And it was at the heart of idolatry, of paganism, that there were opposing forces in the world that really were equals. In Judaism, that was impossible. In Judaism, there's one God, there's nothing else. And Satan, who is not mentioned frequently in the Jewish Bible, very rare. And that's good, because we have so few instances of him appearing is a servant of God. All he's there to do is to seduce men away from God. Man therefore has free will and he can choose to ignore Satan's blandishments. Satan is really happy because that was his job is to to seduce man and therefore virtue is simply possible. The idea that Satan is a fallen angel is completely pagan. And exactly. This is why and this the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this this is a huge example of how you can see a Gentile Roman world taking an idea of satan making him synonymous with lucifer hades now all of a sudden you got hades and you got pluto these are the underworld gods who control the underworld they can have your soul basically so now you have this satan figure becoming the new hades but they're taking a character from the old testament who's not supposed to have that role he's not supposed to be the king of the underworld that doesn't happen in the old testament doesn't exist and, and what they do, so because I want your your viewers to 
be educated on this. So what they do is there are wars, battles over Jerusalem at the end of days. The Jewish Bible is very clear that the Jews will return back to the land of Israel at the end of days. Jerusalem will be the center point, will be the core point, and nations will come and attack the Jewish people over Jerusalem, okay? That's just all over. It's in Ezekiel and Zechariah and Isaiah. It's really very famous. Okay, so the Jews go into exile for a huge amount of time. They physically return, and then nations come to attack the state of Israel over Jerusalem, and the nations are all destroyed. Okay, you got that? That confederacy of nations that are enemies of the state of Israel right before the Messiah comes, so that confederacy is led by, it's called Gog in Ezekiel chapter 38. So these are enemy nations that are going to war against the Jews in Israel. And now that we happen to be around today, we're going, well, that, that, that's pretty interesting because every time I watch the nightly news, Israel somehow creeps its way in there, a really tiny country. And we're on, we're on the front page of the New York Times, Indonesia, a country where I once served as rabbi, the fourth largest country in the world, in order for it to make it into the front page of the New York Times, it has to have a tsunami. I mean, Israel's a really, really tiny place. The key point is, so we have countries that are led by wicked leaders who go to war against Jerusalem. But that's they're not Satan. They're not the devil. You just have leaders, just anti-Jewish people, who go to war, and they lose. They do very poorly in those wars. Okay, Zechariah 12, Zechariah 8, Ezekiel 38, 39, Zechariah 14. I mean, I want to empower you, the view to understand. So then they go, go, oh, those enemies, that's Satan. No, it's not Satan. Those are enemy nations. We actually are told not kidding, please look it up for yourself. Read Ezekiel 38, that Persia, modern-day Iran, will lead that confederacy. That is, in, wow is right. Ezekiel was written 2,500 years ago. Incidentally, you, the viewers, just take this to heart, that at the time, the Persian Empire was benign to the Jews. That means, in fact, it was the Persian Empire that allowed the Jews to return back to build a second commonwealth. Right, so therefore, it was counterintuitive for someone to make this up. That means Persia, Iran, in Tanakh is considered the arch enemy of the Jewish people at the end of days. And when those books were written, that was the furthest thing in the world, you would think. I mean, per find Persia, to do a word search of Persia. You'll see it right there in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38, just you know, it's in context. That's the word called Gagumagog. So Please, like, look it up for yourself. Tanakh is full of highly falsifiable claims and strange claims. Like, who would have thunk it back then? And behold, I don't know, maybe it's a coincidence, but here we are, the Jews have returned back, and nations just can't get over Jerusalem, and Israel has fought wars, and in some way, um, maybe got lucky or maybe not, well, some way we have defeated those enemies. Um, and, and, I mean, look at the, the claims that the Hebrew Bible is making and look at what we see today. But look at, and look at Christianity. It's like you, you're watching a guy who's you're just watching theological sleight of hand. It's like a magic show. This is exactly what I wanted to bring up because you were talking about the Christian Bible making claims about the Messiah. The Old Testament has, you got the Old Testament, you got Talmud, you got other oral traditions talking about what the Messiah is actually supposed to do. So... This is what I wanted to talk about was like, is the Messiah supposed to come at the end of the world? Okay. According to Christianity, Messiah came 2,000 years ago. That's not the end of the world. Strike number one. Strike number two. And if I'm not mistaken, the Old Testament says that no man can pay for the sins of another person. Which verse is that? Let's see, Ezekiel 18, verse 21, 22, 23. It's really the whole chapter. That whole chapter, there's a similar chapter, a passage in Jeremiah 31, which somehow Christians, like these verses are never quoted in the Christian Bible. How weird. Like human sacrifice is the mother load of bad ideas in the Jewish Bible. I mean, why in the ancient world, um, if you go to Mexico, because you like scuba diving, so you go to Cancun, or you go to Cozumel, or in, you go to Central America. I mean, well, you go to the, why do they like take virgins and sacrifice them? Why do they take babies and 
and you slaughtered them on altars. Like, why babies and virgins? Like, why not rapists and bank robbers? I mean, if we had to vote for who, if we were going to have a human sacrifice system, we'd go, well, you know, take the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world, like, get the rapists, like the guys who rape and kill babies, like, go kill them. No, 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 no. We have to take, we don't take bad people. They only take virgins and babies. What does that mean? This is all over the world, the ancient world. Why? Because a baby and a virgin represent what? Innocence. And what happens if you sacrifice a a 14-year-old virgin when the Aztecs did that? They believed that it would appease the gods and then they would have a, a harvest. That's what Christianity is. Christianity is human sacrifice. And it's a, a grotesque, a spiritual ritual cannibalism that's part of the ancient world. All they did was they simply used a vague sketch of Judaism to pour it into, but of course it doesn't work. Because you got, so you got the, the scapegoat and you got the unblemished lamb, right? I, I, you can tell me, you can correct me wherever I'm wrong, but the, 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 I guess what happens on Passover is you let one of the, the, the goat free and then you slaughter the innocent one. Now, they're, they're basically allegorizing this with Jesus and Bar Barabbas. No, now, actually, it's two two different things. It's two different things. And, and you, you, the, the reason why I do it is because, so that's a Yom Kippur event, Leviticus chapter 16. That's not the Passover lamb. This is what comes. This is the pollution. This is the after effect of spending way too much time in a church, is that this whole thing just gets conflated. That is all incorrect. So the Passover lamb, which Jesus is referred to, in Paul, very interestingly, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and in John and, and Joannian literature, let the epistle of John, which I don't believe was written by whoever wrote John, and the book of Revelation, but all the Joannian stuff has Jesus as the lamb, John 1, 29, John 1, 36. All that is completely mistaken. The Messiah is nowhere to be called is the lamb. The lamb on Passover did not die for anybody's sins. That's Exodus chapter 12. Please, please read it for yourself. The Passover lamb was an act of defiance that the children of Israel were called to do prior to the Exodus. That means immediately before the Exodus, the Jews were to take a lamb. And a lamb very important piece here, was considered a god in the, in the Egyptian world. Touching it, molesting it, death penalty. In India today, you can't touch a cow. They consider, the Hindus consider it holy. The lamb was a god to, to the ancient Egyptians. You're not allowed to kill it. In fact, in a conversation in Exodus chapter 8, Pharaoh makes an offer to Moses and goes, hey, why do you need to go into the wilderness with your people? Why don't you just slaughter your animal here? And Moses replies, retorts, because if we do, you'll kill us all. <laughs> so just so you know, this is not like I'm reaching. This is not rabbinic. This is just right there in the text. Like wow. just go to Exodus chapter right. Wow is right. So they're so, using a Yom Kippur. It's conflated, but it's not a young kid. It's really a Passover event. That's two whoa different things. They just conflated, and everyone goes sure because what Christian reads Leviticus anyway? I mean, really, what Christian reads Leviticus? They Christians do read parts of Genesis. They do. They read about creation, Noah, Abraham. They do. They really, really do. And this but, is why Jews don't convert to Christianity because no. they're wicked, backslidden. Uh, what are they? They're not rejecting they, anything. They all say that, oh, they're stiff necked, backslidden, wicked. This is what people in churches say right now. They're, it's not, the, the truth is, they know the Bible better than you do, and they don't like it. They don't, your, your arguments are not good. Period. They're not, they're not, they're not only not compelling, you know, like, you know, I don't know, like flat earth stuff. It's not, it's not, or that the whole Apollo landing goes in real. It's the whole thing is just, this is a scam. This is not UFOs. This is this is criminal. This is the kind of thing if you did in a courtroom, um, and you were an attorney and you played with contracts, you'd be disbarred and thrown in prison. This this would be like yeah. this. Oh, we call up Eusebius as the uh, as the uh, first um, witness, and then he starts lying because all of Eusebius's writings are all basically made up stuff. He says Philo met Peter. That never happened. So it's yeah. like right off the bat, you lose that witness. Now what do you have? That's the whole church history right, right there. That's all of your all of your martyrdoms come from Eusebius. You got him he, once in the court of law in the, in the United States. Once you get caught lying under oath, you're done. 
Nothing you say is credible anymore. Eusebius, right. everything from Eusebius would be inc- no longer credible. That's right. That means the whole thing, the whole con- when in, in American, it's not in any civilized country, once any part of a contract is corrupted, then the whole contract is done. It's called the law of best evidence, which is a law in every civilized country. Law of best evidence is that the original contract in the original language, uncorrupted, is the only one that's valid, nothing else. You can't have a Spanish translation of a contract take precedence over the original one in English. In this case, it's Hebrew, okay? I, I, I wanna just do one thing, I wanna just share one thing with the viewers because I know that I, I, I lo- you Christians, I, I care about you and I know what you're gonna be told. So I just wanna just cover this point so you get it. So when you're told that by your pastor, you'll know what to say. So the Christians are going to say, well, the Masoretic text, yeah, we, can't, we do rely on it. But the oldest Masoretic text we have is the Aleppo Codex from the year 930. Okay? Okay. So I need to just take 100 seconds to clear up what is a Masoretic text and what does that mean. Because this is a part of the shell game that you're going to get. Hebrew is a consonantal language, okay? It means all consonants and no vowels. There's no vowels in the Dead Sea Scrolls, none, okay? The whole vowel system was done in the early Middle Ages, okay? Eighth century, that's when the... Now, prior to that, the vowel... So imagine the English language, but you just subtract all the vowels, right? So you, it's fine. You can recognize words. You can know, like, like Gnostic, you know that... It's, it's spelt with a funny G in the beginning, even though it's not there, so you can recognize oddities and so on. But eventually what happens is rabbis realize that what was orally known, what the vowels were, we, would, would be traditionally had to be written down. And as many systems were tried, and this system that we have today, where the vowels and the trup, meaning the musical notes are added in to what's called a Masoretic text. So, But don't fool yourself. The Masoretic text and the Hebrew text Prior to the Masoretic text, it's the same thing. It's the same thing you have in the Isaiah Scroll, which is like 2,100 years old, as you'll find in the Aleppo Codex. It's the same thing, except in the Masoretic text in the Aleppo Codex or in the in the Leningrad Codex, which is just a little bit later, 100 years later, you have just the dots on it. Don't be fooled by the scam that Aleppo is 930, because that's standard fair scam. And then you go, oh, I guess there he goes. The rabbis were lying in. You, ha- you need knowledge that has been, you have been robbed of information. So be careful. The Hebrew consonants are always the same. If it's not a Masoretic text, which means it's before the vowel system was invented, then all you had were the consonants. So all the Masoretic text did is it did change the letters, didn't change the spelling, nothing. All it did was it added two things. Number one, it added the vowels in a written form. And number two, add the, the cantillations, which are called the trup. And also, I should add, add the, which is the, partially the grammar, like the equivalent of a comma or a semicolon in, in the English language. But the Hebrew letters are the same, so don't fall for the scam that the, me- yeah, the same thing. So in one hand, the church will go, oh, Masoretic text. I mean, the King James relied on the Masoretic text. I mean, we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that the Masoretic text is really incredibly accurate, right? So, but then when it's a problem, that they dump on the Masoretic text. Like, what is it? If I'm not mistaken, the Christian Bible is, they reverse the order of the prophets yep. in the Old Testament. And yep. the reason why, you could, you could correct me if I'm wrong or, or add to what I'm saying. I think the reason why is because they wanted to end on Malachi because Malachi talks about the Messiah and talks about um, uh, John, not John the Baptist, but talks about Elijah coming back right at the end. So it, it leads up to Matthew saying John the Baptist is the new Elijah. Now, the, right. the real order of the prophets should end on the Chiamaya because that's the last one, right? Should end in the Ketuvim and therefore end in Chronicles. And what's really crazy, you want to hear crazy? Like you have to like, we have to do Lamaz now for craziness. So this also is a later invention. That means the writers of the New Testament knew the correct order, which is the Jewish order, to have the Torah, the five books of Moses, then the Nevi'im, what's called the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is called the writings. Now, the writings are all written by prophets. I'll get to in a moment why there's that division. But it's the Torah, 
the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the writings, like Psalms, like Proverbs, the wisdom literature, and in Chronicles. Now, the New Testament writers knew that order. How do you know they knew it? Because it says it. Where? Luke 24, 44. Please, take a moment, look it up for yourself. And you're going to see there, it mentioning that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish Bible. It says the Torah, the prophets, and Psalms, which is interchangeable with writings. And they actually reverse the prophets and writings. Now we have to get to the reason why. The reason why is very, very nefarious. This is really dark. All right, we'll do it. I'll do it just, I'll do it. We'll cover real fast. So wh what is the difference between the, the prophets and the writings? So the prophets, like Joshua, really important judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc., all, all the rest of them, those books are written with very harsh criticism. The prophet, the parts that are called the Nevi'im, the prophets, basically engage in one overarching theme, and that is to criticize the Jews for every mistake they've made and what they have to correct. So the entire, that part of the prophets contained is dominated by enormous criticism of every mistake ever made. If you wanted to, if you lived during biblical times and you wanted to make it into the Bible, you wanted to have that sin, and that's what will get you in. And then the Bible will highlight that, and it ignores almost anything else. Really great kings are hardly mentioned. Yotam, you haven't heard of him. The guy never sinned. Okay, now, if the Torah is the instruction, that's the five books of Moses, listen very carefully, the Nevi'im, that prophetic part, capital P, is telling you what you can do wrong. Now, that also contains messianic prophecy for a reason I'm not going to go into right now. Then what is the role of the writings? The role of the writings is this is how you get back. That means if the problem is contained in the prophets, and you well, okay, I messed up, like Isaiah said, like Jeremiah said, like Ezekiel said, then the writings is this is how this is the medicine to the disease of sin, and go to the book of Psalms and talk to God, and this is what you do. So Psalms is the antidote, is the healing, is the medication for Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, right? Chronicles is the healing. Proverbs, this is how you fix the problem of sin. The church, ah, they want to add on the bit. Why? Because what does the, the Christian Bible want to be the healing, the antidote to sin? They don't want the book of Psalms to be the healing. So what they do is they switch it around so that when you're looking for a healing, when you're done with Malachi, you then go to Matthew. And there's your healing. It's the cross. And John the Baptist becomes a reincarnation somehow of Elijah, which we're in the only, hell? only in only Matthew, not in John. And Johnny denies it. Right. So it's like that's one of the they things. Elijah is going to come back. Elijah never comes back. So how do they fix that? Oh well, just say John the Baptist is Elijah. Fix that problem. It's like you just see all these. But John things. the Baptist is asked, "Are you Elijah?" And he says, he no. says no. <laughs> <laughs> I, you it's know, so crazy if you're not familiar with the text, you so you may think that you're listening to someone who just doesn't like Christianity for whatever reason, and I'm like making this stuff up. I'm but not. It's, it's right there. Yeah, it's it's so right there. Easy to yeah. find it. And look, listen, I'm, I've been keeping you here forever. But I just want to, real quick, I want to ask you last thing about, because we're talking about the Passover, and we're talking about historical Jesus. Yeah. A lot of Christians think that this Talmud is talking about Jesus of Nazareth being hung on Passover for leading Israel astray. His mother's name is Mary. What is the deal with this? Is this the real Jesus? Is this some other Jesus? What is this? So we, we have a character in the Talmud that comes up quite a bit. Talmud is the largest document of the ancient world and records the sayings and teachings of people like Rabbi Gamaliel, who's in the Christian Bible. Fakely, we're told in Acts that he was a teacher of Paul, which is not done. Forget all that, okay? But this is like the mission of Talmud is really, really important, very important Jewish literature. Now, we have a figure named Jesus. And you go, well, Jesus, that's got to be Yeshu. Well, that's got to be Jesus. Like, how many Jesus do you know? All right, so he's the first baseman for the, for, the, for the Red Sox. Forget that, Jesus. I'm just saying that as it turns out, the name Yeshu or Yeshua was just the equivalent of Josh. It was a truncated Joshua. Okay, that's all it was, Josh. Okay, and we have not one, but many events in the Talmud which talks about him 
and he is not uh, described in a charitable way. He's not described, he doesn't come off well at all. His mother is described as an adulteress who had a baby, this is big, okay, with a Roman soldier named Pandera Pantera, and out comes this guy, Yeshu, who leads the Jewish people astray. He brings idolatry, idolatry from Egypt. Egypt was like, I mean, it's not like an accident that the that the, the word trinity was invented in Africa, was invented in Carthage. I mean, can anything good come out of Alexandria? I mean, the doctrine of the trinity. All right, so, so, so what happened is you have this figure in the Talmud who's coming up, who's not coming up favorably. Now, here's the caveat, and you gotta listen very, so there's gotta be a full disclosure. For some reason, this, Jesus figure, this Yeshu figure in the Talmud is dated to either a person who lived in the first century BCE or in the second century. Okay? So this is very important. You have to listen very carefully. And in fact, when Jews were put on trial for having a Talmud that said blasphemy against Jesus and Mary, like this would make the church a little uncomfortable. And of course, they, and they, they, the church had a thing for not writing anything that's, that's unflattering of Christianity. The defense that the Jews used was that these references to Jesus is not your Jesus. It's not the Yeshu of Christianity, but there's one, for instance, in the Talmud in Sanhedrin, that he lived during the time of Rabbi Shub and Parachia. I don't expect anyone to memorize that, but just believe me, he lived about 100 in the first century BCE. Okay? By the way, mythicists appeal to this. Mythicists, some, not all, but some, many mythicists appeal to this and say, ah, the Jesus really never existed, and they were just taking someone from the Talmud from who was a century earlier. That's just, don't let that confuse you. Stay with me. You've got, you've got, you've got these un, really uncomplimentary things about this Yeshu person, but he's first century BCE, or he's in the second century, which means he would be a contemporary of Rabbi Akiva. So he's not the Jesus of Christianity. That is one view, and it's a big view. Chiefly, it was the view that was used in the defense of the Talmud in France in 1242, when the Talmud was put on trial, by the way, it didn't win. And, um, <laughs> every, every Talmud was burnt in front, where the Louvre is today, every Talmud, 500,000 manuscripts were burnt by the church, uh, St. Louis the Ninth, a filthy dog, the horrible anti-Semite. Anyways, well, I don't want to get into all this stuff. So the Talmud was put on trial, but this was the defense, the chief defense that the Jews, like, to for a Jew to live in Spain in the 13th century, that's like living in North Korea, okay? So <laughs> it's Kim Jong-un. So, you know, like, I don't know what someone would say if they were thrown in jail in North Korea, but, you know, whatever. So the, the consent, I don't want to use the word consent, it's a very strong word. So there are two views on this. One view is that the Jesus mentioned in the Talmud is a different Jesus. And that was, in fact, the defense that the Jews used, so Jews don't get killed. The other view, which is probably the consensus, definitely in the non-Jewish world, is that this is all about the Jesus of Christianity. And the Jews were facing death by church. And therefore, the Jews had to alter their own Talmud. And we actually collected every text and said, hey, everybody, we, we have to change these texts. We're going to put those texts somewhere else so you can find them. It's like the book of the missing texts, which we still have to this day. And, and because we just don't want people to die. So just like people who save Jews from the Nazis had to lie to the Nazis, like Cory Ten Boom. So they did that in order to protect us. So the Jews took the character Jesus, who really is the Jesus of the first century, and then shoved him to the first century BCE and the second century, not for any theological reason, just to make sure that Jewish communities would not be killed by the church. It did not work very well, I should say. It was, I mean, the church didn't buy it. And a I was many say, Jews how emerged. Can two Jesus of Nazareth both being killed for leading Israel astray and both have a mother named Mary? It gets more. Do you want more or do you want me to go? You want. 
do you want to, you want me to give you something but every other show is going to be jealous that i'm giving you this hot hot stuff 50 okay. bucks for this one <laughs> okay i want you to listen very carefully this is hot this is pure heat as it turns out is it a coincidence that if the Jesus of the Talmud is the Jesus of Christianity, then Jesus, according to this version, was conceived through adultery and did not have a human Jewish father because his actual biological father was a Roman soldier. Okay. By the way, Roman soldiers were everyone where in the first century because the state of Israel was a vassal state of Rome from Pompeii. Okay, so get it. So this is not like, well, where'd you find an Italian? They're everywhere. Okay, got it. And then the church claims that Jesus was born to a virgin. Is that a coincidence that both the church and the Jewish tradition, this is really strong, big sources on this. This is not just legend. This is big. This is like huge. So you have these just two versions, but both of them agree that Jesus wasn't born to a Jewish woman and a Jewish father. I mean, is it an accident that when Paul refers to Jesus, he calls him the born to a woman according to the law? Like, what about a mommy and a daddy? Maybe. But it gets even more heated than this. You could say this is chalk this up to a complete coincidence, or we can get hotter. Could it be that the Joseph character, being Joseph, the husband of Mary, who had nothing to do with the... Uh, conception of Jesus, according to Matthew and Luke, was a later invention to cover this. I go, oh, Rabbi Singer, don't engage in conspiracy stuff. You better have to back it up. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. Okay. If it, this were true that Joseph, the husband of Mary, was a later invention, what, and I'm going to ask you this question because we didn't do this before, what would you expect to find in the text of the Christian Bible? Early texts versus later texts in the canon. Would you expect to find Joseph in the early texts or only in the later texts? So I want your viewers to get this. If Joseph is an invention in order to cover for an, an unflattering conception, and then you have your plot device for both Matthew and Luke, they're very different, but in this play the same, what you would, this is what you'd expect. See, this is the way you do real theological math. You don't play games. You don't go believe me. And you notice something I do. I never quote scholars. I say, let's go to the original text. I mean, I quoted Franz Delich because it was like so amazing, but I don't quote scholars. Read, do it for yourself. Where do we find Joseph, the husband of Mary? Is he mentioned in the letters of Paul? None of them. And he hung out for two weeks in Jerusalem, and no one told him, so nowhere he's mentioned. What's the earliest gospel? The earliest gospel is the book of what? Mark. Is, is Joseph mentioned in the book of Mark? No. Never, never. Who is the carpenter in Mark? It's not Joseph, it's Jesus, Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Our only source in the entire Christian Bible that Jesus was a carpenter is Mark. And Joseph is never mentioned because they never thought of Joseph yet. I know it's crazy. Wait a second. Hold on a second. Let's I know. This out. I told you. All this was written big. in the 50s and 60s. Maybe, maybe not, maybe 60s. Right. He's not in Hebrews. Like Hebrews so, so is written in like 64, 65. So, yeah. So if Paul's first, he's not mentioning any Joseph character. Nothing. He's, he I might mean, have because it would Mark, come up in context. Then you get Galatians no 4 4. He mentions born to a woman. Right. right. Then you get Joseph, no, or Mark, no Joseph. And Nothing. then all of a sudden, when is Matthew written? 80, 85. Like, and then all of a sudden, Joseph appears. Bingo. Exactly. What? This I told you. Crazy. I told you. This I told you. I, I told you that you're not, not going to, you're not going to ask for a refund on the show. But what I'm, what I want to do is, you know, I know we're all used to conspiracy theories. I'm not. I'm a rabbi. Let me be clear. People come to me and they want to make really important decisions. Okay, I'm not just there like selling books, whatever. People are coming to me for like, and they need to see things black and white. Like, it's not like I think it's similar to that. And there's this ancient, no, 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 no. Let's get tight. Let's go in the text itself. 
and in fact, as it turns out, it's oh, in Matthew. Then we're told about Joseph, who was Joseph is the carpenter in Matthew, not not in Mark. You see, in Mark, it's Jesus the carpenter. In Matthew, it's Joseph is the carpenter, and as it turns out, Joseph is mentioned in John in the book, the last book. That means the most highly um, modified, embellished of all the four gospels. Obviously, the book of John, and there you have. You want to get ready for this? This is like a deep breath. In the book of John, only Joseph, the father of Jesus, is mentioned. The, 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 the alleged father of Jesus is mentioned. And Mary is never mentioned. Mary, the mother of Jesus, never mentioned my name in the book of John. Never. Not once. She is referred to as the mother of Jesus in an unflattering way at the wedding in Cana, but he just says, Mother, what do I have to do with you? Never, she never called Mary. John, she's put down. Why? Because John has the logos. John wants Jesus to be semi-divine. If Jesus is semi-divine, she's awkward. Like, I don't need a mother's womb for this. He comes from the eternal past. Yes, sir. I just thought of something. So you get, jo you get Joseph. First of all, I didn't even know that Joseph's not mentioned in Mark. That just blew my mind. But right. second of all, now that now that you just mentioned that to me, the other two gospels before John, Matthew and Luke, have a genealogy in them trying to connect Jesus to David and all the other prophets, like Abraham and right, whatever. Right, right. Those those genealogies are not Mary. They're they have Joseph in the right. genealogy, which means they're, they're trying to, they, they need Joseph to make him a Davidic bloodline. Right. What? This lines up with what you're saying. That's right. And that, so what you do, this is the way you do real research, is you don't, you don't start with an idea and then try to manufacture the evidence. What you do is go, okay, if the Joseph person is mythical and he's covering for something, and we have this huge, again, this is the Talmud, this is very serious literature. So we, you have to think to yourself, what do we then expect to find in the text? And then you can then trace. We know Paul is the earliest surviving Christian literature. We know John is the last gospel chronologically of the, of the New Testament. We know that. I mean, this is not disputed. So what you would expect to find is what we find. From, the, from 1 Thessalonians to Mark, no mention of Joseph. Nothing. And then, as we would expect, we'd expect to find Joseph all over the place afterwards. Is it a coincidence? Maybe. It's unlikely. There you go, my friends. And here's another thing I want to point out real quick, and then we can yeah. finish off. Because people are going to say, well, the Talmud is written in 300 AD. But if you, if you read the Talmud, which I have read a lot of it, the sources in the Talmud are, they're talking about events that happened in the first century, like a meeting between Vespasian and the high priest Yohanan, in depth, with detail, as if they're so this is this is non-controversial. Look, everything we've talked about, I, I didn't look it up. I have chapters in my books. I'm really not trying to sell books, but I have whole chapters dedicated to Septuagint. If you go pick the encyclopedia of your, not these are not religious people who do these encyclopedias. You look up Septuagint. There's nothing I'm saying that's weird. You're not listening to the rantings of a a non-Christian rabbi. This is, everything I'm telling you is just mainstream right there, okay? It's just very, very simple stuff. There's, there's no conspiracy here. I'm not saying it sounds a lot like that. It's not that. It's what we, it's just the same thing with the doctrine of the Trinity. We would expect in the earliest gospel, Mark, to find an adoptionist theology, and we would expect to find in in, in a theology like we find in John with a Logos where we find our highest Christology. And then later on we have Ignatius saying that Jesus claimed Jesus is God, and then we have the Doctor of Trinity hammered out in Nicaea. I mean, you could just trace this. This is not like, this is not a conspiracy thing. This is not like this sounds like that. You, you just can apply the math, and it's just a simple equation. This is math. This is what equals y. This is what equals x. And bingo, you put in the numbers, and it comes out perfectly. And there you go. And this is why I wanted to have you on, because I've been watching your videos, you and Derek talking, and hearing your claims when I was a Christian. This is when I, I first discovered you when I was a Christian. Hearing the claims that you would make would be like, if, this, if, if he's right, everything I'm believing in is false. 
And so what I would do is instead of running to the pastor and trying to get some biased response, I actually would go to the text, even learn a little bit of Hebrew if I had to, and look at what you're saying, and it all checked out. I have yet to find anything you said. Right, and that's what we did tonight. If you notice, I I don't. Well, we we never done a show together, and you know, and I, nothing disparaging, but but scholars like to quote other scholars. You know, whatever great scholars, Albert Schweitzer, genius, right? One thing you'll notice is, I never quote scholars, because I always I want the viewers to go to the original text. Stop relying on people. The primary text, the actual text, are there, accessible. We have it. We have all the text. You can go right back to it, like we did this tonight. Go back to the original text. I didn't say in his Boltman. I don't forget that. I'm not saying it's not valuable, but you, we have access to more information today than we ever did in human history. Why not just? There's a lot at stake here, as you said. If Christianity is false, it's not like Buddhism. Like they, if you're Buddhist, don't be offended. Like, oh, I guess some guy sat and thought that it was a bad idea to go to war. You know, it's not. This is not Buddhism. Where a guy just sat and thought for a while and came up with this stuff, and maybe they're wrong, and maybe Krishna is not a deity, and they thought he was, but it was an honest mistake of some people who were just, you know, spending too much time eating, you know, eating vegetation, you know, whatever, you know, in not enough protein, whatever, whatever. I imagine it was well-meaning people that just whatever. But this stuff is a scam. This is the kind of this is the kind of stuff that gets you thrown in prison. And this is why the church hates the Jews in its literature, because they have to portray the Jews as devils, John eight forty four. Because if we're not devils, that means we must be telling the truth. The Jews, everyone knows, clever people. We have that reputation, always did. It's our Bible. Only we can read it. Only we're waiting for the Messiah. Either the Jews are the worst people in the world or the best people. And I will submit this. In truth, and I'll end with this, I would challenge people, go to any, pick any city you want in North America, Europe, and ask somebody, what do you think of the Jews? London, Brussels, doesn't make a difference. Cologne, go. The only rule is that the person has to say the truth. Okay? What do you think you're going to hear from people in Rome, in Athens, if they have to tell the truth? I assure you, now, if you ask them without that caveat, they go, oh, I think the Jews are fine, and they're just like everybody else, right? You know, but that's not what they really think. People have very, very strong views of Jewish people. And we're a really tiny people. They either love us or hate us. We're highly polarizing people. For example, if I asked people on the streets of New York, San Francisco, Miami, Chicago, London, Manchester, what do you think of the Koreans, the South Koreans? What do you think of the Chinese? Chinese, that's the most successful race in the world. People really don't have strong views about the Chinese people. Great food. They work hard. I don't know. They, I don't know. Whatever. People have like, what do you think of the Japanese? I don't know. Toyota is a great company. People just don't have strong views about the Japanese. But the Jews, it's either hate them or love them. Now, everyone's going to tell you they don't have an opinion, like they never formed an opinion about Jews. But it's, it's obviously not true. People have very strong views about the Jews. And this really is Christian. Because either the Jews are bringing the world truth and telling them, do not follow the church, or we are the devils themselves who are smart like Satan, and we're therefore we are trying to cover your eyes because our eyes have been covered with a veil in Second Corinthians chapter 3. That's what it all comes down to. Now, what I encourage you to do is go back to the original text. And if you look at the situation and the time period, it was wars against the Jews. It was 66 to 74 AD. It was the uh, it was 132 AD with mm -hmm. the revolt. And it make it almost like it, it lines up why you would have a religion popping up to be an anti-Judaism religion. Of course, of course. In fact, anti-Semitism, I'm going to get kickback on this. I probably shouldn't do it. But anti-Semitism in its modern sense that the Jews control the world and control the banks, control Hollywood and poison the wells. And basically, that's really all Christian. We don't really have anything like it. It's not that there was no one before Christianity that ever said anything unpleasant about Jewish people. But the iteration of anti-Semitism that we're all very aware of. And no one ever says we hate the Jews because they're stupid. Never. 
because the Ku Klux Klan will expel you for saying something so stupid. That's going too far. So I, I just want to illustrate you. Think of all the canards you've heard about Jewish people in your life, right? Well, the Jews control the banks, control Hollywood, they control the president, we control politics, we control the Senate, we control thing, we control, we control, we control everybody, and the world is our puppets. That's all Christian. There's nothing like that prior to Christianity. They invented this darkness. And it's like, it's like Rome destroys Jerusalem. That causes a huge di diaspora. And now you have a religion that conveniently tells them, oh, the Messiah already came. He wants you to pay your tribute to Rome. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. All this stuff is in there in the text. And it's like, eh, it seems a little convenient. But listen, this has been a great, this has been awesome. I really want to have you back on in maybe a couple months or maybe sooner than that. But this has been great. And, Thank uh, you. Thank and you. anybody who hasn't heard of him yet by now, his link is in the description. Um, your YouTube channel. Any other links that you want to shout out to? That no, my YouTube is Toby Singer. My, my books are Let's Get Biblical and Volume 1 and 2. And you can, my site is outreachjudaism.org where you can get them on Amazon. And, and anyways, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. <laughs> it was very exciting. And thank you very much for having me on. All awesome. right. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Isaiah chapter 2, nations will be rebuked by the Messiah himself, and as a result, they'll take their swords and spears. A nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. Think about where we are right now. There's a war going on in, in Ukraine. That means the Messiah isn't here. As the church begins to collect all the ideas that, that flourished in the Greco-Roman world, the idea that the gods, who were both mortal and divine, were born to virgins, sabotages the claim to Jesus being the Messiah, because in order to be the Messiah, you have to come from the house of David, from the tribe of Judah. And as it turns out, the only way that tribe identity can be conveyed, conferred, is through a patrilineal line. How do you know? It says so, very openly. In the book of Numbers, chapter 1, right there, Lemish Bechaisim, Lebesa Vaisim, the doctrine of the Trinity, which is adopted in the, let's say, second, third, certainly becomes official in the fourth century, undermines all the subordinate texts in the New Testament where Jesus says the Father is greater than I am. Well, how does that work with doctrine of Trinity? Sabotaging everything they did. And what does the church have to do eventually? Some guy has to make up. First John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. When you make stuff up, you then got to insert stuff. You got to play with the manuscripts. You got to alter them. You got to be shuffling stuff. It's always a false deal. Okay. No, it's made up. It's phantom. It's as it's as kosher as First Corinthians chapter three, oh, chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. The, there is no verse about anyone rising from the dead on the third day. And Messiah is relatively unimportant in that he's just the fulfillment of a Davidic dynasty, of a Davidic covenant, Davidic promises. The Messiah is only mentioned with six Hebrew words that will rebuke the nations. That's all. That's all he will do. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true gnosis. And joining me again is one of the one of the crowd favorites, one of the Patreon most requested, Rabbi Tobias Singer. Always a blast to have you on. And um, we've had some great videos with you so far, and we just want to keep digging into this. And yeah. we're going to start off with the question I get from a lot of people 
is the messianic promise is all fulfilled in the new testament it's it's so clear what do you mean how do you not see it it's all in the new testament and it's like wait you're saying the new testament proves the new testament but wait a minute let's go back a little bit let's go back in time let's see what the messianic promise really was who was the messiah supposed to be is he supposed to be god himself is he something else i'm not even going to say anything else i'm just going to let you tell us the messianic promise who's the messiah and what is he supposed to do so i'm going to approach this in a way that i've never done before and i'm going to approach it starting from a very strange path of paul paul portrays the christian messiah jesus as a grand mystery and people i think don't ask this question of why is paul constantly saying that there's a grand mystery going on in ephesians chapter 3 verse 3 in second in first corinthians chapter 2 verse 7 and 8 there's a phenomenal mystery the whole mystery of christ is something that's so secret that if the rulers of the epoch had even known the mystery they would have never crucified the lord of glory what is he talking about that means in Tanakh, we don't have anything about mysteries. In Tanakh, it's very clear what the Messiah is supposed to be. Think about this. I don't know if any, I'm sure someone else must have thought about this. I think about this a lot. Why is Paul, so we're going at this in a completely different angle. Why is Paul appealing to a personal revelation? Like, why did he need a personal revelation on a road to Damascus? Why do you need that for? Why, why can't the Messiah come and you just know it? Why is Paul saying that what he has as revelation is superior to anyone else in Galatians 1 and 2 and Philippians chapter 3? It's all over Paul's writing that he has a unique revelation and it's superior to all others because it's directly from Jesus Christ. He didn't get what he got from Jerusalem. What is he talking about? Why does he need to do this? The reason is, is something you kind of alluded to in the introduction, and that is that nothing of what Jesus does in the Christian Bible is what the Messiah is supposed to do. And therefore, you have to say, this whole thing is a mystery. See, Christianity is the motherload of mystery religions, and you need special knowledge, hence Gnosis. You know, when people think that sort of Gnostic Christianity began in the second century, that's a mistake. Right. Of course, the iteration of Gnostic Christianity that we are familiar with sure. through the Patristic Fathers um, is one that they were managing in the second and third century and confronting and heading off. But in reality, Paul is the mother load of the mystery religions. Why? Because he's saying there's some grand mystery that I have privy to and listen to my version of Christology, not you foolish Galatians, the Christology that's coming from fellow believers. Paul is fighting with fellow believers. So let's add this all up. Why do people have to say, when you talk to Christians, the Lord spoke to me, you know, the Lord laid it on my heart. Like, why do I need that for? And what happens if the Lord didn't lay anything on my heart? That means I can't go to heaven. I can't be saved. Like, salvation is only for people who have high IQs or PhDs who talk themselves and speak in gibberish. So let's talk serious. The reason why Paul must appeal to some mystery throughout, and this is almost unique to Paul, in the Christian Bible, the idea that there's a mystery, setting aside the book of Revelation, it's all Paul. All of it is. Ephesians, Corinthians, all over the place. Why? Here's the answer. Because Tanakh is very plain. The Hebrew Bible is very clear about what will happen in the final redemptive process with the heir of David. God made a promise to King David in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7, verse 12 through 16, that out of you will come along a dynasty that will never end, will go on forever. And here is what is going to occur. Isaiah chapter 2, nations will be rebuked by the Messiah himself. And as a result, They'll take their swords and spears, implements of war, turn them into plowshares and pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. Think about where we are right now. There's a war There's a war going on in, in Ukraine. That means the Messiah isn't here. Right <laughs> now. That, it's, it's, just, it's simple. It's so simple. We're, 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 done. we're done here. <laughs> That's it. You know, the animals, predators, will lie with prey together. Isaiah chapter 11. And this is explicit. You know, I know you, the viewer, have, have may not be a believer, or many of you do believe. Whatever it is, whatever it is your faith is, it is, it is, it is clear to any person 
what these passages are conveying. The prophets are conveying that there will be a worldwide peace, that in fact he will speak peace to the nations, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. The Christians all know Zechariah 9, 9, because that comes from the triumphal entry in the Gospels, but they don't know Zechariah chapter 12, verse excuse me, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is a big problem, my friends. So there'll be a universal knowledge of God. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. Book of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. You follow? Everyone will know from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 31. The building of the temple. There's a destroyed temple that must be rebuilt. In fact, in a strange way, I don't know if we ever said this, but the Messiah has to come when there is no temple. Because if the one of the things that the Messiah does is bring about the building of a third temple, which is described explicitly in the last three passages of Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 41 through 48 is all about this temple. So the Messiah is coming when there isn't a temple. That means Jesus just came at the wrong time. I mean, just forget, just, just, Messiah doesn't come while a temple is standing. Messiah comes once a temple is destroyed. That can trigger, and then you can build something that has been destroyed. Elijah the prophet ushering in that great day of the Lord. That's how the prophets end in the book of Malachi. It's the last handful of verses. Um, so these are the critical events, the resurrection of the dead, Daniel 12, 2, Isaiah 26, verse 19. This, this is why there is this constant appeal to personal revelation and competition among the early Christians of who had personal revelation. I mean, Tertullian, you and I know him as a fairly early church father from Carthage, third century, he was born in the second century, who belonged to an iteration of Christianity that was kind of like the charismatic movement that we have today, where they believe in some prophecy, the Montanas, that kind of uh, view that like God is having this ongoing, why do you need personal ongoing, why do you need God to speak to you? Well, the reason is because Christianity is doing everything the Messiah is not supposed to do, and has done nothing that the Messiah is supposed to do. So there has to be some kind of secret, mysterious fulfillment plan that only is known to people who have special knowledge, who understand the mystery. And Paul's always saying, you guys don't know the mystery. You can't be saved. Here it is. That's what's really going on. Wow. Now, I know, so, and I think one of their solutions to this was to sort of invent this idea of a second coming. Of course. And that way they can sort of sweep all this under the rug and say, oh yeah, all that stuff that they promised, that's the second coming. The first coming, you know, he's... Uh, this is what happened. But right. all the stuff that you're talking about, that's right. the second coming. I want to just unpack that one piece. Now, while a second coming effectively explains away any false messiah, I mean, if there's a second coming, then my sister-in-law could be the messiah. Ah, she didn't fulfill anything. She'll do it in a second coming. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the whole reason why someone has to invent the second coming is because it didn't happen, because it failed. Then who then could, who then can't be the Messiah? Then anyone can be the Messiah. Then anybody who claimed to be Messiah in history, and there were many people who did, can be the Messiah, but they just accomplished it in the second coming. I mean, the point of, of the Hebrew Bible is that everyone gets it, everyone knows, and, and that it's, it's falsifiable. That's the key point of it. But I want to take this deeper than I've ever taken this with an audience. I don't, all right, let me, let me do this here. I want to sort of amp this up because I want people to get this. Christians would say that, look, it's not like Jesus did nothing. Listen very carefully. He did do many things. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey or two, depending if you believe Luke, Luke Mark, slash, or Matthew. Um, he was born of a virgin, and he was born in Bethlehem, right? Those are fulfillments, right? And he came out of Egypt fulfilling prophecy. So here's what Christians would say. I want to present this in a way that's really unique and novel, and people will get what's happening here. People will get the magic show that we're watching, pun intended. Christians actually would convey it the, in the following way. There are two categories of messianic prophecy that could be divided in the following way. There are this category number one, which are those prophecies that Jesus already fulfilled. 
I've heard one Christian say, you know, you're buying a house, it's like the down payment, and you've got to pay off the house. So category number one are those prophecies, manifold prophecies, that have been fulfilled, and you'll find them all over the New Testament. I want to uh, ignore for a moment the veracity of those prophecies. If I, I just want to ignore all that. Okay? okay, And then they'll say there's a whole bunch of other prophecies, because everything I'm telling you, Christians will agree on Messianic prophecies. I mean, Isaiah 11, Ezekiel 37, these are pregnant with Messianic prophecies. Right. All right. So they'll say those are Messianic for sure, but that's category two. Those are the ones that Christ of Olofel and his second coming. Okay, got it? Now mm -hmm. listen, think about this very, is it just a coincidence that all the prophecies that Jesus allegedly fulfilled are not exhaustive and exclusive and are not falsifiable. By sheer coincidence, right. let's say for a moment that Jesus never rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's possible. It's po <laughs> Let's just say for a moment, consider the possibility that Jesus was not born to a virgin. Unlikely, perhaps. But it's possible that Jesus' mother wasn't a virgin, right? That would not be unprecedented. I hope this is not too complicated for anyone. <laughs> let's say Jesus was not born. I mean, after we let's say he wasn't born in Bethlehem. Possible, right? The point is, would we know it today? No, we'd have no access to that information. We have, we have, we can't dig up the records on the babies born in Bethlehem in the year four B six BCE or. Whatever in the year one, we can't dig it. There, it's not accessible. Can we see can, um, if Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey? Which would I mean that's the way people moved around a lot. But let's, would we know it if he if he wasn't if he wasn't a boy? We'd have no access to any of that information if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Let's just say he didn't. I know it's a stretch. I'm reaching, but it's possible he didn't. Would we know about it today? The answer is no. The nature of messianic prophecies is that they're exhaustive and exclusive, which means when they actually occur, everyone will know it. That's the oh, key wow. point of it. So therefore, think about all the things that somehow wind up in category number two. All the messianic prophecies, the ingathering exile, all the Jews return back to the land of Israel, which falls into an independent state of the, under the governance of a man from the house of David, the temple rebuilt in Jerusalem, there's a worldwide peace and a universal knowledge of God and the resurrection of the dead. Well, let me tell you, when it happens, I hope, as a Jew, I hope it'll happen soon, this is probably what's going to happen. People are going to, your wife is going to look out the window and go, honey, he's here. Which right. means that that's the whole beauty. The beauty of Messianic prophecy is that there's no other way to interpret it. It's so clear. It's so crystal clear. There's no need for mysteries and personal revelation. That means Messianic prophecies are already front-loaded, pre-programmed, set up deliberately so that no one needs personal revelation. That's the whole point of it. The whole point of it is that everyone will get it. Wow. Even, that means... The, whether you're an atheist or not, it doesn't make a difference, but everyone agrees that when those events occur, everyone knows it, everyone gets it. That's the point. The point is it doesn't require personal revelation. Or else why didn't people in the Korean Peninsula have the personal revelation? Why does it one guy from Tarsus or wherever he came from, he gets this on the road to Damascus, but no one else did. And other people who apparently met Jesus during their lifetime, they don't even understand. And Peter was a big hypocrite in Galatians 2.11. Right. That's the whole point of the mystery talk that we find all over Paul's letters, especially yep. Ephesians 3, especially 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's the key point of it. And that's what the Messiah is supposed to do. Wow, that brings him. That brings him to the, to the next thing I was going to say is that you get this sort of um, progression of unfolding of who this guy was, and it seems like for me personally, I think it's responding to the criticisms. So, for example, I'll just give you one example. When the first gospel, when when Paul's writing his letters, and there's probably maybe this is a Q document or something. Who knows? Mark gets written. When all that stuff's out there, there were probably were. You know, there probably was devout Jews that were like, wait a minute. First of all, he's supposed to be from the line of David. That's not in there. Second of all, he's supposed to be from Bethlehem. He's from Nazareth. None of this adds up. So then you get Luke and Matthew, and they fix all this stuff. 
all of a sudden you get these genealogies. Oh, yeah, we, we have his, we trace his genealogy all the way back to David. We have it all here. Oh, he, oh, by the way, the Nazareth thing, he moved, he went down to Bethlehem for a stay and stayed at, and then he was born there. That's what happened. Forget about what Mark told you. And then you have this whole thing where Matthew and Luke, their genealogies aren't lined up. So the church says, well, one of them is from Mary, one of them is from Joseph. But that's not what it says. They both say Joseph. So they contradict each other. And then, and, and I want to get your thoughts on this, but real quick, I just want to say this. If he really was from the line of David, don't you think he would be more, people would know, don't you, why would he be some poor guy living up in Nazareth? Don't you think he would be like somewhere in, somewhere in like Jerusalem, like kind of wealthy, people would know who he is and he wouldn't just be some random guy from all the way near Syria? What do you think about that? I want to attack this from a different angle. Okay, because I th think this way, I'm, uh, I think this will be edifying for people. Christians have challenged me on this very point, asking the following. So when your Messiah comes, you, Tovia the Jew, I didn't mean that to rhyme, it just happened. All right. So when, when your Messiah come, like, how will you know these from the house of David? People are like, how will you know? We have these genealogies in Matthew 1 and Luke 3. All right. So this is really misunderstood it's not like imagine for a moment there is suddenly world peace because this man will rebuke the nations and they all the implements of war will become implements of agriculture there will be a in gathering of the jews the land of israel building in the temple and elijah the prophet ushers this in and the resurrection is dead and and then people go hold on buddy not so fast let me see your identification. Well, you won't need it at that point. The Messiah is going to be a male. Well, you don't need an ID to say that he's a male. You don't need an ID that he's from the house of David. This is These are facts about the Messiah, but that's not how you know. The way you know is because the events that are supposed to occur in the Messianic age unfold. Now, you alluded to, well, you quite directly to the problems that the church brought upon itself as it developed and unfolded. And I like what you said. I think it was intentional. You talked about Paul's letters, the Q source, the Q that are more than 200 passages that are common to Matthew and Luke, but don't appear in the book of Mark, likely older than the book of Mark, maybe older than Paul's letters. And I'll explain. And then you have Matthew and Luke that are further embellished than Mark. And the reason why this is a very important trajectory is because the passages that are in common to Matthew and Luke but appear nowhere in the book of the book of Mark, Jesus is a teacher, not a miracle worker, likely much more primitive, right? The miracle stuff is in is in Matthew and Luke. You have all that stuff, but it's also in Mark. So that's the key. The key is the church develops. And as Mark Twain said, if you're lying, you're if you're a liar, you got problems. You've got to keep track of everything. But if you're telling the truth, you really don't have to be that knowledgeable. Why? Because you don't have to keep track of everything. So what happens is, as the church begins to collect all the ideas that, that flourished in the Greco-Roman world, the idea that the gods, who were both mortal and divine, were born to virgins. So once that was adopted in the 80s, it makes it into Matthew and Luke. So that sabotages the claim to Jesus being a Messiah, because in order to be the Messiah, you have to come from the house of David, from the tribe of Judah. And as it turns out, the only way that tribe identity can be conveyed, conferred, is through a patrilineal line. How do you know? It says so, very openly, in the book of Numbers, chapter 1, right there, Lemish B'chaisim, Leves Avaisim, Numbers chapter 1, verse 18. It's very explicitly there. So, Joseph, therefore, according to Matthew and Luke, are, are providing for us a genealogy of Joseph, a putative genealogy of Joseph, not the genealogy of Jesus, because Joseph then was not the father of Jesus. So it, it collapses on itself. It's so funny. It, right. No, that's such a good point, because like even if even at that point, they're claiming he's not even has nothing to do with Joseph. That's right. So why would that even it's through adoption that matters all of a sudden, and that's that's well. Just... Hold on for adoption. I, I I'm doing this because people mess up on this. They say, well, Joseph adopted him somehow, even though this is not. Me. In order, there are many viewers listening to my voice and yours right now who are adopted. 
Okay, so let's think about this for a moment. So adoption cannot confer tribe identity. But I want to attack this from another angle. I want people to really, this is really very simple. If you're watching this show now and you are adopted, two things had to happen in order for that to occur. Number one, whoever your biological parents are, they had to have given you up for adoption. And then your parents have to have adopted you. It requires two parts to that to that change, creating an adoption. If Jesus was adopted, who gave him up for adoption? God? Like, the story, it's silly. Like, God gave Jesus up for adoption? The whole thing is is very, very silly. What really is occurring here is people are just getting themselves into trouble, as you and I would. If we tried to sneak into a country by using a false passport, we'd get us and try to keep track of all our lives. And this is why James Bond is such a genius. And the reason why we marvel when we watch, the because James Bond is like lying through his teeth and just keeps track of everything somehow. But it's a movie. It's Hollywood. You could do anything. But in real life, it doesn't work. And that's what happened to the church. In a sense, it just kept making stuff up. It didn't really making make anything up. What it kept doing is borrowing, inculcating ideas from the Greco-Roman world, from the pagan world, not just from the East, but also from Egypt, and, and just reinventing it as the Greeks did. But then it's those new ideas sabotage old ideas. That's why the doctrine of the Trinity, which is adopted in the, let's say, second, third, certainly becomes official in the fourth century, undermines all the subordinate texts in the New Testament where Jesus says the Father is greater than I am. Well, how does that work with doctrine of Trinity? It doesn't. So they keep making it up, making it up, but d- sabotaging everything they did. And what does the church have to do eventually? Some guy has to make up First John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, and, and if initially that was done in Latin, and that makes it into Latin New Testaments, and eventually Erasmus is essentially forced to put it in the first publication of a uh, of the Greek of Greek New Testament in the 16th century. So that's it. When you make stuff up, you then got to insert stuff. You got to play with the manuscripts. You got to alter them. You got to be shuffling stuff. It's always a false deal. Yeah. Now I want to ask you about this thing that Matthew tries to pull off, where he says. Oh, by the way, there was a prophecy, and by the way, we don't, as far as I know, there's nothing. I've I've looked at the Old Testament, I've looked through all the manuscripts and all the scrolls and everything. I've never found this before. I don't know if you have or anyone has, but it's Matthew says, "Oh yeah, it says that he will be called a Nazarene." Some sort of prophecy about that is right. Does that even exist? Is that even no? Okay. No, it's made up. It's phantom. It's as it says kosher as first corinthians chapter three or chapter 15 verse three and four the there's no verse about anyone rising from the dead on the third day and there's nothing about in fact it's interesting that uh john MacArthur, in his commentary very well-known uh scholar who contemporaries of calvinist he um he says that it says and uh, to fill with the prophets, what they said, the prophets said, right? He said, well, they said it, but it just wasn't recorded in the Hebrew Bible, right? It, do- it doesn't exist. But it's very clear that Nazareth is really important because it's so important. Not only is Jesus called Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus of Bethlehem, but you see how hard Matthew and Luke are, how hard they're working to get Jesus to be born in Bethlehem and they use two different convoluted plot devices to make that possible that have yeah. that contradict each other so they, they so nazareth is really important because they like why not just have jesus born in bethlehem and have him live in bethlehem why do you need nazareth why not right. dump nazareth like, what? but yes that's invented and what's interesting about that is when you the early earliest source we have of nazareth or anything related to nazareth this comes from Pliny the elder right. it's like the late 70s so this is already a whole generation later, but he calls it something different. He calls it the Tetrarchy of the Nazarenes, and he says it's in Col Syria. He didn't say Israel. He doesn't say he says it's in Col Syria. He, he literally tells you where it is. He also doesn't know who Jesus is. He never mentions Jesus once. He doesn't never right. doesn't even know right. who he is. And that's all the way in the late seventies. Right. So Which it's kind of like if this guy was really out there pulling miracles left and right, you would think someone like Pliny the Elder would, would, would add him in his encyclopedia, but he doesn't. Right. That, that right. tells you a lot right there. That to me, right. that was actually one of the most shocking, revealing things I had when I found that out. I was like, wait a minute, Pliny the Elf doesn't even know who he is. Whoa, step, take a step back here. But anyway, that's a whole other topic because I wanted to ask you about um, the Zechariah thing where the Zechariah has this sort of passage about 
this high priest named Jesus or Yeshua and uh, the governor Zerubbabel. They're coming back from the uh, they're coming back from Babylon, building the new temple. And he calls them the, the two chosen anointed, whatever it is. I, I know that the Greek's different than the Hebrew. So I want to get your thoughts on what this is and what this means messianic wise. So there is a messianic prophecy, but the key point is that Zechariah is telling us that in the final redemptive process, there will be two houses. Now, I just want to just hone in on Zechariah. What's going on at the time of Zechariah is it's the Persian Empire. He's only one of three prophets who lived during this very end of the prophetic period, him, Haggai, and Malachi. And what's going on, there are two leaders among the Jewish people. One of them is Yehoshua ben Yehotzadak, and he is the, the high priest, the nephew of Ezra, as it turns out. And you have a man named Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is from the Davidic dynasty, he's from the Davidic house. And these are the two leaders, so you have the person's high priest and leader. Zerubbabel never becomes king, but he's kind of a governor. And the key that Zechariah is conveying that one day in the future, there will be the branch, and you'll have two thrones set up, one of them reserved for the king from where he will rule, and the other for the high priest. And then, and then Zechariah tells us, and there will be a, uh, one, I'm like translating this in my head, there will be Atzah Shalom, there will be a, um, the Atzah Shalom, there will be an advisory of peace. There will be peace between the two of them. That means they will get along because in the past, the priesthood, which had a very important leadership spiritually, leadership role conflicted with kings. In fact, it was we had a king like Saul who killed a whole bunch of priests. So they didn't get along very frequently. Two power sources, one centered in the temple, one of them centered in the governance of the whole land. So if there'll be a governance of peace between them, well, according to Christianity, Jesus is both king and priest. It's the same person. It doesn't mean the person suffers from multiple personality disorder, but this is where, again, Christianity gets itself into trouble, because you have a book like the Hebrews that's seeking to convey that Jesus is everything. He's higher than the angels. He's higher than Moses, higher than right. Joshua. He's high. And he is the high, 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 high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. So, and he's king. And he explains he's not a priest according to the Aaronic um, line, which I'm from, but according to the line of Malkitzedek, well, who has no father or mother, apparently. So this is all so ridiculous. Like, who is Pharaoh's mother and father? I, I don't, you'll ask me, I'll explain this further. The point is, this is Hebrews. Hebrews is Paul amped up. It's Pauline, but way amped up, far more sophisticated than Paul, and very, very cogently set out. Yeah. And so that's where it comes from. So Christians are anchored, are stuck, as a Muslim scholar once said. They're stuck with the Hebrew Bible. And as a result of that, they can't get out of this because it can't be there'll be peace between the priesthood and between the king. Because if you're saying it's the same person, what are you talking about? Why are there sac sacrifices coming back? Every Christian has to answer this question. Why is the third temple going to have a sacrificial system? It's clearly there. Why is the Messiah himself, who's called the prince, going to bring a sin offering on behalf of himself and the nation? Why? He's, why is he going to do that? It means if Jesus is the final sacrifice, see, nothing works. This is the deal. The deal is that the moment you alter something in the algebraic equation, the whole thing collapses. Why would the prince be bringing a, a a bull for a sin offering in Ezekiel 45, verse 20 and 22. That means please look it up for yourself. Please don't take my word for it. This is the messianic age. This is where all the 12 tribes are back, which is a part of the messianic prophecy. According to the Christian, this is so problematic. For those of you who were Christians, that you understand the problem. Uh, number one, the Christian Bible says there will be no longer an animal sacrificial system. Romans 6, Hebrews 10, 10 verse 18. It just can't be. Number two is the Messiah, according to Christianity, is supposed to be sinless. And I don't know why this is a big deal to be sinless if you're God. Like, like, what's the temptation? What exactly is the temptation? I mean, I mean, Jesus was led into the wilderness with tempted, but what does that mean? This is where it all falls apart because he's a man who 
he, by the way, when you get ba- when he gets baptized, he he repents his sins. What sins? He's God. How can right. he have sins? He's right. he's he's bl- his blood. He's a flesh and blood guy who dies on the cross. Wait a minute. Wouldn't he, if he's God, he's eternal. Then this is all just a pre-planned thing. He didn't suffer anything. He didn't he didn't um he didn't sacrifice anything. He's all he's up in heaven now. He he just played an act for us. So this to me is like. This to me, and I want to get your thoughts on this too, because I think this is all coming out of the mystery religion. This is all Greco-Roman stuff infiltrating this Jewish cult, whatever you want to call it, these Christian Nazarenes, whatever the hell they are. And but but what let's even you mentioned earlier, the three-day motif has nothing to do with anything. It is nowhere in the old testament. But where you do find a three-day motif is that de- the Addis day of blood, three days later, the day of washing. You have Inanna and Ishtar descending in the underworld getting pinned by a uh, b- by a nail to a wall to wood for 3 days and then resurrecting with the dead and bringing up the dead on the spring equinox so all of these motifs play into the christianity have nothing to do with the old testament right you know i love chinese food and i have a feeling it's possible that you do too yes <laughs> all right all right like, who doesn't we thank god for the chinese people all right <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for the Chinese. Okay. (laughs) So what the difficulty when going to a Chinese restaurant is that you just don't even know what to order because it all looks so good. Like It's all great. Like you could just close your eyes and just put your fingers somewhere and I'll take it and it's going to be great. (laughs) Right? Right? Like who doesn't like Chinese food? All right. But so actually Chinese restaurants, I remember as a kid, the Chinese restaurants had a solution to this, and that was you've got a poo-poo platter. I don't know if they have that in non-kosher yeah. restaurants. Okay, so poo-poo platter, the point is that you just get a little of everything, and they actually bring it out to you on like almost an altar. There's a fire in the middle, and you bring sacrifice in the middle of a Chinese restaurant. Wow. But the point is, is a little of everything for anybody. So you got the egg rolls, and you got the beef and chicken. And the whole thing is all there. And that's what Christianity is. You know, when Justin, in his apologetic work, was confronting pagans, which is part of most of what he did, not all, but he confronted the Jews as well, but pagans, he said, what is your problem? You know, we're, we're these old beliefs, you believe things just like it, as fantastic as this. And he was being quite accurate. What Christianity is, is select this, select that. And I'll add this just a further for you. You know, it's so interesting when you travel outside of the West, it means you're not in the United States anymore, but you visit Brazil as an example. I've lectured in Sao Paulo and Rio, um, in Mexico. Roman Catholicism is way amped up there than it is in Washington state because, and there's many more statues and saints and candles and just it's why, because they like it there. Why? Because it matches well with the indigenous people who are there. So what the Roman Catholic church, we could observe this today. The Roman Catholic church is the worship is unique to each different, different nations with different cultures. Why? Because what they've done is in Mexico, they've adopted the pagan beliefs that the, the people of those lands already believe, yep. inculcated them. And that's why it's really different. Whereas in, in the United States, it's really kind of washed down and it's more clean. It's more Western. And in South America, it's like, holy smokes, everyone's just praying to Mary and bowing out the statue they never heard of and lighting candles all over the place. That's what happens. So Christianity just evolved. You want it, we'll bring it to you. You want to worship Mary because you need another intermediary and Jesus is not the only intermediary. Fine, we'll bring her in. You want saints too, we'll bring it in. It's keep placing these intermediaries between the the God and man. And now in, in Timothy is Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, well, we'll give you more, as, as many as you want. Yeah, and that was sort of what the Roman imperial cult used to do even before they converted to Christianity. They were just going around and Pompey the Great would conquer Asia and they would say, oh, they worship Mithra here. We're going to worship Mithra now. We're going to bring their whole priesthood to Rome and we're gonna, just going to have them pay us the taxes instead of those guys and just have control of the priesthood. And so it was sort of in the Augustan age. It's sort of how it was. And I think Christianity just fits right normal and like just basically as usual as all these other. It, it, it's the same thing. It's just it just claims to have a, a roots in Judaism, which it probably actually does. But it's just not the it's it's it's, it's falling off the 
the plan, basically, if that makes this sense. This is the way the Samaritans thought. Like, who are the Samaritans? Okay. This is just a real quick thing here. The Samaritans came to the land of Israel during the Assyrian Empire. They were the, the northern, 10 northern tribes were carried off by the Assyrian Empire finally with Sancherev. And they were put in somewhere else. We don't know, okay? But that was the method that the Assyrians had. It was brutal. And that is when you conquered a nation, you also expelled them. So you took, if the Russians were going to Ukraine, it wasn't enough just to bomb the place. You had to take everyone from Ukraine and send them to China and bring in the Chinese. Someone else from Taiwan had to come in. The key point is, who were the Samaritans really? They were the replacement people for the who were conquered for the ten lost tribes. They came to Israel with their own gods coming from Kuta, from another place, and they came under lion attacks. And lions were indigenous to the land of Israel. Not today, they're gone. They're only in zoos. But they used lion attack was a real serious threat. And they started going, why are lions attacking us here? We come to a new land under the Assyrian Empire. And they concluded that, in fact, the lion attacks must be because we don't worship the indigenous God. They found out and they said, okay, we're going to worship that God, the God of the Jews. And that's why their conversion wasn't accepted because they converted for all the wrong reasons. And then there's tension mounted between the Samaritans. But so this idea that we should worship the indigenous God is very, very ancient. And once again, Christianity invents nothing. It borrows everything. Rome did not convert to Christianity. Get that out of your mind. It's Christianity that converted to Rome. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, and so I'm, st I, I'm now. I want to ask you about you when the Septuagint gets created. Whatever the story is, I know it's a it's some magical story that Josephus tells us that seventy two men did this magical thing and they all converted the same words into Greek. Blah blah blah. Whatever. But what happens after that though? Second century BCE, first century BC, somewhere around there, you get these hellenized egyptian um alexandrian jews who they're basically greeks but they they're like into the septuagint you get people like aristobulus of alexandria who says sure. aristotle's so great look at how great the the platonic uh philosophy is philo is a prime example of this of he starts what what is your thoughts on people like that because i th their theology obviously is 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 bothered by the christians obviously what do you right. think of people like that? So they naturally assimilated. It is uncontroversial that Alexander the Great was the most important figure in Western civilization. And the Greek language had spread Hellenization. So what is hell? That means being Greek. Helen is the name of a Greek god. Happens to be a male, not a female. But the point is Greek spreads and Jews who are in the empire, it doesn't only have to be in the areas you've mentioned but also in Africa, are ready speaking Greek and adopting Greek thought. You mentioned Philo. Holy smokes, Philo was born in the year 20 BC. He died in the 50s, around the time Paul's writing his letters. Wow. Philo was smack right there when Christianity emerged. Philo never yeah. mentioned Jesus once. No, and Philo writes a lot. If someone sneezed, another guy said Gesundheit, would Philo recorded it. And right. Philo was in Israel. Although he was from Alexandria, he frequently came, was here in the land of Israel. Oh, yeah, he talks about it, yep. Right. So he was here, and somehow the graves opening up, somehow, you know, and dead people walking around. <laughs> Which, by the way, something, something you get from Virgil when, when he talks about how when Caesar died, Graves opened up, the sky turned black, the moon turned red. That's weird. That sounds like the same story. Anyways. You know, I want to, Neil, I just want to share this weird thought with you. I've had this thought, and I, and I never shared it with anyone. Sure. You know, there are, there are Christian scholars. I'm not going to name them because I don't want to ins insult people. But there are Christian scholars who really are believers, who really are devout Christians, and they don't believe that one, or they have trouble when you ask them about yeah. it. Right. When you ask them about the zombie apocalypse, so then they go, uh, you know, that may be some. And I don't know why they have trouble with that. That means wh wh why would this be a big magic? Like, why would that be more difficult than Lazarus and Jesus? I mean, why why is that a bigger deal? It's somehow right. they it, it's so loaded front end with mythology <laughs> that people just gag on it. You know, they just gag on that one in Matthew's. A passion narrative and you know they obviously wonder why the other three don't have it but it's interesting that christian scholars very frequently who are believers go well not that one that one i can't i can't swallow that one interesting no? yeah yeah and i think it's because it's such a 
first of all, for only one of them to record this was like, wait, this is such a big thing. They would, they also remember, and in, in, in fact, I think it's, is it Matthew's gospel that does the story? That's right, only Matthew. And Matthew even says, everyone saw it, and everyone was amazed. If that was the whole point. They saw it, it. If right. everyone saw it, everyone was, there would be nobody left who's not a Christian. Zero. There would be no one left. Why would you, it's like, it's like being in, it's like standing in front of a cliff. Are you going to, are you going to walk off the cliff and die? No. You're going to do what, what naturally is, is survival. And if you know Christianity is true, you're not going to reject it. Right. So the fact that anybody who's sitting is not a Christian after that event is mind blowing, which kind of tells you what, what happened. Right. Right. And it is also uh, striking that in the Gospels, Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, obviously Matthew, Luke, and John, Mark doesn't have any post are all the people who already believe this stuff. Like, if you're Jesus and you want to convince people, why don't you just like go to the Sanhedrin and say, hi, everybody, you know, I'm here. It's, it's, it, I mean, that's very <laughs> strange. Let, let, me, let me phrase this a little a in a point. way that we can relate to this. I'm not being naughty here. That's but a good point, though. Of course. I mean, I lived in the Far East. I served as a rabbi of Indonesia for five years. Okay. So I was all over the Far East serving as rabbi in different communities. One of the things very striking is that in the Philippines, Mary, the Virgin Mary, was appearing, having breakfast, having pancakes with ladies all the time, every Sunday morning. That was a very big deal. Like in the Philippines, same thing in Brazil. People are seeing the Virgin Mary all over the place, right? Like, if I were the Virgin Mary and I wanted to like convince people, like, why don't they go to Saudi Arabia? They can't get a she can't get a visa. Like, why don't you just go to Kuwait? Like, why is she appearing only in places where they're predisposed to believe this? Like, why don't you, like, why not come to me? Like, like I would be the guy you'd want to have breakfast with. Go chill behind there. I mean, why? So the point is that she's appearing to people who are already predisposed to believe that kind of stuff. Follow? Well, like, yeah. why is she? And by the way, it's almost. This is going to be controversial. And I want to say to you, the viewer, don't go off on me on this, okay? But I'm going to say it because, or else Neil will never bring me on again. But it's true. <laughs> why is it the people who have these visions of Mary? I mean, these visions of Mary. Why are they almost always women if they're adults? Like, what? Why are they ninety nine percent of the time women? Like, why? Like, smoke that. Put that in your pipe for a moment. I'm just saying, it is why women are more passionate, more whatever. But they are. So here you go again. You know, and that's what I think. I've spoken about this on other shows. You know, I, I think you know the the appearance, sudden appearance of Mary Magdalene all over the passion narratives, where she's almost nowhere anywhere else except for luke 8 and she's crazy in luke 8 and jesus has to cast out demons from her you know that's what i think happened there's no empty tomb that's all arranged later and it, it is some hysterical woman that comes up with this stuff yeah i don't think and you might know about this too you might know about the history of you know burials in jerusalem but if i'm not mistaken if some if some criminal from nazareth i'm, I'm talking in the eyes of the court of the people in jerusalem he comes from Nazareth. They don't know him. He's not from there. He comes to Nazareth. He winds up getting crucified. Are they going to give him a bury a, a, a tomb? Isn't that kind of expensive to get a tomb? That, it's not, well, it's ex the, the way the Christian Bible attacks that by saying there's actually a rich guy who provides the tomb, right. or otherwise he wouldn't. Comes out, but, of, comes out of the blue out of nowhere. Just, right, right, yeah. very conveniently. And, you know, he's got a rich guy. Well, but I can't, uh, you know, attack that. The key point is that People who were crucified, who besides being the worst possible execution anyone ever came up with, is you were also deprived of a burial. Right. I mean, the whole point was that after you died, it's not like you got to be buried anywhere, but you were put into a your body was eaten by vultures. I mean, we have material on this. We were eaten by scavengers, and then you were throw, your body was tossed away. That's the whole point. And what's very transparent here, guys, listen up very carefully. In Mark and Luke. John repairs this. John has Nicodemus, who I believe is a phantom character that John came up with, but Nic Nicodemus, Joseph Amarathea, taking care of the spices before Jesus is buried on Friday. Okay, So John locks that one up, but he's correcting for something, and he's correcting for the what you find in Luke and what you find in, in Mark, and that is that women come to anoint 
it means why are they going to the grave Sunday morning? Why? Like, I'm sure you have lost people. You've gone to funerals and burials in your life. Nobody goes back three days later. And why do you go back? Because what? That is really weird. You're right. To <laughs> anoint a body? Why would you anoint? Like, where in the Bible is those anoint bodies? Or add spices? That's are we chicken. cooking? Are we cooking chicken soup here? Or, or is this a burial? Like, why do you need spices? Now, there is, this is not out of nowhere. As I said, Christianity didn't invent anything. They borrowed everything. So the problem in the ancient world is no refrigeration. No refrigeration means that the body would smell because decomposition begins immediately. So it was a practice to have very strong spices buried with the body so that during the funeral procession, the body wouldn't smell, which was considered a bizarre on mess, was considered just not really appropriate, right? It's a, uh, but that the whole point is to get the body in the grave and and have no smell from the body. So that's why spices were put there. They actually had all sorts of methods of different types of spices that would be burnt. The smoke would carry the would carry the smell further, so the body would not stink. Frankly, right. but why would you once the body's in the ground or in a tomb, whatever it is, the problem is solved. You don't need to put spices in three that's days. I mean, what right. would a dead body look like? That is such a good point. Oh my god, right. I never thought about that. Now I, I I just just this is totally separate from this, but I just thought about this. This is a big deal. The idea of the Messiah is that he's God's anointed. C can God be God's anointed? I'll, I'll amp that up. I'll we'll go higher. Let's go really high here. Not only that, the Bible explicitly explicitly says in Isaiah eleven, which is about the Messiah, uncontroversial. That the Messiah will fear God. Please look at Isaiah chapter 11, <laughs> verse 2 and 3. I mean, literally it says he will be f filled with the fear of the Lord. And verse 3 is the King James, I think, has it. He will be quickened in that Jacobian English. He will become quickened in the fear of the Lord. Well, well like people who fear themselves are put away in institutions. I mean, it's very clear that the Messiah fears God. He's not God. God doesn't fear himself. And God does give the Mashiach um honor and so on that's because he doesn't have it god doesn't have to give god anything so it's this is very clear in tanakh that that the messiah fears god one other point i should say about the messiah this i think everyone will miss there are hundreds of messianic prophecies contained in hundreds of passages in the hebrew bible no more than a handful of them about the Messiah himself. The, almost all of them, not all, but the vast majority of them are about the Messianic age, how the world will be transformed. The Messiah is relatively unimportant in that he's just the fulfillment of a Davidic dynasty, of a Davidic covenant, Davidic promises. That's all he is. In Isaiah 2, those first five verses, which are like the so famous that they made it onto the Isaiah wall on First Avenue in New York and 42nd Street, the Messiah is only mentioned with six Hebrew words that will rebuke the nations. That's all. That's all he will do. So if the Christian Bible, conversely, in contrast, is all about Jesus, talking about Jesus, look at Jesus, 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 Jesus. The world transformation, very, very, very little. So that should strike people like, what is this all this Jesus talk when you go into a church hearing it 400 times? That doesn't match anything in, that we find we encounter in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, that's such a good point. And um, this idea that it, it, it just falls apart. It doesn't make any sense. And I'm trying, I'm not just trying to be like unfair here. Like literally this doesn't pass logic 101. The let, me, let, me, let me make a sense to you. Let me give me a chance to do this. Sure. Who's your biggest critic? I'm not talking to you personally. I'm talking to you, the viewer. Look in the mirror, right? I mean, who, who, you know, when you've made mistakes in your life, I, I say to you, the viewer, you know, where was your self-esteem at the time? Probably not very high. Probably the worst decisions you've made in your life is because you're you felt like you were worthless. And therefore, you dated all the wrong people because you didn't think you could do better. So imagine a religion that can say this to you, that, in fact, I affirm every, 
every uh, pain that you have, that you really are a sinner, you really are worthless, and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. And the reason you've messed up in your life is because you're hopeless. You were born in sin. In fact, you were infected by the original sin. But there is one man, he'll never betray you. I know you've been betrayed by others. Family members, spouses have betrayed you. But Jesus will never betray you. That's the heroine. That's the heroine. That's where Christianity just is, it goes right into the vein. The reason it's it's not yeah, that's even, how I got into it too. It's not inedible where you, it takes you know, but, an hour. It's right in the main. It's right in the vein. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I this is this is the kicker. This is like this whole entire conversation ends here, and it's in the it's in the Gospel of Mark, and it says in uh mark 10 17 and when he was gone forth into the way there came one running and kneeled to him and asked good master what shall i do to inherit eternal life and jesus says to him why call me good when there is none good but god and then he tells him then he tells him do the commandments don't commit adultery don't kill don't steal don't bear false witness honor your father and father he tells him the 10 commandments and then says and then says, just love God, love your neighbor, and and that's how you get to heaven. That's what he literally says. He doesn't say, follow me. He doesn't say, I'm God and do what I say. He doesn't say anything like that. In fact, he says he's not good. He's a human sinner. He needed to be baptized, and there's no one good but God. He literally separates himself from God in that passage. And then that's when the new gospels come along and have to fix that. because It's such a grave error because they want to make him like a mystery religion God. They want to make right. Him Dionysus. Yeah. So, yeah. And and that story doesn't comport with Paul at all because uh, the Pauline theology, because the guy responds and says, but Master, I, I kept all the commandments since I was a child. And Jesus didn't go, wait, it says in Romans that no one can do that. So no, you haven't. Right. Well, that's what happened. The, the, the fellow, the rich man, returned. we find this in the Gospels, that the rich man said, but I kept all these commandments, like not keeping adultery. Jesus doesn't go, no, no, you can't. No one can do it. He doesn't suddenly come Ray Comfort <laughs> and the street <laughs> preacher. Like, right. why doesn't he? Why, why doesn't he do a Ray Comfort on him? No, That's, he so, And then Jesus goes, "Okay, here's what you need to do." So the guy has accumulated a lot of stuff. He said, "I need to sell everything you have and give it away to the poor." So what Jesus does is he then creates a new commitment that doesn't exist, which no one's going to do. And then the men walk away, you know, all shook up. So it's interesting that repeatedly the Gospels don't care about Pauline theology, even though that's, that same chapter, Mark chapter 10, will later on in verse 45 speak about Jesus being our ransom. He's the only thing that could save you. So it's not that Mark did not adopt vicarious atonement. He very much did, that's as true. we find in Luke 20. But the key is, that's why these stories that are distilled in the Christian Bible are disconnected from each other. You can have the guy saying, I kept all the commandments, and Jesus doesn't go, you can't do that. Paul would have said that, right? Hebrews would have said that. But Jesus goes, all right, then I'm making up a new commandment, sell everything. Well, no one, you know, that's very much like a Sermon of the Mount kind of thing, you know. Well, you have heard, you know, you should not commit adultery, I, even if you, in your mind, so then you've done, all well, that makes it impossible. So that's the same story there. It's very much like, where did that come from? So that's part of the story. No one could do it. This is why Christianity is a religion that has to be respected as you'd respect North Korea. I didn't mean that in a bad way. Actually, I did. But the point is that this is where the, the high comes from, that you're a sinner, you're worthless, nothing you can do. Bingo. Very well said, Neil. Yeah. And so, I mean, that to me, that's like, and, and, I, and I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to be as fair as possible, but like, that's a defeater. That That's just like, how do you explain that? If you want Jesus to be the eternal logos, who's been there from the beginning, who knows all things, then why is he telling people that to, he, no, he's not good, but God is good? Mm -hmm. And why is he getting baptized? And why is he sacrificing his life and his blood and being a sacrifice like the, like the lamb, which doesn't even make sense, if he is God, right? why in, I mean, let's just be very naked about this. Like, why is he going to God? Why did you forsake me? When he said that he tells his followers that actually he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer, and he's going to get killed and suffer many things. You know, and Paul and Peter jumps up and said, far be from you, Lord. Jesus says, whatever. Like, 
why are you saying so the stories don't fit with each other each piece each module operates independently but they don't conform with others they're different authorships that are just melded together sewn together and each one is sewn together as a a unique module so they don't fit together they're all over the place how could you have you know matthew saying on the one hand that jesus is the ransom but telling us the parable of the sheep and the goats how could luke be telling us about the prodigal son and that's what doesn't make sense and that this is what i'm trying to get at is like if he is the sacrifice to who because if he is god himself is he sacrificing to himself like if he if this is some sort of like i what am i trying to say what i'm getting at is this the messiah the the literal word uh mess merciak mosiak means anointed it's god's mm-hmm. chosen savior it's not god him- isn't there two different people here what right well the word mashiach means anointed and it doesn't tell us in tanakh that he is a chosen savior anywhere but okay. rather he is the one who instructs the people he judges people and people will will judge him will listen to him very carefully zechariah 9 10 i mean gosh if the new testament didn't end with zechariah 9 9 you know rejoice over zion you'd you know, your king comes on a donkey to follow an ass. You know, if they just didn't stop short, the next verse says, and that he will speak peace to the nations. That's a good well, point. Then, That's a good point that's... because the soter is the common trope in all these mystery cults, the savior, which right. is what we've been getting at is like a lot of these, a lot of these attributes that Christianity puts on the Messiah that are not in the Old Testament are usually found in like Dionysus or Addis or somewhere else, Mithra or something like that, mm-hmm. the Soter, the Savior. And and it's a lot different than with the Messianic promise of who the who the Messiah is supposed to be. It's but, it's, just, it's this God yes. and Greco-Roman idea, like just sort of imposing itself on top of the on top of these Jewish messianic prophecies. Right. I, maybe I can lock it up this way. Sure. Christian, we wanted to say Christianity versus Judaism. We might say it this way Christianity is man's effort to create God in his image. Judaism, in contrast, is God's effort to create man in his image. They're exactly the opposite. Christianity is uh, wants to produce a man God, the perfect man who you will never be. The message in Judaism, the Messiah is relatively unimportant. He's certainly going to come. But right. the point is, it's about God. And that's why if you, like, no one would read the Hebrew Bible and go, I think I should worship Abraham. <laughs> reverence as you have for Daniel, this lovable person. But you would never worship Daniel like that. No Jew ever did such a thing because you'd be put into an insane asylum. It doesn't make sense. Now, whereas we know the doctrine of the Trinity was developed in the second, third, and fourth century, but we could read the Christian Bible and go, oh, I see where this is going. Where this is going. I mean, it doesn't surprise us. Interesting point, incidentally, is that the point the point you raised was very much on the mind of Tertullian, who we mentioned earlier, the church father from from uh, Carthage, in that Tertullian's shaping the Trinity, the come up with the word Trinity, what motivated him? What motivated him was the the modalism that was rampant, the uh, the sabellianism, the notion that Jesus was just a different mode as the Father, which means that the Father suffered, and Tertullian mock this and thinking, oh, you think that the Father created them and they could suffer? That's not possible. I talk about that in volume one of Let's Get Biblical. That's right. just not possible. So in fact, the point you raise that it's inconceivable that God could suffer, um, that's what motivated Tertullian to form, to forge the idea, the doctrine of the Trinity with the word Trinity, although uh, Tertullian's view of the Trinity uh, was not orthodox and would develop further origin, would refine it higher, and then ultimately we would come to the fourth century and that will become the official uh, doctrine of the church. Absolutely. That is just, that to me, that that's the case closed. I mean, I don't know how, how you can get around that. That's just, it defies logic completely. And why would Christians argue about it? If what we're told by missionaries that the doctrine of the Trinity is explicitly in the Old Testament and New Testament, they say this all the time. I know. If I'm if I am making this up, please stop watching me. Right. <laughs> okay, just shut this down. You know I'm not making it up. Yep. So 
Christians say that the doctrine of the Trinity is explicitly in the Old and New Testament, okay? Certainly in the New Testament, okay? Well, if that's the case, then why were Christians arguing about it so much? Like, they didn't argue about the virgin birth. There were no ecumenical councils convened to decide whether Jesus was born to a virgin or not. Why? Because it does say it openly in Matthew and Luke. It really does. The reason why Christians were fighting and killing each other over the nature of the deity of Jesus, because it's not in the Christian Bible. I mean, I encourage people to just yeah. contemplate this. That's why they were fighting. And and check this out. And this is the last thing I'll say, because the it, it's even worse than that. The only verse that even gets close to a trinity in the New Testament, obviously not the old, but the only verse that comes close to be there being a trinity is first John 5 7, where it says there are three that testify. But this is the this is the crazy part. There's no Greek ancient Greek manuscripts that have this added verse that three these, these three are one: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. It turns out that this verse shows up in the mid like 13th century Greek. It doesn't even exist. And you look at you can look through any of the manuscripts that are out there. It's not in there. Which means Erasmus that, refused to put it in in his first yes. go round. He said, I, I don't see it in any Greek that was in Latin manuscripts. I don't see it anywhere. And people were accusing him of, uh, Erasmus was a, a real genuine scholar. Right. And, I mean, first class scholar and Roman Catholic. And he said, I'm not finding it. Now, he didn't have many manuscripts to work with. I mean, imagine if he had all the manuscripts we have. I mean, what did he have? I mean, he had from Basil. He had, he had, he, did that. he had so few manuscripts he was working with that he actually didn't have manuscripts for the end of Revelation, and he had to borrow manuscripts, or he got them from Ruchlin, or he actually, there were some parts he had no manuscript to, he actually had to back-translate Latin. But the point right. is exactly correct. He, he um, Erasmus is confronted by it, he said, just show me a Greek manuscript, and one was tailor-made for the occasion, and in his second publication, that's where you find the the Johannian comma you're referring to in First John 5, 7. Why was it added? Because it wasn't there. Absolutely correct. And that is just tells you what you're dealing with, what type of church this is, what type of institution, what kind of type of religion this is, that they have to pull things like that off to make their points. Right. Right. Exactly. But that's what happens when you, I, I know it sounds kind of sunny. It, I know. You know I wish I didn't like Christians, but I care about them very me much. Too, me too. And, and because I care about them, like, right. So that's what happens when you have an evolving theology where you're changing doctrines. You then, you have problem with all the relic of your past. You have well-documented texts in the Christian Bible that portray Jesus completely subordinate to the Father. You have to rework all that. And then if you can't find anything, just make it up. Yep. And, I've, and this is the last thing I'll say. I I like Christianity. I I do. I like the religion, but I, it needs to it needs to be honest about what it is. It's a Greco-Roman mystery religion. It's not the true Judaism. It doesn't fulfill Judaism. It's a totally separate religion. And if it, if it actually, it, it, which is this will never happen, but if it actually admitted that, I would love Christianity. Just be your be in your own lane. Like don't be like, oh, the Jews are the problem. You get a lot of anti-Semitism coming out. Look at the whole entire medieval. Uh, Catholic Church and uh, Inquisition trials, all the all the horrible things they did in the name of thinking that their religion was the true religion. You know what I mean? You know, I, I'll say this. I'll tell you a story, a very quick. Thing. I, I, I experienced a lot of anti-Semitism as a kid. I mean, just nonstop in Brooklyn in the '60s and '70s. It was just unending. I was thinking this week about running away from Anthony. I don't know. He was definitely a Roman Catholic kid. Anthony, I guess he was Italian. What do I know? And Anthony was running after me with some big thing that he wanted to beat me with. And I was just a little Jewish kid running away from Anthony. And I didn't know where this was going because I was, he was much bigger than faster than me. And I was in a lot of trouble. So he's running after me in Borough Park, Brooklyn with this big thing. I think it's something that's a little cardboard thing to beat me with. And suddenly the mother screams out his fat mother screams out anthony it's a tap for lungs stop get inside okay and anthony stops pursuing me and turns around and goes back home disappointed that the mother caught him so the thought that came to my mind at the time was holy smokes like his mother like saved me from this like 
I don't know what would have happened to me if Anthony's mother. So, and what will happen to me as I grow up and I'm an adult and Anthony's mother is not around to stop Anthony anymore? More. What is going, what does my future look like living in a Christian world such as this? That was my thought. And thank goodness I had Anthony's mother to rescue me. What will happen when I don't have Anthony's mother? There's no one to stop Anthony. But then subsequently, I began to think about this. Why did Anthony hate me? Why did he call me a Christ killer? What? He didn't invent that. He wasn't born that way. You're not born a bigot. That came from the home. So yeah. really, I thought Anthony. I thought of Anthony's mother as my savior at that moment. I thought, phew, thank goodness for his fat mama saved me. But then I realized, where did he hear? Where did he pick up this stuff? Where would he come up with this kind of stuff? From his home. He didn't. He didn't invent this. And that was the point. Christianity breeds this stuff. It breeds it because of the storytelling in the Gospels of how the Jews are portrayed as the enemies of God, as the worst people in the world who know the truth and deny Jesus anyway. And when the Roman soldiers say, hey, uh, Jesus rose, that means he's gone. The, the priests and elders didn't say, oh, okay, I guess we'll become Christian. They said, let's bribe you. Would you say that you fell asleep? The Jews are all constantly conniving, evil, and that's where you get the protocols, the elders Zion, all the anti-Semitism. It's bred in the New Testament. So in order for Christians to change their way, they have to jettison the entire Christian Bible. Yep. I mean, even I, Hitler himself had, I'm a true Catholic, and I'm following the way of Jesus, who is the real fighter of the Jews. That's in Mein Kampf. Like this, this, this ideology can have major impact and major hate coming from it. I and read through Mein Kampf twice because I quote it uh, in my books. Okay, so I say if you think what Neil is saying is sort of like a is mischaracterizing, hit, please go online. You can get Mein Kampf online free. Check it out for yourself. Please just do Control F. That's a search. Okay. And just learn, look for Jesus or Christ. Just do that. Okay. Yep. None of it is going to be. It all of it is going to be favorable. It's it's not what you're being told. Right. And yeah, he Hitler was born was baptized in the Catholic Church and the whole deal. Yep. And his right, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I always love having you on. And is there anything else you want to tell anyone? Books coming out? Anything you got going on? Uh, well, I'll be speaking in the United States in November, and you know the videos are available on my channel, which is my name, Toby Singer. And I, I thank you for. Oh, and we're going to see each other in Jerusalem in very November. soon, very Holy soon. Smoke. Well, what, what more is there to talk about? Right. We're going to all be together um, in Israel, so I'm really looking forward to that. Absolutely, and you have attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. <laughs> The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus. I'm about to turn the heat up on you a little bit. I want to ask you this. When Christians come up to you and say that all these verses and all these passages in the New Testament, like, you know, Jesus is carrying his cross is so much like Isaac carrying his wood, the only begotten son. Joseph is getting sold for 30 shekels. So is Jesus by Judah, Judas, where Joseph is sold by Judah. And all these things that are happening in the Old Testament seem to point to Jesus. What is your response to that? What does Paul do in Romans chapter 10, verse 8? He takes a scalpel and he cuts out the last words that you may do, which is the whole point, and deletes it. Gone. Disappeared. How do you play with the Bible? 
How do you literally excise the whole point of the text? What are you doing? And if you're going to play with my Bible, you think I'm going to be a Christian? You think I'm going to convert to Christianity? And welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm with the one and only, the rabbi, Tobias Singer, who is a superstar when it comes to my my uh, Patreon members and people who watch this channel. They love they love when the rabbi comes by and gives us some some knowledge. And today we're going to jump into a topic that can't be sp spoken about enough. There's always something to say. There's always more to say about this because there's just so much of this going on. And that is the Christians who come along, people like Paul, people like Peter, people like whoever, you know, the church fathers and Clement of Alexandria and whatever, whoever it is. It's this Greek type of Judaism that's going on. What? And my question is for you. Somebody who is a practicing rabbinic Jew who is a rabbi, who is lives this stuff, who lives and breathes the Torah, the Tanakh, who is the, you're the real deal. So I got to ask you, I, I can't I can't be the, the, the authority on this. I got to go to you for this. What is it that the Christians are getting wrong about the scriptures, about the Tanakh? What is it that, because they claim they had the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Tell us about that and what are they getting wrong and what are they trying to pull off here? Right. So the Christians, in a sense, are not uh, um, getting it wrong as though they're trying and just not achieving the goal. It, they're making it all up. Mm. Let me give you, it's very, that means there was never an attempt to get it right, but rather it was a, a complete a scam of the church where they had to then go back with bleach to the crime scene uh, wipe wipe away the fingerprints, get rid of the DNA evidence, but they did a, just a very poor job. It's, it's worse than your viewers think. Let me give you like a very simple example, a very famous example. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Now, why is that passage so important? It appears right at the end of the third gospel. Because Jesus is speaking here, following his putative resurrection. And he's saying that what he has done is a fulfillment of the Torah, of the prophets, the Nevi'im, and of the Psalms, which means really the Ketuvim, the writing. That's all of Tanakh. The word Tanakh is just an, an acronym for the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. Mm. I'm right there. And then in verse 45, he says, just turn to the scripture. And in 46, he says that he suffered, died, rose on the third day, according to the scripture. There is no such verse. It's a complete phantom. So it's not like it was mistranslated, like famously Matthew mistranslate a whole series of passages in the Hebrew Bible. It just made up, completely made up. There is no passage like that. Paul also makes the same, uh, advances the same idea. No doubt that whoever wrote this, this pericope of Luke took it from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul says that Jesus rose on the third day from, according to the scripture. There is no such scripture. It doesn't even exist. So this is not like people had a misunderstanding or this was a, a heterodox or heretical sect of Judaism. It wasn't any of that. The idea that you should eat the body and drink the blood of the Messiah by eating the <laughs> bread and drink, that's not a, a misunderstanding. That's not a whoops. That's not, oh, I I must have gotten some verse wrong there. Mm. That's that, There's no even beginning. There's nothing remotely resembling that in the Hebrew Bible. Quite the contrary. It is um, it, human sacrifice is the mother load of bad ideas as far as the Torah is concerned. The notion that you should 
he no and let not the protestants go well we only see it as a figure it doesn't make a difference if it's the way um calvinists view the eucharist or the way the roman catholic church is. the idea it's just a non star there's nothing remotely resembling that so it's not like like christianity is sort of a movement of judaism and they kind of didn't get it right there was no even attempt to get it right there is a an attempt as i said for people to come back to the crime scene like the guy who murdered those four students in idaho mm -hmm. where he kept revisiting but he didn't go to get his stuff and they're able to trace him down it, it's just them going back and trying to adjust things and go this is a, a secular duty it never was wow so what do you think they're trying to bring the Greek-speaking Jewish people of, let's say, Alexandria, for example, to try to bring them into the world of Roman paganism? Is that what you think is happening here? No, it's Christianity converting to Rome rather than Rome converting to Christianity. What Christianity successfully did was collect accumulate all the ideas that were well known and widely accepted in the pagan world and then just put it in a some using jewish terms like messiah uh, uh, misappropriating jewish general concepts there, there's no attempt right. but there's no attempt by the iterate anything resembling the iteration of christianity that we see now it is very, it's certain that there were early Jewish sects. Their writings don't survive. Ebionites, Nazarenes, what we know about them from the church fathers. Um, that there were sects that did think that you needed to keep the Torah, that re utterly rejected Paul. Um, we know that because Paul, essentially, in all of his writings, both those that are indisputably from his hand and those that are pseudepigraphic, Paul is arguing with fellow Christians about doctrine. So there was some group that probably that thought that he was a great man and they came to understand that he was the Messiah. But Christianity was, it's not a failed attempt. They never tried. Interesting. Now, does someone like Paul, is there, I mean, do you see people like Paul at all within you know, rabbinical Judaism sort of, or is this something completely forward to what you're doing, to what you no, are? No, it's, it's, Paul is, is completely uh, Hellenistic, mm -hmm. dualistic. I, I know there are, there are many people who think that, that, that Gnosticism, which is rooted in dualism, began in the second century, Christian Gnosticism, it's not that they're not correct. They're not seeing the dualism that's all over Paul's writings. His view of the resurrection of the dead is utterly, uh, utterly pagan. So just so the viewers understand this, in the Greco-Roman world, although they, were, they had a respect for Judaism, Judaism as an example, was a recognized religion, a licit licensed religion of the Roman Empire. And the, the, the Romans respected Judaism for a number of reasons. The one thing they, the one of a few things they really couldn't stand, didn't like and expressed is the Jewish notion of a physical resurrection in the dualistic world it's that it's that polluted uh, stream that uh, manichaeism drank from gnosticism drank from um marcionite thinking emerged it's all the same thing the idea is simply that this world the physical world was created by a by a lower god by an inferior god or even a malnevolent god in the, in the gnostic view and that no one was returning back to the physical body the physical body is what you need to escape from now there was in this thinking an afterlife and people really looked forward to that afterlife but the afterlife was completely spiritual you know when 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 socrates he, he when he drank the hemlock he was 
delighted to be finished with this body. Cicero, in his sixth volume, Public, writes about how we're done with this physical world. He was perplexed by the Jewish belief. And that's what we find in probably Paul's most famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, where Jesus certainly, Paul is claiming, uh, resurrect from the dead, but not to the physical body that he came from. So that's that's what Paul was from. You you mentioned Alexandria. Yeah. Has anything godly ever come from Alexandria? Anything? Alexandria is where the doctrine of the Trinity emerged from. I mean, North Africa. It's not just Carthage where Tertullian coined the term, but that's where the the thinkers the people who shaped the Doctrine of the Trinity and who advocated for the Doctrine of the Trinity, that's where they emerged from. In fact, at the Council of Nicaea, the stars there, the star councils that were there, were, were Alexandrian bishop, Alexandrian thinkers. These are the people that are advancing these pagan ideas that emerge as the orthodoxy in the church. So they, there's, in Judaism, the resurrection is physical. The physical world is a good thing. We're created in the image of God. The notion that the physical world is revolting or sinful or is created by a, a lower God is completely antithetical to anything Jewish. So the physical resurrection is very important. In the ancient world, in the, in the dualistic world, the celestial bodies were beautiful, perfect, symmetry in the physical world. I mean, imagine, Neil, what it was like to live in the ancient world. People just died and didn't know why. People who appeared healthy were dead three months later. They didn't know an infection. Well, they didn't know any of these things. So they saw the world around them as broken bodies, broken bones, and broken wheels. They couldn't explain any of it. So they thought that this world was certainly a... That was the world of Paul. Paul wanted to just be removed into the clouds in First Thessalonians chapter 4 in the, in the rapture of the church. The idea was that this don't, if, if you're married, be good to your spouse. But it's best to be like me and, and be celibate. And I mean, First Corinthians chapter 7. I mean, you hear stuff like that run. So these ideas are utterly antithetical to the Jewish faith. The resurrection is a physical resurrection. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 19, Daniel 12, verse 2. So Paul is, is what he's doing is he's taking Jew, um, Jewish passages and reinterpreting them violently, viciously, in order to produce his Christology, which won out at the end. Just a comment on this. This is uh, uncharted territory. What the church will do is, although Paul wins, Paul uh, defeats his interlocutors. I'll rephrase that. Paul's Christology was the Christology that the orthodoxy of the church would uh, embrace, and they would reject his opponents. This is the one area that Paul lost in. In that, Paul is advancing the idea that the resurrection is a spiritual body. It's something different than what the, the mortal body that a person had. But the church would ultimately abandon that. It's the one area that Paul didn't win in. And we see in, in Matthew and Luke, and as we creep later in the Gospels, the Gospels are going out of their way to distance themselves from that idea. So, for instance, in the chapter we discussed earlier in in, in Luke chapter 24, it, it's very important for the author of Luke to say, here, Jesus has now appeared to the disciples in Jerusalem, and he's eating burnt fish with them. And he's saying, look, does a spirit eat and drink as I do with you? Where did that come from? That's certainly not in Mark, because there's no real resurrection appearance in Mark that the, the last 12 passages are invented. And then when we get to John, probably written 10, 15 years after Luke, and I'm being very conservative here. Um, we have Doubting Thomas was actually able to touch the flesh of Jesus. Like, where did that come from? That doesn't appear in earlier Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels. So what they're doing is in that one area, the church is uh, uh, backtreading, uh, distancing, distancing, distancing themselves 
from the from the idea that Paul that the resurrected body is spiritual. The church likes the idea of a physical resurrection, and they're going to go with that. That's the one area that Paul lost in. Interesting, because I'm you know there's there's actually quite a few verses in the Greek where he actually uses the word, and for example, he talks about gnosis and. Uh, I'm looking at this verse right here where he says, knowing all the mysteries in all gnosis, if I have faith is to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Now, what kind of language is that? Is that something we see? Like Paul claims to be a Pharisee from the line of Gamaliel. Now, you're familiar with the teachings of Gamaliel. Does this make sense? Does this line up at all? What do you, what's your thoughts on that? The word mystery doesn't really even appear anywhere in Tanakh. This is uniquely Pauline. It doesn't even appear in the Gospels. The, the, this, but this is huge in Paul, that yeah. there's special knowledge. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. Um, Colossians chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Paul says, in fact, listen, this is like so mind-blowing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, Paul says that this is a grand mystery. The whole notion that the Messiah is to die and resurrect, like, that's, no one knew that. This is a grand mystery. And, he says, if the rulers of the epoch had known of the truth about the Lord of glory, they would have never crucified Jesus. That's mind blowing. You can see what he's saying. This is this is very Pauline. That, this is one of the reasons why I am convinced, contrary to what most scholars believe, I'm convinced that books like um, Colossians and Ephesians in particular are Pauline. He may have had a scribe who, uh, a secretary who wrote them, so there's a little different, some vocabulary variances there. But this idea penetrates Colossians, is all over Ephesians, and is all over the indisputed letters of Paul. The key is that there's special knowledge. That, that's what is the Gnostic movement about? That there's special knowledge where you can escape the rea this world and go into better world right. into the that's what it's all about. That this world is created by some lower god. Paul says that this is a grand mystery. Incidentally, if theology could be taught that there's a grand mystery, then what religion could be what religion could be dismissed? Then why, and I want to speak to the Christians watching me right now, why do you reject then the Church of the Latter-day Saints? Maybe, maybe maybe, Joseph Smith, this is a grand mystery, that Joseph Smith um, was able to find only through a special revelation of the angel Moroni. Then what claim could be dismissed? The Torah has in it a fail-safe system. Torah simply said you can't add to it or take away from it. And if anybody comes along and takes away from it, kill him. He's a false prophet. That's baked into Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. That's baked into Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, or the last passage of Deuteronomy chapter 12, depending if you use a Jewish or Christian Bible, respectively. So the Torah is written in the following way. No one can add to this message, and if anyone comes along and tells you any doctrine that's different than what you're reading here, that what your fathers know, Deuteronomy 13, verse 5, 6, and 7, he's a false prophet. So you can't, the Torah is built in a way, it's structured in a way that no one can add to it. There are no new commandments in the book of Isaiah, not one. There's nothing new in Jeremiah. Isaiah and Jeremiah are both saying, get your act together, and this is what you're doing wrong. But there's nothing, they're introducing nothing. There's no new commandment, and there's no new idea. So this idea of mystery is all over Ephesians. It's all over Romans, it's all over Colossians, it's all over for the idea is that there's a grand mystery that no one knows about. Now, think about this. You know, Neil, people are going to, missionaries are going to tell you, look at the Bible, Jesus is there. His death and resurrection is openly in your Hebrew Bible. Would you accept Christ in your life right now? Accept Yeshua. You've heard this deal a hundred times. 
really? Well, Paul is saying that actually you would never know about it if you read the Hebrew Bible, and this is a, a grand, brand new revelation of mystery that only the true believers have. If that's not Gnosticism, what is it? Yeah, and on top of that, with the mystery thing you were talking about, if one doesn't understand this mystery language, you might it might go right over your head. You might just think this is just Christian stuff. But this this language is very, very, very popular in the Greek world. The Illusionian mysteries, for example. You have right. that you have Demeter, who was represented by grain, Bacchus represented by grape, drinking the blood and eating the bread would be taking in the gods. You you literally became Bacchus. You go into a frenzy and you became Bacchus. You were reborn, resurrected, death, rebirth, all that, all that, all those tropes that you're seeing Christianity all over the Greek world, way before Christianity even thought even a thought in anyone's mind. So my question, I guess, to throw it back at you again, what where um what is your thoughts on that? And is I mean what is what do you think Christians are trying to to like picture what are, what are they trying to pull from the old testament and say this is christians are in an unenviable predicament and that is they have ideas core tenets that are completely alien to the hebrew bible but there's in a sense stuck as a hindu one sent to me he said christians are stuck they're anchored by the Hebrew Bible, which Hindus are not. And therefore, they have to, Christianity has to make sense in light of the Hebrew Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16, the passages I meant earlier. The, the, the argument of the New Testament is that the belief in Jesus is a fulfillment of your own Torah. If you would have believed in Moses, you would have believed in me because he wrote about me. John chapter 5. I'm not making this up. <laughs> it really is there. I'm not making up these verses. The path, the Christian Bible is repeatedly stating that you just look at your own Bible. Jesus is there. He's on every page. So therefore, you have these doctrines that are not only not the same. It's not, it's not a different orientation than Judaism. It, it's rather ideas that are opposed by the prophets of Israel, and now they're stuck with, well, what do we do? They don't teach the Bible to what they're, you're going, but Christians now can read the Bible. They don't. They really, Christians are not reading Jeremiah, and they're certainly not reading in the original Hebrew, and the church in, ensures that by not teaching their kids the Hebrew language. And it's understandable why the church, the Catholic church, would burn at the stake people who translated the Bible into the English language. What, why do they kill Tyndale in that way? Well, because he he made the Bible accessible to Christians, but they still don't read it. So what's happening is Christians are in the predicament that they have a doctrines, the doctrine of the Trinity, the teachings of Paul, uh, the antinomian teachings of Paul, that means you don't have to keep ritual commandments any longer. And they have to, that has to make sense yeah. in light of the Hebrew Bible. I'm just like, it can't work. Now, let me ask you this now. So we, we talked about this on my channel before, but maybe somebody doesn't, you know, isn't caught up and we can go back to some things we talked about, you know, last year, maybe some of the stuff that they Christians are looking at the old Testament and just getting it wrong. For example, you know, um, you know, like the virgin thing, or what other examples are there besides that? <laughs> it, Matthew prov provides eleven of uh, eleven fulfillment citations that are completely. It's not that it's a misunderstanding; mm. it's it's scandalous. It means the passages are invented, taken out of context, or chopped up completely. Paul. There are really two characters, two writers in the New Testament that uh, quote extensively from the Hebrew Bible. One of them is Matthew and the other is Paul. In, in Romans chapter 10, as an example, Paul is, we presume, quoting from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let me just give a background. Deuteronomy 30 is there to convey, it's the very end of the Torah, 
Really, you really can keep the Torah. You can do it. It's not too difficult. It's not far off. It's not in heaven who will bring it to us that we may do it. You, if the word is near to you so that you may do it. And, and I urge you to look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. Okay? Just really simple, so that you may do it. But then we go to Romans, Romans chapter 2. Romans is the the last letter of Paul chronologically, but more germane to this conversation, it's the most important letter of Paul. It's like the constitution of Christianity. And in verse 8, he, he quotes this verse. He, he supposedly quotes Deuteronomy 30, verse 14, where it says, the word is near to you, in your mouth and in your heart. Now, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 14, I beg you to look it up, the passage ends, so that you may do it. So that you may do it. That's the point. The point is, you can do it. Anybody who tells you you can't keep the Torah, don't listen, you can do it. Okay. What does Paul do in Romans chapter 10, verse 8? He takes a scalpel and he cuts out the last words that you may do, which is the whole point, and deletes it. Gone. Disappeared. How do you play with the Bible? How do you literally excise the whole point of the text? What are you doing? And if you're going to play with my Bible, you think I'm going to be a Christian? You think I'm going to convert to Christianity? This idea that you can't do it, this antinomian approach is found all over the place. Misquoting Habakkuk, very famous chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, where Habakkuk, Habakkuk, in the Habakkuk says is a prophet who says, "Look, be patient. Um, uh, those who have trust in God, the sal- the ultimate redemption will take place, and the person who is really faithful will someone someone who is righteous will really have faith in God. Will have faith." Okay. Paul completely misapplies that in Romans, completely misapplies that in Ephesians, so that that uh, that faith is what makes someone righteous. It completely ripped Habakkuk completely out of context. So that's routine in Paul. Now here's the the point that I want you viewers to get. Strikingly, Paul was the great success in Christianity, and Matthew was the great failure. Mm-hmm. What do I mean? Paul was written with with who in mind? Paul was writing primarily to a non-Jewish audience, right? People who couldn't tell the difference between chaff and wheat, between genuine biblical hermeneutics that Rabbi Gamliel would have engaged in and, 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 and the game of hide the ball. So his audience bought it. That's why Paul was so successful, because Paul was writing to non-Jews who were clueless about the Hebrew Bible. I mean, imagine the ancient world where you couldn't even get a Bible because it had to be handwritten. Matthew, on the other hand, who was Matthew's intended audience? Almost certainly Jewish people, right? Matthew, we don't know who wrote Matthew. We don't know where it was written. But we can be fairly sure that Matthew had a Jewish audience in mind, and he wanted to convince them to become what we now call Christians. Matthew, therefore, engages in fulfillment citations, quoting passages in the Bible that none of the other Gospels do it, certainly not in the way Matthew does. What happens? The Jews, reading Matthew, encountering Matthew, go, oh, we definitely know that Christianity is a false religion. So Matthew fails because he quotes the Bible, Paul succeeds because he quotes the Bible, not because of the integrity, but because of who the audience is. Paul succeeds because his audience was were ignoramuses. They had just no knowledge of the Hebrew Bible. Matthew's intended audience, Jews, were people who could understand the Hebrew Bible and knew immediately to reject the tenets of the church. Wow, that's interesting. Now, I'm about to turn the heat up on you a little bit. I want to ask you this, and I can already tell this is going to be the intro probably. When Christians come up to you and say that all these verses and all these passages in the New Testament, like, you know, Jesus is carrying his cross is so much like Isaac carrying his wood, the only begotten son. Joseph is getting sold for 30 shekels. So is Jesus by Judah, Judas, where Joseph is sold by Judah. And all these things that are happening in the Old Testament seem to point to Jesus. 
What is your response to that? What religion then could be dismissed? <laughs> that means that means anything is possible. If you can simply take an event in the Hebrew Bible and apply it to someone else who suffered, died miserably later, then how doesn't this apply to Joseph Smith? I'll take a person who really, there are branch Davidians who believe that David Koresh, a man who, who died in a battle with federal agents years ago, David Koresh is the Messiah. And David Koresh is mentioned as the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible. Really? I mean, the Messiah, so David Koresh not only died in this violent ending in, in Janet Reno, I mean, it was, but David, David is the name of the Messiah. You know, David Koresh came to Jerusalem to study in Israel. He went to the Asia Torah school in order to just learn a little bit. Right. The Messiah's name is David. Koresh, the Bible says, is the Messiah. I'm not kidding. What are you talking about, singer? <laughs> well, as it turns out, Cyrus is not the real name in of of the Persian king. It's Koresh. That means mm. it, it's yep. Anglicized to Cyrus. But if you go to the Hebrew, it's Koresh. See yeah. the first chapter of Ezra. So Aramaic. David, David Koresh. And he died, and he died so horribly in this. And this is all Joseph. He was sold out by his own people. So and he knew the scripture back and forth better than anyone else in the world. He was the guy. Right. Ask exactly. James Tabor. James Tabor knew the guy personally. He said he could quote any any verse. You could you can you can test them out too. You could be like, all right, let's see. You right. know, your Bible in front of you. What's what's Revelation three twelve? Boom, he'll say it. Or what's right. or even the Old Testament. You can say what's Micah five two. Boom, he'll say it. So people like that, what do you say about that? Right. right. So so what what happens then is if we can act so loosely with the Bible with such elasticity, events in the past where people died or people suffered or people Joseph actually survived, so I don't even understand how this applies. But anyway, we, if you could do that, then what religion could be dismissed? Moreover, I think people lose track of what the claim of the church is. What missionaries will tell you is that the 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 messiahship of Jesus can be proven from the Hebrew Bible. They're not saying it's inferred from a story in the Hebrew Bible that we are then applying to Jesus without any text saying that the events in Joseph could be applied. So what they're doing is they're they're, they're playing a game. They're, they start off by saying, this is the claim. And if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you've been living under a rock. Their claim is not that there's some story in the Bible that we can apply to it. Their claim is that the Hebrew Bible proves that Jesus is the Messiah. And if you don't never heard that, it means you've never spoken to someone in in chosen people ministries in the Southern Baptist Convention, the Summers ago. That's their claim. So what they do is you go to them, okay, you're saying there's proof in the Hebrew Bible to Jesus the Messiah, please. Tell me, please tell me the proof. And that's what I do when I'm encountering a Christian, whether it's on a debate stage or on the streets of Jerusalem and New York. I'm saying, please tell me. I, I want to hear this proof, right? And then you go, what? That wasn't what you claimed. So you're giving me a story of Isaac carrying what up? No, that wasn't your. So what they're doing is they're say, making a claim, a really fantastic claim. That doesn't mean it's. Not true, but fantastic claims require fantastic evidence. And then you're giving, providing no evidence. You're essentially engaging in what Paul did. The most egregious actor here is whoever wrote the epistle of Barnabas. That was his argument. His argument is the Jews never understood their own Bible. That's a book that almost made it into the Christian canon. It made it to some some Christians thought it belonged to the Christian. That was the whole argument that you have to spiritualize everything. You have to spiritualize everything. Why is the Roman Catholic Church wrong? The Roman Catholic Church, the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church are rejected by these evangelical Protestant Christians because they're saying that the 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 Roman Catholic Church is are, are teaching the Roman Catholic Church is teaching things that are not if from the scripture, but really outside the scripture, from a tradition, right? 
Well, yeah. well, the Roman Catholic Church, would you accept the Roman Catholic Church saying, but you could see it inferred because of the story? No, you wouldn't accept that. So why are you accepting, why are you playing this game? It's the same thing when they say they have miracles in their lives. You know, even though the Lord changed my life, I had a miracle. You know, I had a cold and two weeks later went away. Really, the Roman Catholic Church claims miracles. I lived in the Far East. I traveled to the Philippines regularly, which is very close to Indonesia, and lectured there extensively. In the Philippines, people are having pancakes with Mary every Sunday. Why do you reject <laughs> those miracles? Why are you rejecting everybody else's miracles and how their lives were changed and how they're not doing drugs and alcohol anymore? People are becoming Muslims. People become Hindu. Whatever religion they get, people stop doing drugs, whatever religion it is. So why? And what they're doing is they're saying, no, only if someone in our sect, our iteration of Christianity has a miracle, only that's acceptable. But if it's someone in the Roman Catholic Church who has the miracle of stigmato, whatever. No, those we don't accept. The appearances Doesn't of Mary, and somehow Mary only appears to people in Brazil, the Philippines, right? right she doesn't right. appear to anybody in Saudi Arabia. Apparently, she can't get a visa. Like, why doesn't the Virgin Mary appear to anybody, you know, on the island of Bali? Why? Because it's yeah. they're Hindus there. They don't know what the Virgin Mary is. No, right. it's and in Bali, you know, it's only Hanuman, the monkey god, that appears to people. Why is that? Yeah, like, that'll pop up. Yeah. Like, um, now, now, let me yeah. ask because we've talked about the suffering Messiah motif that comes out of uh, Isaiah 53. And we've you, you demonstrated on my channel how the text is talking about Israel being the servant. Christians take that, personalize it, throw it on to Jesus. Another verse that's being tossed at me lately, even by myth, even by atheists, mythicists are to tossing this at me all day. It's this verse right here. Zechariah 14.4 that says, then the Lord will go out to fight against these nations and he fights in the day of battle. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And on the Mount of Olives will split two from east, west, forming the great valley with the mountain moving and blah, 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 blah. Anyways, they say, look, this happened. And historically, Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, too. So there you go. He's, he's the Messiah. And so what do you, I just want to get your response to that. So if I concede all that to the Christians, sure. then all your work is ahead of you. You've now made the problem worse. Zechariah 14 is a messianic chapter. In fact, the entire end of Zechariah, all of it, eight, nine, ten, it's all messianic. Okay. So if I concede, which I do, that Zechariah 14 is a messianic chapter, that proves that Jesus can't be the Messiah. What happens is people just stop reading. Zechariah 14 tells us that in those days, God will be king of the whole world. He will be one, and his name will be one. Zechariah 14, verse 9. Well, that really didn't happen. So if uh, so, what I would say to the Christian, if you're watching me now, I can see this. In fact, Zechariah 14 is clearly messianic. It's the last chapter of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah tells us that when this occurs, all the nations will come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles. Well, that didn't happen. Not only did any of this occur, but in fact, the temple was destroyed shortly after the beginning of Christianity. The Jews sent it to exile. The wow. knowledge of God was diminished, shattered, rather than expanded. So I say this to you, the Christian, I concede it all. That's where your problem, you've now created a big problem. You know, this always, you, you I think, are too young for this. But um, I remember Watergate as Whatever, uh, whatever. I was in my teens. I remember Watergate, and my I remember my mother saying to me, "This is the biggest thing, you know, Nixon, Watergate, the right. president." Right? And my I remember my mom saying to me, "You see, it's the cover up. That's what gets you in trouble. That's what got him in trouble. The it's the cover up, stupid." Meaning, when you engage in this this kind of criminal hermeneutics, you're going to get caught. Why? Because then you're exposing yourself. If you're saying Zechariah 14 is is speaking about the Messiah, 
that's where your problems begin. They don't end there. Because the, the whole end of Zechariah 14 tells about the whole world will know the truth about God. They'll celebrate, celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles. And not only that, the last verse, and if you, if, you, if you don't remember every passage I quote, the last verse of the book of Zechariah, that's 14 verse 21, tells that all the kings are going to be bringing sacrifices and offerings. Whoa! I thought there's no longer any sacrificial system uh, after Jesus, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18, Romans chapter 6. This doesn't, if, if therefore, if Zechariah 14 is about the Messiah, which I, of course it is, that proves that Jesus isn't the Messiah. Could there be a greater proof that Christianity is a false religion than Zechariah chapter 14? Think about this from a, from, from a theist position, okay? I'm an Orthodox rabbi. It, no matter what you believe, well, whatever you the viewer believe if god is behind this bible somehow it's a it's a holy book right it would have to be meaningful to everyone it, it couldn't be written in a way that only scholars and people with phd's from dallas theological could understand it i mean whatever you would assign to the, the 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 inspiration of the Hebrew Bible, whatever you believe, whether you're a believer, you quite whatever it is, but it doesn't make sense that the Bible is written in a way that no one can understand it. The, when anyone tells you that there's a grand mystery that no one knows about, you know it's a false religion. Why? Because the whole point of saying there's a grand mystery and there's special gnosis, special knowledge, is saying that's your, that you're advertising this is a false religion. Because you're saying, I can't base it on anything in a past text, and therefore this is something new. But how do I, I can't tell you it's new, because if it's new, that means someone invented it. So I say this is a grand mystery, a progressive revelation. How ridiculous. That that's completely unfalsifiable. The Hebrew Bible says, if anybody comes along later and says anything different than you know, kill them. You know, think about, you know, I debated the person who I believe, and many believe, is the, the greatest uh, Christian apologist in the English-speaking world, um, William Lane Craig. And we, we debated on... Um, we debated on Christian television, right? And he made this claim. He's a very nice guy. He really is. He's a great guy. But he claimed this on air that there's the Doctrine of Trinity is some progressive revelation. And I asked him, well, how could it be a progressive revelation? You, you can't add to it. You can't take away from it. But think about this for a moment. The Torah is given some 3,300 years ago, and Christianity begins 2,000 years ago, roughly. Right, so for thirteen hundred years, the Jews knew nothing about the doctrine of the Trinity, nothing. Right, and it was very important to whoever wrote the Torah that the people who read it follow it. Like, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Right, right. It's very, and God punished the Jews for all those years for not worshiping Him in truth. And then, ha, here's the doctrine of the Trinity. The moment you say, um, the moment you say a progressive revelation of sorts, you then admit you have a false religion. Why do you need a progressive? Why would on doctrine, how can there be a progressive revelation? How? Everyone has to know the truth. So the, the Zechariah 14 demonstrates that Jesus is not the Messiah. Yeah, because you had this law code, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers. These are the words that are coming from God to Moses. Okay? In this text, they're telling Moses, here's what you need to do as a nation from now until the end of time. Don't change, don't take away, don't add, don't subtract. Here's everything you need to know, done. Christianity comes along and says, well, yeah, that's cool, but we also have the Trinity now. We also have um, we also have some other things too. We also, oh yeah, the laws, yeah, you can, you can do them if you want to, but you don't really have to anymore. It just flips everything on its head. And so what you're saying is, if this was the case, why why are we listening to Peter saying that he had a dream that we can eat whatever we want, rather than what Moses actually gave us? And on top of that, as far as something like uh, you know suffering servant stuff, if that's the case, we should have the kingdom of heaven being given to us by Jesus without a question. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to believe in it. We don't have to have faith in it. It either happened or it didn't. You're saying that this is black and white. There is no 
If it happened, if it didn't, if it did, it did. Black and white, yes or no. And the answer right now is no. Messiah hasn't come yet. Right. The Messianic prophecies in the Hebrew Bible are very, very clear. There's nothing mysterious about it. Isaiah 11, you know, uh, what will he do? He'll be a, a teacher. He'll judge people with justice. That's it. No, he's not a miracle man. The he will judge the nations. I'm translating as I'm speaking to you. Um, he's going to bring about a worldwide peace. It's really very simple. Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11 is very straightforward. What the church has to do is just dismiss all that. The New Testament doesn't even quote Isaiah chapter 2 for some reason and reinterpret text. Isaiah tells us who the servant who's suffering is. See the ch the chapters that introduce Isaiah 43, Isaiah 41, 8, 9, 42, 6, 43, 10, 11, 44, 1, 44, 21, 45, 4, 48, 20, 49, 3. The servant is Israel. What Christians, the problem for Christians, they just don't read it in context. I challenge Christians on the street. What does it say in Isaiah 54? I've done this many times. You can watch the videos on YouTube. They have no idea, no clue. How is that possible? They don't know what it says in 52 or 51 or 50. They, so by having this knowledge of only one chapter and the rest of the book, all they know is Isaiah 7, 9, and 53. So what is that going to do to someone? So of course it's going to be completely ripped out of context. So subvert Isaiah 2 and 11 Pick 53 without knowledge of the chapters that introduce it. How much trouble are you going to be in? An enormous amount of trouble. That's what's going on. Let me ask you this. We can end on this too, because this, this might be a, a really, this might be the slam dunk right here for Christians to hear this. Is there anything in the Old Testament, like Deuteronomy, the Torah, anywhere in there, that we get the words from God to Moses, for example? Is there anything that there's is said? That refutes that Christianity can't be true because it says this, for example, like you know something like God is not a man or so, something along those lines. Like, what do we have anything in the Old Testament that that if we if we all accept, even Christians accept the Old Testament that everything's fine, everything's true. These are real divine divine or oracles being given to Moses by the Most High. We all accept that. What in there that we know about? refutes Christianity just for, just existing. As for the wicked man, the person who sins, if he turns away from his sinful ways, I will freely forgive him. Okay? Is it my desire at all to punish the wicked? Is it not rather that he turns from his sinful ways that he might be forgiven? None of his transgressions will be remembered against him. Ezekiel 18, 21 through 23. The chapter is addressing the heresy of vicarious atonement. I mean, that's the whole chapter. So the context of Ezekiel 18 is that vicarious atonement is heresy, that the innocent can't die for the sins of the wicked. So in a fundament, fundamentally, if we even sort of move away, get rid of the Trinity, the doctrine of vicarious atonement is baked into the New Testament, with the exception of Luke Acts. There you won't find it. Uh, whoever wrote the third gospel didn't believe in it. And in fact, the passage that Jesus was our ransom in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, and Matthew chapter 20, I think verse 28, uh, that idea is completely opposed by the Hebrew Bible. Would you, I say this to you, the viewer, would you want to live in a country where innocent people were punished and guilty people were exonerated? No. Would you want to live in a country where people who are innocent suffered uh, for the bad behavior of criminals? Of course not. We would never want it. Well, why would you? Why would you think that God would want that? The idea is completely unknown to the Hebrew Bible. You reject it. So why would you think that you're more merciful or just than God? So if God would never do that, why would you? Why would if you would never believe something like that? Why would you impose it onto God? It, it doesn't. It makes no sense. Except 
it's very so the question neil i wanted to address is this then why is christianity so attractive like then if what i'm saying in any way maps on to truth and of the hebrew bible then then why are people christians then well, the answer is that christianity addresses man's low self-esteem when people look in the mirror and see somebody unattractive uh, they you know when, excuse me when people look in the mirror they see someone who's not attractive people struggle with their self-esteem christianity simply affirms and says you are a sinner you, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. That's what's attractive, and Jesus will never betray you. Christianity essentially is man's effort to create God in his image, but the perfect man. Wow. And Judaism is God creating man in his image. You know, I, I remember this. When I lived in the United States, I'm going back 17, I haven't lived there in about 17 years. I remember when I would be checking out of a supermarket, you'd see magazines. Um, whatever, they wanted you to buy a magazine as you're paying. And I would look at who's on the cover of the magazines, actors, actresses, who are incredibly attractive, right? They're, they're not, they're not average looking people, but there's nothing else besides that. There's nothing, I don't want to name them, but what, what does this person have to offer? It's just attractive. Well, that's what Jesus, is. like, why would they, why would an, an actor, is paid to lie. <laughs> he doesn't even come with it. Like, why is an act? They're good looking people. They're definitely above average looking people. No question these photographs are Photoshop, but they're good looking people. That's it. That's the whole deal. Jesus is what you will never be. He's perfect. He's not fat. He's in great <laughs> shape. He's never, he's never bald. He's got the he has gorgeous hair. He, he right. that's and Jesus is what you will never be. But if Jesus is God, why is he then righteous? Like, like it doesn't even make sense. Like, why yeah, Jesus was righteous? Like the he anointed gone to one, the gay bar. Like what? The like, anointed one is supposed to be anointed by God's anointed one. So it's right. God's God's anointed self. He anoints himself because he's and it's like. And then that brings a whole nother thing in, and we can have a, we can have a whole nother discussion about this. Is the idea of John talking about in the beginning there was a logos, and the logos was with God. The logos is God. Whoa, mm -hmm. wait a minute. Why didn't Moses know about this logos that was there in the beginning? What's going on? What? Why is this being taught? Why is this the last stage of of this religion? All of a sudden, a fellow I named Chaim. I'm not kidding. You you know you know him as Philo, but his real his Hebrew name was Chaim. Lived in. Here we go. Yeah. What did we talk about at the beginning of the show? Where does everything wicked come from? Alexandria, right? That's what, Alexandria. I, we're not making this up. This wasn't planned. Neil and I didn't plan it out. We started off that Alexandria. What good thing can come from Alexandria? I'm obviously using a New Testament line. But Alexandria. So you have a guy who's a completely Hellenized. Jew who visits the land of Israel, who lives exactly the time when Christianity begins. He's born in 20 BCE and he's dead in the 50s, right? So he's living exactly when everything happens. Right smack dab in the middle. Right. So it's his influence. The logos, all that is 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 Philo. All that is a, a Jew who's completely Hellenized, of course. And it always falls back on Philo. He's the answer to everything. But um mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't any any last touching last touches on this topic because I think you said a lot. I think you really did say a lot. I, I think Jews are a very unique people. We can produce the best and we can produce the worst. We we really are I think maybe that's why we're so polarizing. We have produced the greatest prophets in history and we've produced the greatest scam artists in history. I mean, no one can outdo the Jews, <laughs> whatever your game is. I mean, you look at Paul, I, although Paul is completely Hellenized, he was no doubt Jewish, uh, Philo, these are the people who poison the world and produce really terrific people like our, the greatest prophets who ever lived, people who are willing to risk their lives on behalf of what they believe. Uh, Jews, I think, are high. That's why I think Jews are in the news a lot. And it, it's because Jews are polarizing. We we're, we have this ability to produce the best or the worst that society could produce. And look at the effect that it had on on the Christian world. So yeah.
that, that's that's the thought I wanted to share. That becomes so obvious with this. I love having you on. It's always I always get I always get something different every time, and I love it. So go and subscribe to Rabbi Tobias Singer. Links in the description, and I I think you crushed it like always, and uh, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Every person needs to ask the question, why in churches are they taught very specific passages and the rest of the book is hidden to them? Let's go to the beginning. Let's go to Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9. Who is a servant there? Israel, Jacob. Isaiah 42, verse 6. Who is the light of the nations? Who is the covenant nation? Israel. Isaiah 43, verse 10. Atem edainu mashem avdi ashabacharti. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant that I have chosen. Because of the sins of my people, mi pesha ami nega lamo. For the transgressions of my people, they were stricken. Pow! Now I want you to do this because we're going to go. We're going now nuclear. For the transgression of my people, where he was punished. Bingo! But it doesn't say that. The NIV, the Shmen IV, all the Bibles change the Hebrew text and the translation because the original text says these four words, Mi Pesha Ami Negalamo. Those are the last four words. Please look it up for yourself. Hello and good night. And besides me, there is no other savior. I, you at Dow Theological Seminary pay careful attention to what you believe is the word of God. You at Full Theological Seminary, wake up. You at the, the Philadelphia College of Bible, wake up. You in Rome at the Vatican, wake up. Besides me, there is no other savior, none. So the servant is plural of the witnesses. We're not done. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And joining me again is Rabbi Tovaya Singer, who was on about a month ago, and that video was amazing. Everybody, we got got tons of views, still getting views, lots of comments, good comments, um, good dialogue, and people really enjoyed it. In fact, the, the reason why I'm having him back on is because I got some emails from some people, particularly Christians. But they're, you know, very polite about this. And they said, you know, you guys are making really good points. And this is, I got two people who said this. And they said it differently, but like to paraphrase what they're both saying they, they, along the lines of this. You guys are making really good points, but I didn't hear you say anything about Isaiah 53. You can't debunk Isaiah 53. You can't tell me that Isaiah 53 is not about Jesus. So before I throw it over to you, Rabbi, uh, I figured I should actually read the uh, verse in Isaiah 53 that they're talking about. And um, just so people are on the same page and we all know. And it says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that bore us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We are like sheep who have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And thus the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then it goes to, 
He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he did not, did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering sin, he will see his offspring prolong in his days. And then it says, and he suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. By the righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I give him a portion among the great and divide his spoils with the strong because he poured out, out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Okay, so what they're saying is this particular passage in Isaiah 53 is about Jesus on the cross suffering for the sins of humanity. Rabbi, what is the Hebrew version of this? Is it the same? Is it different? What is the meaning of this? Yeah. So this is a this is what's called a, a salad bar hermeneutics and I'll explain. It's like a helicopter landing in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah without having any knowledge of the content. I remember uh, when I came to Israel to live here in 2019, I was there was an Israel Day parade going up Fifth Avenue, and I was on a float. It was the next day, Monday, that I got on a flight. And at the end, as you're going up Fifth Avenue, I could see a guy holding up a huge sign that says, read Isaiah 53, something like that, and the Jews are hiding it. The Jews are hiding it. And it's a huge sign. Now, there had to be, I don't know, a quarter of a million people is praying, who knows? And this guy is right there in the middle of this whole parade, and it's around, I think, 73rd Street, 74th Street. The whole video of the, what I'm about to tell you is on YouTube. And I'm, like, blown away that we're hiding Isaiah 53. I jump off the back of the truck that was carrying us on the float. I run back down Fifth Avenue two blocks, two, two short blocks, and I approach him, and I ask him a question. I ask him, tell me, what does it say in Isaiah chapter 52? Let me just see this. This is amazing. Do you belong to a certain church? Is there a church that you belong to? Do you belong to a special church? Huh? It's amazing. Jews for Jesus. Brilliant. Do you know what it says in Isaiah? Do you know what it says in Isaiah 54? What does it say there? In Isaiah 52? I got an argument with somebody. The cops tell me don't get into uh, Bible verses. All right. Thank 52 all the way to 54 is the suffering servant. Well, what does it say in 54? It's a whole chapter. Do you know what it says in 53? So 53 you know, but 52 and 54 you don't know. No, no. You know, what does it say in 54? I don't get fucking interviews, okay? All right. All right. The guy's standing on the street with a sign, you figure you give an interview. And he was not happy with that. He, he, I asked him, tell me. What does it say in Isaiah chapter 54? I mean, you're really concerned about Isaiah 53. What does it say in the chapter before and chapter after? And he just starts cursing me out. And he identifies himself as working for Jews for Jesus. I'm not kidding. It's all, wow. you can just, yes, using language that it's right on there. And I asked him, like, what church do you believe? He said, I work for Jews for Jesus. I asked him, what is it like, what do you think? Like this chapter is sitting in the middle of nowhere? Every person needs to ask the question, why in churches are they taught very specific passages and the rest of the book is hidden to them? And if you approach Christians who put forward Isaiah 83, go ask them, what does it say in 52? What does it say in the beginning of 51? 50, they have to look it up. Why do you have to look it up? So the, this type 
of salad bar hermeneutics is what gets good, as you said, good Christians, sincere Christians in all the trouble in the world. And you can begin by asking the Christian who is speaking. If you don't ask that question about any passage in the Hebrew Bible, you're going to be lost. Isaiah poses a further challenge in that of 66 chapters, only four of them are written like Joshua and Judges. The rest of it is poetic, which means you really, really have to know the context. So who is speaking in Isaiah 53? Because from Isaiah 53, verse 1 through verse 8, the Gentile kings of nations are speaking. They are astonished. They are shocked. Now from verse 9, which you read, all the way through verse 12, God resumes speaking. So I want to divide this up. The section really of Isaiah 53 begins in Isaiah 50, 52, verse 13 through 15. God is speaking there. 53, 1 through 8, the Gentile kings of nations are speaking there. How do you know? Because it says it. In Isaiah 52, verse 15, the chapter break is completely artificial. It says that kings will shut their mouths because they'll be shocked for what they're going to see. And this is in the Messianic age. is like nothing they'd ever heard. What they are witnessing is like nothing they ever considered. And they ask the question of Isaiah 53, verse 1, Me, hem and lushmur, senu uzrei Hashem amin who would have believed our report? Who would ever believe such a thing? The nations of the world behold the salvation of the servant Israel, the nation of Israel, and they are astonished because they never imagined such a thing, just like the people who wrote you that message. Now, who is the servant? Because in the chapter, the, all we have is that word servant, both in Isaiah 52, verse 13, and Isaiah 53, verse 11, which you mentioned. Incidentally, in 53.11, I will say, it says, by his knowledge, my servant will vindicate the just for many. It, by his knowledge, if it's, if it's talking about Jesus, it's not by his knowledge, but by his blood, by his death, by his resurrection, not by his knowledge. So none of this makes sense. Wow. In order to understand Isaiah 53, you have to, we can all agree, and I want to speak to the Christians right now. We can all agree that Isaiah intended that when you read the 53rd chapter, that you read the chapters that introduce it. That, that can't be controversial. There are people watching me right now, listening to my voice right now, of many different beliefs or unbeliefs. But the one thing we can be certain, we can all agree on, is that whoever wrote this book intended that you read the chapters that introduce it. Okay, so here it is. All you have to do is go to Isaiah the 41, verse 8 and 9. That means what I'm going to do is Isaiah 53 is the fourth of four servant songs, the fourth. So let's go to the beginning. Let's go to Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9. Who is a servant there? Israel, Jacob. Isaiah 42, verse 6. Who is the light of the nations? Who is the covenant nation? Israel. Isaiah 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant that I have chosen. I want you to listen to that again. A, by the way, the J witnesses of that group, Can I they, jump? Took, they took the name from that. Go ahead. Okay, I've been following along this whole time, and I'm checking as you're, as you're naming verses in, in past. Right. I'm checking because I, I, I want to learn too. Um, you're, okay, so right now I'm looking at Chapter 43, verse 10, and the Lord says, you are my witnesses, plural. Right. Mm -hmm. And he says, and my servant who right. I have chosen. So right there, he's establishing Bingo. Bingo. servant is a plurality. You right. are my witnesses and my servant who I have chosen. So the servant, which is now a singular term, is coming from a plural term of witnesses. He's putting the nation of Israel as the suffering servant. This is the context right. for what's about to happen in, in a later chapter. By the way, sweetheart, you want to lose your mind. Go further in that exact same passage that I have chosen so that, read it, read it for the listeners so that you should Our, know, understand, and believe me. And look at the last, what does it say? 4310, the same passage. Okay, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know 
and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no good, w- no God was formed, nor will there be after me. I Bingo. Even, I even, I am the Lord and, what does it say? I, and before me, no God was formed. Continue. Nor will there be one after me. Next verse, verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me, there is no Savior. Hello and good night. And besides me, there is no other Savior. I, you at Dal Theological Seminary, pay careful attention to what you believe is the Word of God. You at Full Theological Seminary, wake up. You at the, the Philadelphia College of Bible, wake up. You in Rome at the Vatican, wake up. Besides me, there is no other Savior, none. So the servant is plural are the witnesses. We're not done. We'll just, I mean, we'll do as much as one. Isaiah 41. Of Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah 44, verse 1. Just turn the pages if you can. Do it with me. I want everything is at stake for the words. 44, verse 1. Okay. Let's just move to Isaiah 3. But Watch now, what happened. But now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, right. who, whom I have chosen. Did I did I sneak into your house and like put that in there? Did no. I break in? Did I hack into your computer and put it in there? Let's move on. 44, verse 21. Just so. We're going to make this very clear. Continue. 44, remember, 21. Remember these things, Jacob, which is also Israel. For you, Israel, are my servant. Hello. Let's go to 45, 4. <laughs> this is not a magic trick. I'm not. This is not. Which is, uh, you're reading it. I don't know what Bible you're reading it out. I don't know what version. Make I, difference. It right. won't make a difference there, sweetheart. 45, 45, verse 4. Just so you know. 45, verse 4. Yeah. It says. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, oh. my chosen. Oh. Very nice. 48 verse 20. He said very nice. 48. <laughs> hold on. I mean, who is the servant? I mean. It's Israel. Get, Israel. Who says it? Tovia Singer, who doesn't like Christians for some reason? No. This is the Bible. And this is not like I'm going to, to the book of Genesis here. I'm not like going to the book of Chronicles. We're in context. This is an in these are the sermon songs. Who is the ch- look in Judaism? Our rabbi is Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. That means Isaiah must be the chief commentary of the book of Isaiah. You see what I'm saying here? Not your commentaries that you have at home. Forget that. The only commentary that matters is Isaiah. Let's wow. continue. Isaiah 48, verse 20. Leave Babylon, flee from the Babylonians. Announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant, Jacob. Next, Isaiah 49, verse 3. You could see where this is going. Oh, my. We didn't set this up, by the way. That means before we got on air, I didn't know it was this. Clear. I didn't. I didn't. We we didn't like. This is not. This is completely. Extent. We we chatted for sixty seconds. I said, let's just talk on it because yeah. yeah so Isaiah forty nine. This is not like I biblical yeah, sleight of hand. Forty nine three. I'm just going to reveal something real quick. I always try to have a little bit of a game plan when I do my 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 recordings. To Rabbi always says, "Stop! No, just hit record. Let's go. I don't want to plan anything." He always right. does that. It's like right. he just likes to go off the cuff. But right. okay, what's the next one? 49.3. 49.3 says, he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I display my splendor. Unbelievable. Shocking. So yeah. number one, so now we know two things. Who is speaking? The Gentile kings of nations. Who is the servant? Isaiah 52.13 and 53.11 the servant is Israel. This is the fir- fourth of the four servant songs. Listen, my precious brothers and sisters, take a book, any book, holy or unholy, that has 66 chapters. Try it and just go to the 53rd chapter of any book. It could be a novel. It doesn't make a difference. You're not going to know what's going on. This is not only true for a book like Isaiah. This is true for any. This could be true for the The Hardy Boys, it doesn't make a difference. The point is, if you, and this is what's happening to Christians around the world, good people, but they're taught 53, but they're not taught Isaiah 41. They're not taught Isaiah 42, 43, 44, 45, 46. And how much trouble are you in? That's number one. 
So the nations of the world, this is a soliloquy, and it is gorgeous. The nations of the world in the Messianic age, at the end of days, are going to behold their error, their mistake. And they're going to realize the answer to a, a, a well-worn question, an ancient question. Why do the Jews suffer so much? Why? Until now, and that's 50. Two verse 15, we had thought that the suffering of the Jews can be attributed to that they rejected Christ. The, and all the church fathers said this. Augustine famously discusses this in his magnum opus, The City of God, that the Jews, the plight of the Jews is attributed to that they reject the Lord and kill the Lord, as Melito, that great luminary, the bishop from, from the second century. They killed the Lord, and that's why the Jews suffer so much. They rejected our Savior. That's why That's why the Jews suffer so much. But now, in the Messianic age, that explanation no longer works, because they are right, after all. Ten Gentiles will grab the shirt of a Jew, Zechariah 8, 23, and say, take us with you. Now we know God is with you. So this theme is all over the place. When the Messiah comes, the old explanation for why the Jews suffered completely dissipates. It, 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 it just, it's gone. It has to be jettisoned and replaced with a new explanation. And the non-Jews come to the two conclusions for the suffering of the Jews. Number one, the reason why the Jews suffered, as you read in the opening, is because of the sins of my people— Mipesha ami negalamo for the transgressions of my people, they were stricken. Pow! Now I want you to do this because we're going to go. We're going now nuclear. Okay, we're going now nuclear. Listen very carefully. You read that to me, Isaiah four fifty three verse eight. Yeah. What is that last phrase? What does it say in the NIV? For the transgression of my people, where he was punished. Bingo! But it doesn't say that. The NIV, the Shemen IV, all the Bibles change the Hebrew text and the translation because the original text says these four words, mi pesha ami negalamo. Those are the last four words. Please look it up for yourself. And and you, you read yeah, That's the right text right here. I'm gonna fa can I fact check you? Do you mind? Yeah, please. Right, and the key word we're very, very interested in is that last word in the text. Lamo. Nazareth. All right. So we're Isaiah 53. Verse 8. All right. Hold on. Here we go. Isaiah. It says, uh, Mi peshe, I me. Ami. Na, nage. Nega. Lamag. Lamo. 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 You see that word, Lamo? That's our key word. Mi pesha ami, nega Lamo, which means for the transgressions, ami, uh, like ah means a people. Army of my people, Nega Lamo, oh. they were stricken. The yeah. Hebrew says they were stricken. Oh, so that's say that. Right. So it says it doesn't say Nega Lo. That would be he was stricken. Lamo is plural. It means they were stricken, meaning Israel. It's not one person. Do you think that the church can let that sit? Do you think oh, one no. moment that the Christendom and Isaiah 53 is sacrosanct? Why? Daniel 9 is not mentioned in the New Testament. I'm talking about the text of the since 70 weeks. The, the the Isaiah 9, that's not in the Christian world. But this is, this was used by Philip to convert a eunuch from Gaza. So if this goes, everything goes. So the church literally raped the text, altered the text. The last word there is lamo, which means them. It's the equivalent of lahem. And they Changes to him, so it sounds like it's speaking about Jesus. How do you play with my Bible? How do you change the Word of God? It's unbelievable. And now, now I know some people might go, "Hey, a hey, singer, hold not so fast." How do, how do I know you're telling me the truth? I don't speak Hebrew. So why is it? Let's just dial it back for a moment, and then let's go for a moment. Just a few chapters earlier, we have that word Isaiah forty-eight verse twenty-one. We have the exact same word. All right, let me check. It. Oh, wow, it does say Lamo again. The same yes, word. Mayim Mitsur Hizilamo. What is the NIV translated there? He brought forth water for them. Look at the NIV. So the exact <laughs> same word. Say so this is very important. Look, like everything that's at stake here. So go to the NIV on Isaiah 48, verse 21. And what do you find there? Verse 21. What, 
Verse 21, 48, they, 21. They did not thirst when he right. had led them through the deserts. And he made water flow for them made from water. a rock. For them. Yeah, that's what it says. That's what I'm reading. Bingo. Water flow for them from the rock. And that's so, the word Lamo. Right. It's the exact oh, same word. Pray this, tell. This is the Why? same thing that's happening with right. the virgin thing, where they use the correct term patula in certain areas, but it gets translated into Greek as virgin. But then when the, when it comes to Alma, that word is translated into virgin, but that's not what it means. You're trans, right. You can't have it both ways. It's the same exact concept. Right. Right. So the church completely alters the Jewish scriptures in order to make it appear Christological. We saw earlier in Isaiah 43, verse 10, it's a very famous passage where oh, you are my witnesses, plural, declares the Lord, and my servant is singular. But in Isaiah 43, the church will not have that. And we have, this is not the only example. There are many. I'm giving you a very flamboyant example. Here in this third person plural pronoun, the church the church changes it to the singular because it is speaking about Jesus. We can't have it speaking about the Jews. If right. it's speaking about the Jews, then the New Testament's a liar. Then the whole thing completely collapses. So, number one, what the Gentile kings of nations are discovering is, is because of our bad behavior— from 1938 to 1945, that the Jewish people suffered. The Jews suffered as a result of our own iniquities. That's number one. Number two is very powerful. There are many people listening to my voice right now who are not Jewish, who have been drawn to the Jews, whose view of the Jewish people has been altered and shaped by the suffering of the Jewish people. There are people who studied the the show of the Holocaust, watch and lose this, and it just has an epic effect on the way people view the nation of Israel. We are seeing today, we are living in time now where there's more conversion to Judaism or people becoming B'nai Noach, which is embracing the Jewish faith, than we've seen in history. And many people say it was because of the suffering of the Jews that woke me up. By his stripes, we were healed. So we have, we're transfixed by this. And the next verse should let everyone know what's going on because God resumes speaking and he says that if the if the nation if the servant will make its soul a restitution then i'm going to bless the servant with long life with children he's going to see his seed and my purpose will be fulfilled in their hand now if this servant is god manifest in the flesh what if in fact this passage, if, I, if this passage, is Isaiah 53, verse 10, is speaking about Jesus, like God is going to give God long life if the servant would only make his soul a restitution, repent, and God is going to give the, the servant children. Jesus didn't have children. Here, here's, a, here's the question I want, you need to ask yourself. First of all, if, if, if is God his own servant, and then, okay, well, that that's right there. That doesn't make any sense. How can you be a servant of yourself? And second of all, God's the Messiah means God's anointed. Does he anoint himself and becomes his own Messiah? That These are the questions I think that are just, I, I mean, this should be right up front. And the first thing you should ask yourself. You know, you started this by saying really nice Christians. And I know you weren't, you weren't patronizing them, and neither right. was I. There's a reason why Christians get themselves in so much trouble, and they're not bad people. The reason is this is how they're taught in churches. They're not, they're not taught to think about Isaiah 53, verse 10, that the servant is given long life. How could Jesus be given? First of all, if it's his human state, he didn't live very long at all. But how <laughs> could God give God long life? What does that mean? God is eternal. He has no beginning. He is the first cause. How could God give the servant Jesus children. Well, Jesus never had children. What does it even mean? And the case will say, well, it means disciples, figurative children. The term there is zera. Zera always means seed, it means always physical children. And my purpose will be fulfilled, but will, and that and that God's purpose will prosper in his hand. But he, you are God. So the whole thing completely collapses when you insert the doctrine of the Trinity. Right. How could God be a servant to himself? Now, we're Christians will 
play with it. It's not they're not playing. They're trying to, if you throw it into the ocean and you're trying not to drown, they're they're just trying not to drown. They're saying, well, Jesus portrayed and calls himself a servant of God in the Gospels, which he does. Um, I I could do nothing of my own. Only the one who sent me, John 5.30. And that's true because in the Gospels, we don't have the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus is not co-equal with the Father. The Father is greater than I am. And that's from the book of John. That's a that's the highest Christology we have in the Christian canon. So it is true that the writers of the New Testament were not thinking that, that Jesus was equal to God. And Jesus says, again, I'm choosing John. He says to Mary, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my God and your God. So it's true in the Gospels, Jesus is portrayed as subordinate to the Father, of course, because Christianity would go through an enormous change where you have Ignatius, the earliest church father, identifying Jesus as fully God. And then, of course, you have uh, Tertullian coming up with the term of the Trinity at the essentially the very beginning of the third century, about the year 200 after his conversion from Carthage. And then you have the further development in the third century origin, the idea that Jesus is divine and but then the question is, was he created? And that, of course, gets that all gets solved. The Council of Nicaea at 325. And I just want to make a point for you. And I, I want to speak to the Christians. If you're Muslim, you're an atheist, you're a Jew, I'm not talking to you, but you can listen in. <laughs> We're very familiar with the with the Council of Nicaea, where Christians are gathered by Constantine to solve issues. There were two issues solved. The one that's germane is the the nature of Jesus's deity. Was he? They all sides held that he was divine in some way, but was he created or was he begotten and uncreated? Now, let me ask you a question. And that, by the way, is not the only council on this issue. There'll be another very important council, the Council of Constantinople in 381 under Theodosius, where this has to be resolved because it's not fully resolved at Nicaea. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You're a Christian. Listen, think about this moment. Has there ever been a council in the church, in any ecumenical council of any sort, asking the question, was Jesus born of a virgin? Ever. The answer is no. Why not? Because it says it in the New Testament. It's clear. Matthew and Luke clearly claim in the infancy narratives, two chapters in Luke, two chapters in Matthew, claim that Jesus was a virgin. There's no argument about it. Protestants and Catholics, Orthodox and snake-handling Appalachians all agree that he was born a virgin. So isn't it obvious that this is the issue that everyone is going through, the doctrine of the Trinity? So you're, this is, I, I know the question will be asked, well, it says in the gospel that Jesus came to serve as a servant. Right. That's a much lower Christology than the Nicene Creed. Perfect. Wow. Yes. Now, I gotta, we got to get into this now, because Isaiah is living in a specific time period. Now, before, before I ask you this question, I want to highlight something for a second. You mentioned that the Jewish people have been suffering throughout history. Now, I don't mm -hmm. care if you're an atheist and you think this means nothing. You cannot deny that this is a fact, that throughout the history of the Roman Empire and European history, Jews were forced to live in the ghettos. They were treated as second-class citizens. There was Inquisition trials on them. They were forced to convert to Catholicism in Germany. The French uh, kings and, and monarchs were openly anti-Semitic. This, is, this has been happening since the first century, since those wars broke out in Masada and Jerusalem and, and even in the second century. This has been... This is how the Romans always treated the Jews all the way up into the Holy Roman Empire, into the European age. This is how it has been. You cannot deny that. You, you don't, if you deny that, you don't know history. Now, with that being said, in the time of Isaiah, there was events happening related to what I'm talking about. Now, can you – so Isaiah is writing about stuff that he's seeing with his own eyes. This is the context of what's actually being said. What is Isaiah living through? That's my question. Isaiah lives over – an enormous span of time. Isaiah lived during the height of the Assyrian Empire. He, the four kings that he lived through, are identified in the very uh, the opening of Isaiah. He lived during the days of Uzziah, also known as Azariah, uh, a quarter of a century there. He had then his son Yotam, sixteen years. His son Ahaz, um, and the Assyrian Empire already is emerging there. And then you finally have the uh, Hezekiah, and he's Isaiah is murdered by. 
his grandson, Menashe, but Isaiah, so Isaiah is not prophet. So it's an enormous span of time, but it's the height of the Assyrian Empire, and two epic events occur during his lifetime. One at the very lowest point, and one at the highest point. The lowest point is that the Assyria comes and carries off what are called the Ten Lost Tribes. That happens during the lifetime of Isaiah. The proximate time, we're talking about, let's say, let's say 730, 740 BCE in that area. Uh, it, it happens in three ways, but all of the northern kingdom or the kingdom of Israel is carried away and they're gone to this day. They're gone. So that happens. They're extremely traumatic. Then the the Assyrian Empire comes after Jerusalem and surrounds the city that I'm in right now. 185,000 soldiers, Assyrian soldiers, come to destroy Jerusalem and more specifically to kill Hezekiah, to destroy him, to destroy the Davidic dynasty. And that's where the greatest miracle since the Exodus occurred occurs. So imagine you're in Jerusalem. We don't know how many people are there. And the 185,000 soldiers, I mean, when, when Bush went to war against Saddam, the coalition forces weren't that large. John, Paul Johnson estimates that by our in our time, that will be the equivalent of 4.2 million soldiers. The Jews had no chance. They were in Jerusalem. And then on an extraordinary night, it was a Passover night, Jewish people celebrated the Passover Seder, thinking they were going to die. They, there was not, they can hear the horses, the clashing of swords, and the wall around Jerusalem was the only thing that separated them and this mass army. The very next morning, they wake up, and it's silent. They climb over the top of the wall and the walls and look around them, and the entire Assyrian army is destroyed, is killed. Sancherv himself runs back home, and his own children assassinate him. That happens during a time of Isaiah, and the period, just to give you a span of time, so from the Exodus, roughly 3,300 years ago, to Isaiah, uh, excuse, uh, to Isaiah, um, roughly 2,700 years ago, we're talking about a span of 600 years, nothing like that ever occurred. So those are the epic world events. And, and incidentally, we have a lot of um uh, of material stones fragments that were, were done by other nations in the archaeology that verifies these events those of you who want to look at the bible you'll find this in isaiah 9 isaiah 36 and 37 second chronicles chapter 32 and second kings chapter 18 and 19 same story same event hezekiah is the great hero wow and that is fascinating hezekiah and um now right. in the north though in the north, things didn't go as well. As you mentioned, the twelve, the ten tribes get dispersed. But there's a king in the north, I believe. I, you, you know this name. Of, what happens to the king in the north at that time? Well, he, he, gets, he gets, he's assassinated. That, in fact, is what connects the I chapter Isaiah's, Isaiah chapter 7, the chapter that Matthew will use to claim that Jesus was destined to be born of a virgin because it was prophesied. What really is happening in Isaiah chapter 7 is the northern kingdom of Israel has an alliance with Syria. So the Ephro-Syria war, they go to battle against the southern kingdom. At that time, Hezekiah's father is king. His name is Ahaz, a very wicked king. Yeah. And what occurs then is Isaiah 7.14, it's talking about Isaiah's wife. You'll ask me more, I'll tell you more, that will blow your mind away. And then in Isaiah 7.15 and 7.16, it says that butter and honey will the child eat. This is Isaiah's own child, who his wife is to name him Emmanuel. Butter and honey will the child eat when he knows to reject bad and choose good. For before the child knows to reject good, uh, reject bad and choose good, these two kings will be destroyed. In fact, they're assassinated. Pekah ben Ramayo, These are they're they're assassinated, and that's how that is solved. But wow. it was it was a, it was a this incident just historically. This yeah. was a, Isaiah not only lived at this time. Hosea lived at this time. Um, Micah lived at this time. Um, so this is a time that we have yeah. some of the great prophets of Israel. Well, and the reason why I'm asking these questions is because some of the imagery that Isaiah and other prophets are using are things that he's seeing around him. He's seeing horrible things happen. If I'm not mistaken, 
uh, is it a prince or a king gets their eyes ripped out and they get pierced to yeah. a pierced? That's to... that's much later. That's much later. That's the last Davidic king. Um, uh, that's Zedekiah, Zedekiah, and he rebels against. So now we're, that's moving ahead about 180 years, okay. and he rebels. Uh, against Babylon, and his his kids, his family is wiped out in front of his eyes, and then his eyes are torn out, because th- that's the last thing he ever gets to see. Okay, but and, and so that's unrelated. But the reason why I'm bringing all this up, the reason why I'm trying to paint the picture of the of the world that Isaiah is living in, is because that is the context of what Isaiah is writing about. He is talking about events that are happening in his time. And Israel is suffering, and they are the servant. It's not. Let me suggest this. Let me suggest this: that it, this is a messianic prophecy about the future, and this is what will happen when the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes, the key event that will occur is all the nations will know the truth. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. So this is a future prophecy of the response of the Gentile kings of nations to the salvation of the Jewish people. Isaiah 52 is about the salvation of the Jewish people in the eyes of all the nations of the world. So this is a full redemption of the Jewish people, and an epic event at the end of times. And Isaiah 54 is about the salvation of the Jewish people in the singular, a woman who is barren, who ultimately is saved at that time, in the future time. Wow. So there you have it. This is this is a truly a a uh, a very vivid portrayal of of the suffering of israel and here's another and and so with all that being said this is already sort of unfolded throughout history this is not like oh israel's been fine since then and they think it's going to happen and it hasn't happened yet israel's fine no no this is history this is the last two thousand years how the jews have been crushed and treated and uh the the holocaust and the inquisition all the way leading up to Israel in the glory of Israel, getting their nation back, which is mind blowing. I mean, you don't you don't hear about the ancient Atlanteans getting their getting their colony back. Like this is this is crazy. This is thousands of years later, and these things are happening. So it's something interesting to look at. Yeah, very very much so. the The end time prop, the key element of the messianic age is not a man running around doing miracles. Because that's what you find when you read the Gospels. When you read the New Testament, it's unfortunate that every person who's who's read Mark has already read Matthew, so their, their view is completely colored by Matthew. But when you read the Gospels, any of them, what you have is a fellow going out throughout the north and then in Jerusalem, Performing miracles, he's a miracle maker. You know, he's he's taking uh, a paralytic and healing him in Mark chapter two and Matthew chapter nine. I mean, he's just, he's performing this this series of miracles. Okay, there's nothing remotely resembling anything like that in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, there is no mention in the Jewish scriptures of the Messiah perform any miracle at all. Nothing, not a single passage about that. The only thing the Messiah will do is he will teach the nations via chich bein amim. He will judge between the nations and the nations will repent. That's it. And wow. that's why, my friend, Isaiah chapter 2, this epic past chapter, which is even face of the United Nations on, on in, in Manhattan is not does not appear in the Christian Bible because Jesus didn't do anything like that. He didn't bring about a world peace and a worldwide knowledge of God. The nation will not lift up sword against nations. So it's never quoted in the Christian Bible. The Christian Bible is a typical mythological figure who runs around doing miracles like Vespasian was able to heal the blind, heal <laughs> those who are crippled. Same deal, same deal. You know, spit in dirt, put it on a guy's eyes, heal a person who's blind from birth. John chapter nine. That's what he is. He's a a miracle worker. And that's literally the same story that you get from Tacitus and Suetonius. The same two, the 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 go to, um, you know, references for the for Jesus. But those are also talking about Vespasian doing the same thing. So that's 
they don't talk about that. They're not, they're not like, oh, I believe that. But um, so now a lot of I'm, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of comments and they're gonna say this. But what about verse five? But he was pierced for our transgressions. What do you what do you what, what do you say to something like this? Is, let's let's take modern history. Um, the nations of the world took the Jews from Amsterdam. Almost no Jew in Amsterdam survived World War II. Amsterdam was completely eviscerated of its Jewish population, and they took them and sent them to Auschwitz, and they killed us. We suffered as a result of their iniquity. That's exactly what happened through history. What you just described, the nations of the world slaughtered us or remained silent. Didn't even the Americans didn't even bomb the railroad tracks to Auschwitz. We suffered as a direct result of the the transgressions of the nations of the world. And that's the passage you began with. Isaiah 53, 8, for our, the nations will finally discover that as a result of our bad behavior, that is, killing Jews, the Jewish people suffered. Ultimately, God picks up and says, let me explain to you what's happening here. The Jewish people are going to intercede. By his knowledge, my servant will vindicate the just for many. By his knowledge, the teaching of Torah, the role of the Jew is to be a light to the nation. See Isaiah 42, verse 6. See Isaiah 49, verse 6. Israel, my servant, and his, the servant is going to be a light to the Gentiles in Or Lagoyim and going to bring back the lost tribes of Jacob. Please, please see Isaiah 49, verse 6 and 7. It's right there in the text. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I also, so now, now that we've established the context of what has been written, you have to go, you have to read the whole chapter. You have to, or the whole, you have to read, yeah, the chapters before it. I mean, so you have to, it's building up to the chapter 53. You know the servant is Israel. We've just established that. We've, I mean, I think we've exhausted that. But then if you keep continuing to chapter 60, it talks about the glory of Zion. Right. And now this is what it says. And I, I picked out a specific chapter because it, it really highlights what we're talking about here. Because it says foreigners will rebuild your walls mm -hmm. and their kings will serve you. By the way, your walls, is Jesus have wall? Is Jesus a city? So then it says, though in anger I struck you, in favor I will show you compassion. Your gates will always stand open. It's talking about a, a, a nation. You want to blow your mind away? You want to lose your mind? Shut day or night, so the people will bring you wealth of nations. And then it says, um, the glory of Lebanon will come to you. All who despise you will be down at your feet, and they'll call you the city of the Lord. Zion, the holy one of Israel. It's talking about Zion. It couldn't be any more clear in that passage. Right. Isaiah 60, verse 14 and the sons of those who afflicted you, exact same words as Isaiah 53, what will they do? They will come bending low to you, those who despise you. You remember despised and afflicted? Does those words sound familiar at all from Isaiah 53? This is all the same package. What will they do? They'll come bowing at your feet. Now, it doesn't mean that we're making the non-Jews our slaves. That's not what it means. It means they're going to say, we want to connect to you. We want to be a part of this. So much so, I'm going back to Isaiah 2. All you guys who are reading these chapters should have read Isaiah chapter 2, that all the nations will go up to Zion, go up to Jerusalem, for out of Zion will go forth the and the word of God from Jerusalem. Ki mitzion. Please read Isaiah chapter 2. This is your homework, verse 1 through 4. That's all you got to do, okay? It says, Ki mitzion tete Torah, for out of Zion will go forth the Torah, Udvar Hashem Yerushalayim, and the word of God from Jerusalem. It says it right there. Please read Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, 3, and 4. And you will be out of the church. You will cancel your membership. You'll ask for a refund for the membership you've been paying to your church. And just to top it off, when you get so, it gets even more clear. At the end of Isaiah chapter 60, he starts saying, then all your people will be righteous. What, Jesus has clones of himself? A million? And he says, the least of you will become a thousand. The smallest, a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will do this. He's talking about a thousand. Is there a thousand Jesuses out there? Is he have clones? No, it's people. This is plural. 
I just, I mean, that, that that right there is like that's that seals it shut. He's literally yeah. talking about plurality, a nation, about having walls, about having doors. That is not Jesus. You can't. Jesus doesn't have doors and walls, and he's not a thousand. Right. So I right. that, that that was something I noticed right there that I wanted to to add to the to what you were saying. And but yeah, this is if you want to wrap this all up and sort of make it. Uh, Isaiah you know, Christians might argue. Isaiah 53, verse 9, it says there he, uh, because he committed no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Okay, look at the end of 53, verse 9. Okay? Let's go to that real quick. 53. Yeah, just for a second. All right, so it says, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So there's happens to be another example of a changing of text. The word there is b'moysav, which is plural, in his death, not singular death. But I, I don't want to focus on that right now. I want to go to the end of that because I know this is going to uh, disturb Christians. And they're going to ask, well, one second, so this is talking about the nation of Israel. You're saying because he had committed no violence and there was no deceit, they didn't lie, there was no deceit found in the mouth, Jews? Is that what we're describing here? So I want to take, open up your Bible to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12. Right. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12. Zephaniah. Here it is. Zephaniah verse 3. Chapter 3. Yeah. Okay, I'm there. Verse 12. All right, it says, But I will leave within you the meek and humble, the remnant of Israel, will trust in the name of the Lord. Continue. They will do no wrong. They will tell. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying now. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will right. eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing aloud, Sing, O daughter of daughter Zion. <laughs> right. So they're hello. They're right there. They're all the prophets are talking about the same thing. That's right. They're talking about the end of days. They're not talking about all the Jews. They're not talking about Bernie Madoff. They're talking about the faithful remnant of the children of Israel. There'll be no, they will commit no violence. And there'll be no deceit found in their mouths. And God will protect them. And they'll be able to finally rest without fear of their enemies. Right there in your Bible. Wow. I was right. The context is there. Right. Now, to make Christianity work, you have to take it out of context. Right. That, that's, that correct. Not, that's not a clear word. That's not a clear word or, or a message. Like Deuteronomy is a law code that was given by God, right? I just want to, this is, I think this is a good thing to end on because you have a choice to make now, Christians. Because I had to make this choice too. Deuteronomy is a law code given by God. The, the Ten Commandments are literally etched by the hand of God and given to Moses. So you have a choice. You have. Do you take a Greek manuscript that was written by some 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 Hellenized Jews living in Syria and Egypt, or do you or some guy named Peter who had a dream that said you can eat whatever you want, or do you listen to that, or do you listen to the actual words that came from God Himself? That's your right. choice. You have to make that choice. Right. And when Christian pastors read specific texts in the high lit liturgical um, form a presentation when they read from the pulpit, they're reading these texts completely out of context and robbing you of a knowledge of the original text. I mean, the reason why Christians think Jews are crazy and blind is because they're not reading the whole book of Isaiah. They're reading highly selected passages that are that are fed to them by their pastors, by their priests, and reading nothing else. And the result, they're logically coming to the conclusion of Jesus the Messiah. Jewish people, in complete contrast, are reading the whole book of Isaiah from chapter 1 to chapter 66. And as a result of that, they're, well, they're, there's no relationship between, between the Messiah described in the books of the prophets and the Jesus of Christianity and ultimately reject it completely. That's the deal. I write about Isaiah 53 extensively in both volume one and volume two of Let's Get Biblical. So, you know, the, I covered it. But this is, this is why I care about Christians, because I realize what's been done to them. I didn't know this as a kid. When I was growing up, I just thought Christians were insane for believing me. Like, why would you believe this? And I realized what happened is they're not reading the surrounding chapters. They're not then they they're not reading Isaiah 51 52 54 55 
chapter 60, which you read, they're reading Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, 53. Those they know by heart, and the rest of it they got to look up. Why? That's the problem. And and it, it, and the fact that they have to change the ten, the church has to change the Ten Commandments and tweak it. That's like you're. What are you? What What are we doing here? Like what? That is madness. Right. And then so so you have this this Torah that everyone agrees on is given by God. Everyone who believes in God, whether you're whatever whatever you we come from. So okay. So if this is the word of God, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be the it's supposed to tell you about the Messiah, it's supposed to tell you how to live. Why doesn't it just say, by the way, I have a son and I'm going to send him towards you when you guys need him. By the, what, just one time. One time. It doesn't do that. So, right. I don't know. Hey, hey, that, that's what most people, what, what Christians don't get. And the reason is that there's nothing remotely resembling John 3, 16 in the Hebrew Bible. Nothing. If there would be, all us Jews would be in church right now. I mean, in a second, exactly what you said. If we would have uh, John 17, 3, oh, this is eternally life. They may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. And said, if we would find that something remotely resembling that in the book of Joshua, we'd all make a beeline. I'd be in the church of the Holy Sepulchre in about 20 minutes because I can run there. Okay. I mean, we we don't we all be in church. We're not. If it said in Tanakh that there is one God and three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we'd all make a beeline for the next closest church and get baptized. We're not idiots. There's nothing res remotely resembling these ideas in the Hebrew Bible. On the contrary, the prophets of Israel opposed all these ideas of vic vicarious atonement that the innocent should die as a result of the of uh, the behavior of the wicked. Ezekiel 18 says. That will never happen. And the only way for someone to be forgiven is that they turn from their sinful ways, that they may, may live and not die. And I want you to repent. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7, it's all over the Hebrew Bible. Wow, this has been another epic discussion. And uh, there will be more to come. I look forward to it. And you have all just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. I beg you, if you're a Christian especially, open up two browsers. In On one browser, look up Psalm 40, verse 6 and 7. That would be in a Christian Bible. In the other browser, open up Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. Please look at them side by side or use two physical Bibles. Look at Psalm 40, verse 6 and 7. Read it. Psalms 40. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Stop. Not now, now, now. And if you have a any kind of reference by I'll tell you this verse is quoted in Hebrews 10 verse 5. So what now let's move to Hebrews 10 verse 5 which is putatively quoting Psalm 40. Now let's read so you just know like this is not like I'm not this is not slide in. Go to Psalm go Therefore, to Psalm Christ came into the world he said sacrifice and offering did not desire but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. A body you had prepared for me? 
What? How do you, you have for me? How do you blow my what? mind every time I get on what this? What the heck did you just do? I mean, what is going on? Right, right, right. This what is my friend. This is not a setup. Osnayim Karisali, my ear, ear. Osnayim, ears. That's a real easy word. My ears you have open. So ears you have open is removed and the body you prepared for me replaced. Wow. No, how, how, like there should be a class action lawsuit against the church. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm with the rabbi today and um, before we jump into anything, I just want to, I just want to show you guys a clip real quick of a highlight of the rabbi that I think is just a must watch. And I just want to show you a quick little highlight. So here it is. You have a question. This gentleman, I promise, was next. I will start with Daniel. Yeah. Is Daniel the truth? Or will you also tell me that Daniel at the end was miscalculating on his numbers? Oh, no, no, Daniel's the word of God, of course. Oh, Daniel is the word of God, so Daniel in chapter 9 gives us exactly the year when Mashiach is going to come. Tell and us. he tells us that after he came, the temple will... What is this calculation? Please share it with us. The calculation is in the scripture. So tell it to me, please, I'm very curious. Oh, you know the calculation. So if I know it, why am I not a Christian? It's very interesting that... I hear all the times, oh, Daniel did miscalculate. So, I'm not, res just like you're not responsible for Roman Catholics, don't make me responsible for everybody else, okay? All right, so now, okay. please tell me the calculation of Daniel chapter 9. We have a clear calculation. Everybody can read it out. No, no, you're not, you're not being honest now. If you have such a fantastic calculation, yeah. don't tell me I know it. Actually, no. If, if I, I do, know that, no, 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 don't, don't. What is that calculation? I'm listening. Okay. Give it to me. Okay. What is it? But he told us uh, this weeks that will pass and will pass till Mashiach will come. Brings us to the year 32. Really? How does that? Please tell me the math. I'm very interested. Well, we have to get a board. Why at the board? Just give it. Believe me, I'm very familiar with the text. If you You're saying that in this chapter contains the proof of exactly the day of his crucifixion. So I said to you, it's a 490 year prophecy, which ends at culminates at 32, as you say. Grant it all. So I ask you a fair question. When do you start counting and how do you know you start counting that way? If you can't answer that question, then I would just say to you, then we'll move on to the next topic. But I, I would say to you tonight, when you go to sleep, you would say, how is it possible, really, that a text that I think is so important that I just didn't even know when to start counting? I don't, God forbid, mean to anything. That's one. It's, I want to say, I, I think it's a fair criticism. I think, to be honest, you should say, like, I accept what you said. Please accept what I said. And by the way, to get the full video of that, I put a link in the description so you can watch the whole thing. I just wanted to show you just a couple, couple key parts that I thought was interesting. But it's these simple, simple questions that you would think someone would have an answer for if you have the truth. And I noticed that what really stands out to me in that conversation is how willing you were to face these pushbacks because you know you've you've been over this a million times you know the text inside out hebrew greek english whatever you know what it says you know all the versions the king james the new internationals you know what they all say you know what you, you understand these this text that's why i like love having you on because like there's scholarly research there's but there's like uh, experience and that's what you have your it's all experience pure experience like you're just in it you just this is your life yeah i i feel sorry you know i i've come to like christians i used to not like them as a kid but i i came to meet really nice christians in my 20s and and i feel very sorry for them because i was given a very rich education uh, they can't read their bible in its original language the Christian translators just play with the text. They engage in the kind of, uh, it's not just translators. They learned this from the New Testament writers. They altered the text and they blame it on some sort of phantom Septuagint. And, and they all believe that, that sure, the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew and the Holy Spirit was l using, employing a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And here you have very smart Christians who 
don't ask the question, why would the Holy Spirit need a translation of the Hebrew Bible? They're like, God forget the Hebrew language? It's a holy language. Like, why? And and Christians are very vulnerable there. So when I meet people like that, um, I I really care about them. They're they're not bad faith actors. I feel sorry for them. And if I had that, if I was ex- raised in that world, and every night my mom put me to bed saying Jesus loves you, I don't know what I'd do. And I had no access to the Hebrew. I think Jews are crazy. So this is just I just a point. Like we started, we we live in a crazy world where. Christians look at Jews, nice people, and go, here are the Jews. They're pretty bright people. They win a lot of Nobel Prizes. They delivered my babies. They keep me out of jail and do my taxes. Yet how could a people who have such a reputation of being so smart be so dumb, and how could they not see the obvious that Jesus is the Messiah? This is really going on. I'm talking about the nice people. And Jews who have been exposed to Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, in its original language, in some point— as you're a kid growing up in a Christian country, begin to ask and find out what Christians believe and go, how could you possibly believe this? So we actually have two worlds staring at each other, bewildered, like, why would you believe this? You're like, so smart. You, and that's what's really going on. But no, you have to go back to the original Hebrew. You have to read in text in context or else you're lost. You don't have a chance. And, and, and to, to add to what you just said, when you read the old, when the, the, the Tanakh, almost the Old Testament, I'm getting used to saying the word Tanakh from now on. That's what it is. It's the Tanakh. Right. When you read the Tanakh from Genesis to the end of the prophets through the wisdom books, and you get the full context of what it's trying to say, there's a recurring theme, and that is the law is the most important thing. It's not the Messiah. Now, don't get me wrong. There's, there's, there's the Messiah is important, but the law is really like the Psalms are all about the law, right? The longest chapter in the Hebrew Bible is Psalm 119. The author of Psalm 119 was so committed to making sure that you can memorize it that he used a device, an acrostic, in the order of the alphabet so you can memorize it easily. This is the biggest 176 passages. The whole book, that whole section, is devoted to telling you how much I love the Torah, how much I love the Torah, and the salvation is far from the wicked because they don't know my Torah. But this is not the kind of thing that, Neil, you would have heard in church when you were being preached to. Instead, you hear Paul's version that the law is a work, it's a burdensome, it is what pushes you into hellfire. It, it, it's not even the uh, substance. It's, it, you're right. it's, it's there to show you that you're a sinner. It's a mirror to show you that your face is dirty, and then you use the Holy Spirit and wash your face. It is a taskmaster, Galatians. Um, and I understand why Christians have that view, because they're reading the Hebrew Bible through the filter of Galatians and Romans. So of course they're going to draw that conclusion. Well, yeah. and so and so there's little clues that get thrown at you throughout the Old, throughout the old Testament, the Tanakh. And, for example, the, the, the worst villain in the book of Daniel is Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, he, th- so what he does is he tries to take over the temple and change all the laws and put a gymnasium in there and, and Hellenize Jerusalem. And so now we, let's go back, go to the first century, right? You, now we have uh, a city that's called Antioch named after this guy. Hmm. And out of this city is where you get all these gospels that are in Greek and they're epistles that are telling you to ignore the law. Everything's fine. And the church fathers, the bishops of Antioch, who gave us wonderful words like Catholic and pushed hard <laughs> and and were devoted to changing the Sabbath to Sunday. Right, and that's another one. It's like the traditions and even the traditions yeah. get flipped on their head. And so the reason why I'm bringing all this up is to sort of set the stage for why what I want to talk about. So, for example... There's some things that are central to Judaism that are just if someone comes along and says we need to change it, we red flags should go up. And so some of these things I want to ask you about is like, 
how how do we atone for sins? What is Yom okay. Kippur? What is Passover? And then right. I want to get into the book of Hebrews a little bit and see what sure. you get your opinion. But yeah, whatever, wherever you want to take it as far as those three things, wherever you want yeah. to go first. If you were God and you wanted to convey to mankind the fundamental principles how we should behave, after all, there are so many religions that are all vying for our soul, and you transmitted, you conveyed over a sacred text to your prophets, the greatest people that ever lived, what device, Neil, if you were God, would you insert in the text to ensure that no one later can say it has been done away with, it has been abrogated? Well, you would put in the text a warning. <laughs> it's really very straightforward. And the warning would go something like this. If anybody comes later who says, I'm a prophet, right? And then he says, you don't have to keep these commandments any longer. If he teaches you to follow gods that your fathers did not know. Literally says, your fathers did not know. I'm speaking of Deuteronomy 13, right? Do not listen to that prophet or dream of dreams. I didn't send them, even if he's doing miracles. So whoever wrote the book, and I know we have a, a really wide audience, so whoever wrote it was really committed to this point. If anyone comes along and changes the message, even though they can do miracles or can seem to be able to foretell the future, um, if their message deviates at all from this text, put him to death, he is a false prophet, and I allow false prophets to do miracles only to test you to see if you love me. And that's exactly the device that we find in the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, don't add to it, don't take away. So in the original message, you know, if, if the United States wanted to find out about Iran's nuclear program, which poses an existential threat to the West. And a spy got in and knew exactly how to attack that target when the shields are down. And the, your spy who's embedded in Iran is sending a message back to Washington saying, this is the time, this is the date, this is the moment. And one other point, if anybody else claims to be a spy or claims that I changed my mind or I have a different view, don't listen to him. He's a double agent. So that's what's happening here. The text is saying no one can change it. And this is how the book of Hebrews begins. You alluded to Hebrews a moment ago, actually twice, because you called the Jewish Bible an Old Testament and then you said you prefer calling it Tanakh. That is so pregnant with meaning. Because that term Old Testament really comes from Hebrews chapter 8. That idea that whatever has become old, it, or that covenant that is old, it becomes obsolete. And whatever is obsolete will disappear. That's the explosion in the book of Hebrews. The entire book of Hebrews is committed to one goal, and that is to defeat Judaism. In fact, that's how Hebrews chapter 1 begins. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in a, through so many different prophets. Verse 2, but these last days that we're in now, he has spoken to us by who? By the Son, capital S, who he appointed to be heir of all things, through whom he created all the world. So what Hebrews is setting out to do is to show the superiority of Christianity over Judaism, and Judaism is old and it, it will decay. And the author of the book of Hebrews alters the Jewish scriptures violently in Hebrews chapter 8 in order to convey that the old covenant is dead and there is a new covenant. And you have heard it so many times that we're in the new covenant, we're not in the old covenant. And what effect do you think that has on Christians who hear that? It's devastating. Yeah, and so you get this sort of theology in Hebrew that Jesus is the high priest, but he's also higher than Moses. He's also higher than the angels. Hebrews 3, right. right, he's, right that's the get-go. He's above, he's above everyone. 
go down the list. He's above the angels, which is very striking, incidentally, because Christians have a thing for saying, oh, the angel of the Lord, that's really Jesus. You know, in the Hebrew Bible, it's a very striking thing. Christians have a big problem. They go to church. <laughs> Why is this a big problem? Because from the time you go into church, I don't care what your denomination is, from the time you walk in Sunday morning until the time you leave, you have heard the word Jesus, the name Jesus, 350 times. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the striking thing to every Christian is, that's strange because in the Hebrew Bible, we don't, where's Jesus? Like it's really important in the Christian Bible. So what Christians have to do is create these theophanies where Jesus is somehow, he's our high priest, he's everything. And, and when you see the angel of the Lord in Exodus, that's really Jesus. When Joshua encounters an angel of the Lord, that's really Jesus. Even though, despite the fact that Hebrews begins by showing that Jesus is above the angels, and after all, it doesn't say that angels could sit at my right side, so bingo. That's how Hebrews begins. Jesus our high priest. It's a theological nightmare that the author is going to deal with. He's above Moses. Moses, after all, was just a servant. Jesus is the son. He's above Joshua. And then he's going to seek to explain how he is Malkisedic or is a priest in the order of Malkisedic. An explosion. Judaism comes down and uh, Christ is elevated. Nick. And what are they trying to do with this? What, what, what right. are they saying with this? Because if I'm not mistaken, Melchizedek is a character in, in, in Genesis who meets with uh, Abraham and they make a deal about the land and that's it. Right. So Melchizedek appears in Genesis chapter 14. Melchizedek is not a personal name. It's not Henry or Harry. Melchizedek is a royal name. Melech Tzedek, which means a righteous king. Okay. Our context, Lot, Abraham's nephew kidnapped. Abraham goes to war against four kingdoms, defeats them, rescues his nephew, and refuses to take booty for himself. Abraham repeatedly is presented to us in the book of Genesis as someone who is not there for himself, who is willing to marry a barren woman named Sarai. He was a person who was, was totally devoted to God, and God said, in that case, you're the kind of man I can work with. I'm going to make you a great name. Malki Tzedek in Jewish tradition is Shem, the son of Noah. Now you're going, well, how is that possible? Shem like lived in a different era. Well, as it turns out, if you run the numbers, Shem, the son of Noah, lived so long that Jacob, you need to listen very carefully, Jacob was 59 years old when when Shem passed away. So that means Abraham and Shem, exactly, were contemporaries. No one runs a number. So if Abraham was really alone in the world, as we're told in Isaiah, what other righteous person would be alive at the time? The whole world was pagan. Abraham finds a relationship with God and has a, a unique character that's unparalleled. Well, it would be Shem. Now, Malki Tzedek is present us out of nowhere. Now, Hebrews makes a point out of this, that well, you know, Malki Tzedek, you see that he has no father, he has no mother, because there's no genealogical record for this Malki Tzedek, so he's mysterious. He's not mysterious because Malki Tzedek is not his real name, it's his royal name. And kings are ge the genealogy of the king, for example, of Avimelech, that's Genesis chapter 20. Abimelech, however, the non-Jews pronounce it. Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 12. Well, the, the guy's name really wasn't Pharaoh. The guy's name really wasn't Cyrus. And we're not told Cyrus's parents' name. Well, does that mean Cyrus had no mother or no father? So what, what the author of Hebrews is doing is, because the device in Tanakh is that when you have uh, kings or queens who they have a royal name. We don't go the son of this, the son of that, because this is just a royal name. The key is that Malki Tzedek blesses Abraham. He was the priest of the Most High. You have to be very careful with that word, a Kohen, a priest, it means someone who is has leadership. In fact, the word comes from lechahen, which means to hold office. You could even have priests of Baal. You can have priests of idols. So this word is very elastic, and this is going to be exploited by the church. Because today we think of a priest, they think of me. 
I'm a descendant of Aaron, right? So people think a priest must be the, a priest from Aaron, but actually in Tanakh, a priest could be a, certainly a descendant of Aaron, but it also could be Malki Tzedek. It can also be a priest of Baal. It just means, to, in fact, in fact, I'll drive your viewers crazy. In fact, your viewers are not going to believe me. You're not going to believe me, and you're going to look this up. And I invite you to do that. In 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 18, we are told that King David's children were priests. I'm not kidding. But they're not priests in the sense that they were sons of Aaron. And the translators all almost all render it because it's very confusing and they need to distinguish this. They need to back up Hebrews so they go, they held office or whatever, whatever the translators use. But but it really says his sons were kaihanim, were priests. What does that mean? King David's sons can't be priests in the sense of Aaron, the sons of Aaron. Why? Because you know what, so for you, the viewer who's thoroughly confused, you got to walk this back. You know what tribe you're from through your father. How do you know that? It says it. Numbers chapter 1, verse 2. It's according to your father's self. Only a father could convey tribal identity, not the mother. The mother conveys a Jewish identity, but not tribe identity. And that's repeated over and over and over again. And it's all over the place. It's only the male that has. Now, if you want to do what Hebrews sets out to do, and that is to say that Jesus is everything, and he's better than everyone. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. Better than Moses. Better than Joshua. It's He's above it all. He's And he's our high priest. That already begins right. So you've got to come up with a technique because Hebrews was was not an idiot. The, in fact, the author of Hebrews, we have no idea who wrote it, but it's a very well-written book, and you, the viewer, keep this in mind. It's vital to know that the book of Hebrews was written while the second temple was standing. It is not like the Gospels that were written after the destruction of the second temple. Hebrews is usually dated to about 64 and the reason why this is remarkably important is it's before the war with Rome. The temple was not only standing, but it was full operation, and it was fully completed, and it was operating at full glory. So the author of the book of Hebrews sees temple worship and ritual as full-blown competition to the Christian movement. This is, yeah. If we, if we, were, we were to act like detectives right now, would you think this is coming out of Syria or Egypt? This is not coming out of Jerusalem, I don't think. No. Or, unless you think that. No, no, I don't. I think this is probably coming out. Of, it's 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 just so hard to know. It, it would reminds be... me of Philo, like a Greekified, Hellenized type of Alexandrian. Maybe the person's half Jewish on his mom's side or something. And he knows a little bit about the Tanakh, but he loves Plato. He loves in the Empire. He loves you know, like that's what it feels like when you're reading Hebrews. It feels like someone yeah, like. But he lied so much, so. Um, even though I'm, I mean, um, Philo was is a Hellenizer, but he did not uh, tamper with the text, lie about text. We're talking about complete corruptions, right? He was a literalist as well. Hebrews seeks to spiritualize everything, and spiritualizing things is the best thing you can do if you are running a false religion, because it becomes un unfalsifiable. It becomes untestable. Then, oh, I know what it says, but what it really means is this much higher thing. And the Jews are just blind about that. They are, there's a veil over their eyes. Then how could you discount any religion that Roman Catholicism could be true? But uh, what, where is the Pope? You have to read Matthew 16 with special glasses. Well, then any, what, what's falsifiable? I mean, why reject the claims of the the, the Church of the Latter-day Saints. It's not consistent with the New Testament. you got to read it deeper. Well, The reason why I can conclude that it's not written in Jerusalem, it's a letter to the Hebrews. So it's someone from outside. Like, why would, they, why would somebody who's a Hebrew be writing to the Hebrews? Right. So it's somebody from the outside. Right. The relationship between Damascus and Jerusalem was very strong. It means it's 
was relatively close, right? And right, it's 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 these questions are very hard to answer. What can be said is with certainty is that it's Pauline. That means Hebrews is Paul amped up. Paul would give him an A plus. The language, the Greek is exquisite. It's also very well thought out. You know the nature of the of Paul's letters. That's very striking is the almost the violence how Paul just explodes in rage, and is angry and just explodes into another topic. Uh, the book of Hebrews is not written that way at all. Hebrews is very well lined up. He knows exactly where he needs to go. He needs to show that the new covenant is necessary and what purpose is there to an old covenant. And the old covenant is done away with. It's ended. Everything of the law is really just a shadow, and it's all pointing to Christ. It's very consistent. That's, that's Hebrews 8, 5, 10, 1, and, of course, very consistent with Paul's view uh, in, iterated in Colossians uh, 2, 16, 17. It's all over the place, yeah. So this leads into the most perfect segue of what I wanted to get into, and in that because he sort of ends up with talking about how even though Jesus is all, all these things, he's the high priest, he's the king, he's the an, higher than the angels, he's all these things, but he's also the sacrifice. He's also the atonement for sins. Right. So I want to get into this sort of, how does, what does like the Leviticus, for example, say on what is this, what is the prescribed way to atone for sins and why, why, why would someone write in Hebrews that Jesus can atone for your sins? How is this even possible? It's it's really um, very striking. Most Christians genuinely believe that during the time of the temple, if you sinned, the prescription, the way out of it, the way God forgave you was you needed the blood, and through the blood of a, of an animal, that's how you receive your atonement. I'm not making that up. Hebrews chapter nine verse twenty two, and this is what Christians believe. They genuinely believe that. As it turns out, the sin offering. There is such an offering, Leviticus chapter 4, was prescribed for sins that are committed unintentionally. If you sin by accident, although you carelessly, you bring a sin offering. But if you sinned intentionally, unless it was a sin against the sanctuary itself, in which case you had to then bring a sacrifice in the state of purity, hence Yom Kippur, I know that's like a big bomb, but I'm just going to blow that away for a moment. The way you received an atonement in the Hebrew Bible was to confess your sins, to turn back to God. God will hear you in heaven and forgive you for all your transgressions. Look at the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is quoted extensively in the Christian Bible, Matthew chapter 12. But nowhere does it mention the whole point of the book of Jonah, and that is here is a people that were destined to be destroyed in 40 days. They repented. God forgave them. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Somehow that passage, the whole point of the book, somehow eluded uh, the writers of the New Testament. And Jesus will just use the book of Jonah as a device, say, how many Jonah was in the belly of the well for this many days. I'm greater than Jonah. The people of Nineveh therefore condemn you, Matthew 12, 41. Every way possible but the point of the book of Jonah. Uh, and charity. We're told in the Bible as an example in Daniel chapter 4, verse 24 in the Jewish Bible, 27 in the Christian Bible. Nebuchadnezzar had a very troubling dream that basically portents his doom. And Nebuchadnezzar turns to Daniel and says, how am I going to get out of this? And then he says, Here, here's the deal. If you, if you want to turn this around, you give charity, feed the hungry, give support those who don't have, and God will forgive you. No blood, no sacrifice, no temple, no Christ, no Jesus, no Calvary, no Golgotha, no lamb, none of that. And some of our Christians miss that. And it helps the world, too. It does. It, 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 you know, tzedakah, the idea in Judaism of charity, the reason it could atone for sin, why it's so striking, is that in Jewish thinking, God gave you an extra 10% in your income, and it's on loan. And you are then to act as, a, as an agent for God and give that money to those who are naked, those who are hungry, those who are orphans, those who are widow. And therefore, it's called tzedakah, 
which means justice or righteousness, because what you're doing is you're not really giving something away that belongs to you. It was just on loan for you to then use. And by not giving tzedakah, you're stealing from God, and as you said, stealing from the world. And that is the path, the method. That's why uh, Proverbs tells us that, that charity saves a person from death. So those are the three. The unintentional sin is the weakest form of atonement. But again, Hebrews is going to say that Jesus is our high priest. I want to just, one point, if I don't mention this, people will lose their minds. Their brains will fly out the window. So it is impossible to be both a high priest and to be a Messiah. Why? Because in order to be the Messiah, you have to come from the house of David, not only the tribe of Judah, but in a patrilineal descent, you have to be a direct descendant of King David, and actually not only David, but also Solomon. Okay? Well, in order to be a priest, I am, you know, and it goes back through my father's father's father, going back all the way. In order for that to be, I have to be, my patrilineal line has to go all the way back to Aaron. The studies have been done at the University of Arizona where they actually studied the Y chromosome of Jewish priests, and we have the same marker on it. The point is you can't have two different daddies. The point is you can't possibly be from two different tribes, let alone, and I'm not going to do this now unless you push me to, let alone the problem when you claim that Jesus was born of a virgin, which the book of Hebrews doesn't know anything about. If you claim that Jesus was born to a virgin, then he doesn't even have a human Jewish father, which was to trace himself back to King David, and Joseph's genealogy is completely irrelevant, but I don't want to go further away. So what Hebrews has to come up with is a device and if you don't know your stuff, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And the device is that there's another kind of priesthood, and that's the priesthood of Malchizedek. Malchizedek blesses Abraham, and he informs him he, and says, Blessed be Abraham um, by the God of the Most High, that what? That he has delivered your enemies to you. This is very important. The priesthood of Malchizedek, the message of Malchizedek is, that you will defeat your enemies, your earthly enemies. Moreover, if you, if, you don't, if you think that's just a coincidence, I encourage you, especially if you're a Christian, to go to Psalm 110, one of the most cited verses, the Lord said to my Lord, right, who is, okay, very famous. Psalm 110, where we have the quote of the priesthood of Malchizedek, in Psalm 110, verse 4 and 5, that the Lord will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Malchizedek. God is telling us to King David, and the Lord is your right hand. He will shatter the kings on the day of his wrath. So the blessing of Malchizedek is not some spiritual thing out there. It's that God will deliver, make your enemies your footstool. And if this is the blessing of Malchizedek, this is just another one of hundreds of proofs that Jesus can't possibly be the Messiah because he didn't crush the Romans. The Romans crushed him if, in fact, he was crucified. Because everything Jesus did was exactly the opposite of what the Messiah was. So he's supposed to bring peace on earth. Not say what Jesus said, verily I say, I didn't come to bring peace but the sword, right? Matthew 10. He's supposed to bring a building of a temple, not the destruction of a temple. In the exiles, not the exile. Not, all of these things, the worldwide knowledge of God, not minimalizing it, that people would keep the commandments and keep the law. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24. Avdi David, it's the antithesis of the Messiah. Wow, that means that's such a good point. It's all inverted. It's all the opposite. And so, it, yeah. But it, but one of the things I noticed, and and I want, I want real, real quick before I want, to, I want to get back to Melchizedek in a second. But real quick, I want to take a quick detour because one of the things I noticed, and you mentioned that the author of Hebrews is brilliant, and I agree. I'm glad that we both see it that way because there's no doubt this person knew what he was talking about. Very manipulative. In fact, in a verse in um, chapter 12, he says that. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to blood of sprinkling, speaking better things than that of Abel. Now, that is a shocking verse because blood, Abel's blood screamed out to God, and he, mm -hmm. his offering was good, and Satan Cain's offering was bad. So what he's doing is he's saying Jesus is the good offering, and his blood is the sprinkling that's the, of the lamb and he's the so he's making jesus like an able figure but also saying that he's also able's offering too 
So it's a really, right. it's a really brilliant connection, but it's like, but it, but it doesn't actually line up with what the law tells us. No, it's completely inconsistent with that. I'll, I'll sure I'll surprise the viewers, those of you who, who are pregnant or your mother was ever pregnant, you may want to take a deep breath here. In this is where it all turns on on Hebrews chapter eight. So we talked about that. You know, now that there's a new covenant, there's no need. The other covenant has been abolished. That's how it ends. He actually quotes, we're told, Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31 tells us that days are coming, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah, not like the old covenant that I made with you when I took you by the hand out of Egypt. For that covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them. The Anoichi Baaltibum is Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. 32 in the Christian Bible, 31 in the Jewish Bible. The verses are cut differently, okay? Now, Hebrews actually quotes this verse. Now, what the text is simply saying is that God, covenant doesn't mean a new Torah, a new law. People think that covenant, a new covenant, or which is the same word as a testament, means like a new law. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that although when I took you out of Egypt, I was ready to go, but you, the children of Israel, broke that covenant— Although I was a husband to you, I was your lover, right? And then, okay, Hebrews, look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9. It says, because they did not continue in my covenant, although I disregarded them, says the Lord. Literally changes the words. The Hebrew text says, although I was a husband to them, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 32, that means I was their lover, Baalti is a term used in Jeremiah earlier. I was their husband, and the book, of the author of Hebrews, whoever he was, it's like you have Microsoft Word, you select in the words, although I was a husband, Hebrew Vanuchi Baalti, delete it, and then you put in the words, and I rejected them, or I disregarded them, and suddenly you have a brand new message. How do you change the Bible? How do you alter? It's, the, it's completely opposite. And what is the new covenant? Continuing on in Jeremiah 31, that Ultimately, I'm going to, that it's going to be in a time when no one's going to have to teach his neighbor about God, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. You will be restored to the land. And if the, if the sun, look up at the sky, and, and if you see a sun, you see the moon and the stars at night, if these laws shall pass away, so will the, the, so will the seed of Jacob, so will the house of Jacob be taken away. The point is that when you are returned, the Jews are restored back to the land of Israel, it'll never be undone. Jeremiah tells us when will this take place. If you don't know this, you're gone. Jeremiah says that this will occur during a time when no one is going to have to teach his neighbor his brother about God. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. That didn't happen during the first century. Jeremiah 31 is transparently a future prophecy of the messianic age when the Jews will return to the land of Israel and the knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9. Along comes the book of Hebrew, the author of Hebrews, and very deliberately, this is not an accident, deliberately changed the text, puts in, rejected them, and bingo, the Old Covenant is done away with. Of course Christians use the word Old Testament. Of course they have no incentive to read the book of Numbers. Of course they're done with the law. Yeah, and then he says in chapter 13, we have an altar of which those serving at the tabernacle have no authority to eat. Right. He's talking to the real high priest. Now, right. and, now, is, would this be the Sadducees that he's talking about, or Levites? What's who is he? Who is he trying to replace here? And and, to, and then, as far as the order of Melchizedek, is that word Melchizedek lined up with Sadducees, or is that something I've heard that before? I don't know what you think about that. Uh, so Sadducees is not the real name. Uh, the real name is Sadukim, and the name Sadukim. I don't know how that became Sadducees any more than I know how Jacob became James. So, Tzedukim is named after a priest. So, and Tzadok, I mean, it's just, there are many priests that have that name. 
So Hebrews 13 is the wrap-up. Hebrews 13 is saying we're going outside the camp, that Jesus is a, his priesthood is supersedes the priesthood that's going on in Jerusalem. That's why you point, Neil, about, you know, where is Hebrews written? Antioch, very possibly. But the key is he's saying look in a different direction, look to Christ, and leave the camp. That's Hebrews 13. Let me read the quote so they know what we're talking about. So it says, right after what I just said about about the um, the altar, which the people serving at the tabernacle have no authority, talking about the priesthood in Jerusalem. Then he says, for of the animals whose blood is brought by the high priest into the holy into the holies concerning sins, of these the bodies are burned outside the camp. Right. Therefore, that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Jesus also suffered outside the gate. And then verse thirteen. And then okay. So That's now let us go. Oh, you're right. You're right. This is more important. This is now, the supersessionism of Hebrews. Yeah. So now let us go forth to him outside the camp, Beautiful. bearing his reproach. For right. we do not have a continuing city, but we seek the city coming. This is full supersessionism. If, 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 if you don't know that about Hebrews, then you can't even approach the book. The whole point of the book of Hebrews is that Christianity, although he doesn't use the term Christianity, in fact, no one does in the New Testament, but Christianity completely supersedes Judaism. It's a full frontal attack on, and by the way, this is not unique to Hebrews. This kind of idea is found throughout the New Testament, but Hebrews brings us out and in stages very clearly, better than anyone else does. I mean, you you could find, I mean, look, let, let me just, I want to like just, you can, we'll sniff this out. You can even go to the prologue of John that's written 40 years later. Um, uh, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. I mean, what what does that say to you? The law came through Moses. Well, which do you want? So Moses gave us the, gave us the law, and Jesus Christ is grace and truth. Um, I mean, which which do you want? So you see how one is juxtaposing against the other. Jesus is the fulfillment. If you would have uh, believed in Moses, you would have believed in me, for he wrote about me. So it's all that same theme. He's wrote about me, but now I am superseding all of it. I'm superseding certainly the angels, certainly Moses, Joshua, um, and the entire priesthood. Jesus everything. And he's beyond. And it's now time to leave the camp, just like the sacrifices, like the hide was taken outside of the camp. Bingo. Leave Judaism. That's what it is. It's complete supersessionism. And, and so it's what's what I what I find interesting about this is basically they're trying to make him into you know the sin offering, but also it's outside the camp. So in Leviticus 16, when where where you have these two goats, one of them is the sin offering inside the city, the other one is let go outside the city. That's the the scapegoat. So I wonder if that's like a, on purpose. Is it like a? It almost seems like it's like a this Jesus is almost the scapegoat, but like you and, and they like that or something. The only problem is it 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 cra it crashes. The polemic doesn't map on because the scapegoat is not sacrificed. The blood is not shed of the scapegoat. He gets to escape into the wilderness. Hebrews is is just misquoting texts all over. They have nothing to do. I mean, it's every passage in Hebrews is taken completely out of context. Hebrew is going to continue to not only take passages out of context, um, change passages. You know, King David, just as an example, this is like King David sinned in his life and he God forgave him when he confessed it. In Second Samuel chapter twelve, verse thirteen, when Nathan confronted him using a a juridical parable of a rich man and a poor man, right? Um so he, David said, I have sinned before the Lord, Khatasi Lashem. And Nathan replied, The Lord has already forgiven you. So God forgave King David for doing things that I don't think you or I have done. So King David speaks about this constantly, that God doesn't want sacrifices. He doesn't want your burnt offering. He doesn't want any of that. Sacrifice, he, burnt offering, sacrifice and burnt offering he did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Um, 
So King David is saying, you open my ears to hear you, okay? And he doesn't want the sacrificial system. That's nowhere, that's not very important. This theme of King David is all over Tanakh because people love ritual. I see a lot of celebrities have red strings on their wrists, wrappers and so on. They kind of think these rituals will save them. They're like good luck charms. So King David is saying what everyone's saying, don't get caught up in the blood. The book of Hebrews hates that. And it changes it. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, Hebrews, we are told, quotes um, Psalm 40, verse 6 and 7, or 5 and 6 in the Hebrew Bible. And Hebrews changes, says, sacrifice offerings you did not desire, and I'm not kidding, look it up for yourself, but a body you have prepared for me. Burnt offerings, sin offerings you have not required. What? It means, I, I beg you, if you're a Christian, especially, Open up two browsers. In On one browser, look up Psalm 40, verse 6 and 7. That would be in a Christian Bible. In the other browser, open up Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. Please look at them side by side or use two physical Bibles. Look at Psalm 40, verse 6 and 7. Read it. Psalms 40. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Stop. Now, 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 and if you have a any kind of reference, by I'll tell you this verse is quoted in Hebrews ten verse five. So what? Now let's move to Hebrews ten verse five, which is putatively quoting Psalm forty. Now let's read. So you just know, like this is not like I'm not. This is not slide hand. Go to Psalm. Go Therefore, to Psalm. When Christ came into the world. He said, "Sacrifice and offering did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings. You were not pleased." A body you have prepared for me? What? A body you have prepared for me? How do you blow my what? mind every time I get on what this? What the heck did you just do? I mean, what is going on? Right, right, right. This what is my friend. This is not a setup. Osnayim Karisali, my ear, ear. Osnayim, ears. That's a real easy word. My ears you have opened. So ears you have opened is removed, and the body you prepared for me replaced. Wow. No, how, how, like. This should be a class action lawsuit against the church. Like, mean, what, what did you do? Like, how did you do that? And you Christians think Jews are crazy. And not all of you. I know some of you like us. But I'm saying, could you imagine? Like, how do you do that? Like, it says my ears. It's very simple. Like, God opened up King David's ears because King David received a juridical parable from from the prophet Nathan, King David's ears was open and he repents, okay? So my ears you open, okay? Real simple. Hebrews needs to replace all this. This is not slight here. Hebrews needs to replace this. So he literally takes out the words, my ears you have opened. It's really Hebrew, easy Hebrew words. Osnayim karisoli. Osnayim means ears. You have opened. He takes that out, deletes it, and in its stead puts in a body. And what is that body? That's Christ. How do you do that? Like, this stuff gets you in jail. Try doing that on your taxes. Try doing that in a contract. You're, you're in prison. You go to jail for stuff like that. You get disbarred. I mean, there are loads of people sitting in prison for doing this with contracts. And this is like, we're, we're supposed to believe this is the Word of God. So, so uh, let me just give the background. What, what's ha what's happening in Hebrews is very important. We don't take it out of account. Hebrews is really saying that the entire sacrificial system, the animal sacrificial system, really never worked. That's the point. Because someone can ask the question. We're going to go a little deep here. I want you to stay tight with me. Why do you need Jesus in Hebrews' view, in, in Pauline view? Why don't you just have the animal sacrificial system continue? It means if the animal sacrifice really did atone for sin— then Jesus is the fifth wheel. Why not just bring sacrifices into the temple? Why do I need Jesus? So the book of Hebrews, he doesn't leave any he doesn't leave any corner untouched. So he has to address that. So what he is conveying in context is the whole thing really is a shadow. And that's Hebrews 10, verse 1. So it really never worked. After all, the author goes, how could the blood of bulls and goats really? It was a temporal system that was all foreshadowing Christ, his body. That's the key. Okay? So right? No, this is just the point. It never worked. That's the key of Hebrews. And it's just a shadow pointing to Christ. He then has to rape 
um, the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verse 6 and 7, and you use the same king in order to do that. And then the point is that Christ is the fulfillment. It was all pointing to Christ. And therefore, Hebrews will go on further. See verse 18 of that chapter. Just so you know that this is not taken out of context, that there is, now that we have Christ, see Hebrews 10, 18, there is no longer any sacrifice of animals. That's done with, done away with. But you know what's so crazy about this is that who, who's, Whose statues and laws were these? Did the priests make this up? This was given from word of mouth to, from God to Moses on what to do to offer atonement for sins. So what is the, the, offer, the, the author of Hebrews is basically saying God's way didn't work. Our way is working. That's basically what he's saying. And that's why I started, you know, when we started, this is like a full circle. I said, in order to get Hebrews, you just got to read the first two verses of Hebrews. Like I'm, not, this, I'm not setting up a straw man. I'm not trying to be uncharitable to Christianity. Hebrews one and two. This is how Hebrews says begins. It goes. It waxes. You know, long ago when God wanted to speak to us, He spoke through the prophets of old, right? But now we are in a diff different days. We are in the last days. And now He speaks us through His Son. So what He's telling us from the get go is that. I know what's the old, and that's the law of Moses, and as you said, Hebrews 3, 4, Moses, Joshua, everybody gets it. Jesus is above, Iberalis, he's above all. But So Hebrews really tells us that Jesus is the new, um, is, is the new salvation path, dispensation, and everything is uprooted, and all the old stuff really is old, and whatever is old waxes away. And I'm willing to ra rape, I'm willing to manipulate, I am willing to rape the Hebrew Bible in order to make it appear Christological. I'll do it. And I, I've given you two examples, Hebrews 8, verse 9, Hebrews 10, verse 5. And and, and here's one other point, Neil, just so because I, I know you guys are going to get this. So people go, if you look up, the, so what do like Christians do with this? So like, help me, save me, I need to believe in Jesus, right? So what do you do? Ah, our, thank goodness for the Septuagint. So, and here's, yes, the Septuagint is the Christian Superman that comes in to rescue the church from all these corruptions. So the church would then alter a Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible in order to comport with these corruptions. So that if you go to the Septuagint on Hebrews chapter 8, verse um, 9, on Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, the Septuagint is not going to say what it tells you in the Hebrew text. The Septuagint, rather, is going to support the Christian corruption. Wow. Wow is right. We, we mentioned how the, the author of Hebrews is trying to make him all these things that aren't even possible. Like, throughout, throughout all the Tanakh, the king and the high priest are two different things. Okay, angels and God are two different things. Okay, but they're come, they're smushing everything into one super superhero of a of a of a Messiah. Which, by the way, Messiah is God's anointed. So God's anointing Himself. Anyways, I digress. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is, <laughs> <laughs> I digress. They combine two, and this is what we're getting at: is this this um this these animals of atonement and passover he's the passover lamb he's also the the um the the goat the yom keeper goat so what is happening with that how are that what are, what what's happening with this and what and what are, what's the difference between these two? so in reality it's jesus portrayed as the passover lamb in throughout the christian bible they actually the church will hang on to passover and we know why because if jesus was crucified and i think it's probably more likely than not that he was, um, it would have been around Passover. So the Passover lambs was a requirement for every person to eat Exodus chapter 12 and so on. The, the mistake of hooking Jesus to he's our Passover, John chapter 1, verse 29, John 1, 36, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and so on, is that the Passover lamb was not a sacrifice for sin. The Passover lamb was the final test of the Jewish people awaiting for the exodus. The lamb was worshipped by the Egyptians as a god. Like in India, it's illegal, it's against the law to harm to molest a cow, because the Hindus think it's holy. So in Egypt, the lamb was a, a 
God. In fact, there's a very interesting conversation in Exodus 8. Pharaoh is questioning uh, Moses and asking, like, why do you guys need to go into the wilderness to bring your offerings? Bring them here in Egypt like you could do it here. Why do you need to leave? And Moses said, well, l let me give you the insight here. Let me give you the scoop, Pharaoh. If we, if we kill this animal here, you'll kill us. Okay, so therefore, God turns to the Jewish people and asks them to do what is illicit in Egypt. That is to kill the God of the Egyptians. And well, maybe can I just do this in my basement? Eh, not really. I need you to bring the lamb into your house on the 10th day, tie it up. But then I need you to slaughter it on the 14th day. It's, you can't lock the doors. I need you to put the blood on the outside of the door along the lentil so everyone can see from the outside. And here's the test to you. Does your fear of, the, of God exceed your fear of the Egyptian soldiers that you could see right in front of you? If you're willing to pass that test, then death would pass over your house. And then you would exit out of a door. And think about this for a moment. The 14th, the lamb is sacrificed, is, is slaughtered. Its blood is put on the outside of the door. So the whole outside of the door is now blood. You're inside a room. You're told to... to, to girdle your loins, to put on your sandals, to have your staff in your hand, and to be ready to leave at a moment. And then you're shot out of this one opening that's surrounded by blood. You're blown out of there. What does that remind you? Birth. Blown out. Only if you can pass the test, the, the test of the lamb. Are you willing to risk your life this would have been a capital offense in Egypt to slaughter a god, what the Egyptians considered to be a god. Are you willing to do that and risk it all for God? If you are, then you're like Abraham and you're worthy of redemption. So as it turns out, the Passover lamb is a sacrifice for being righteous. It's an, a righteous, that means only righteous people offered it. It's not only not a sin offering, I mean, the church has this so wrong, it's an offering that illustrates that you're faithful to God, that you trust God more than you fear the Egyptian soldiers. That's the whole point. So catching on to the Passover lamb was a monumental theological error of the church. But And one of the strange things, Neil, is that that this is, Paul mentions um, that Jesus is our Passover, as I mentioned in his letter to uh, his, the church in Corinth. And although the Synoptic Gospels ignore that, uh, John picks up on that and makes a very big deal on it. And in case you think this is picayune, um, in case you think this is not really, this is crazy stuff because the fact that John considers Jesus to be the Lamb of God he therefore changes the date of Jesus' crucifixion to the 14th day of Nisan, to the eve of Passover, rather than the first day of Passover, and eviscerates the, the Eucharist from his Last Supper. That means that where do you have the Last Supper in John, John 13? Now, at the Last Supper is where you would expect, like in all the other three Gospels, where you would expect to have the Eucharist, the wine and the bread blood and body. But it can't be in John. Why? Because John's Last Supper is a day earlier, so it's sort of the night of the 13th. So John doesn't have a Eucharist. There's no matzah, there's no bread, there's no wine at John's Last Supper. Instead, we find something we don't find anywhere else, and that is Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. If you want to find John's Eucharist, go to John chapter 6. That's where it's found. <laughs> what, what is it doing in John chapter 6? The answer is, so in case you're thinking for even a moment that this is sort of some, well, some little detail. It's huge. It changes everything and how people behave in front of Pontius Pilate, the refusal to go into the praetorium pr uh, uh, of Pontius Pilate, to the palace of Pontius Pilate, the the disciples at the Last Supper think when Judas is carried, leaves with the bag of money, that he's going to buy food for the festival the next day. Like, that doesn't even make sense in verse 29 when they're eating it. Why is he going to buy it? So this has a monumental effect on the way John is going to handle datum and alter it in order to comport with this Lamb of God theology. Wow. And that that's exactly what I was trying to get at. Is that you got this whole atonement for sins thing, but that's yeah, I'm Kipper. That's a goat, and Jesus is a lamb. So that it doesn't even make sense. It's almost like they're screwing with these image, screwing with the um, the the purpose of 
what the actual Tanakh is, is doing. And they're just, they're just turning things on its head. It's all inversing. It's all inverse. But no Christian considers this. No Christian. I mean, Neil, you were a Christian. You talk about this. Right? When You're a smart guy. I mean, when you were a Christian, did this ever occur to you? Like, what is the Passover lamb? Like, you, you actually have you get You get the impression that all Jews know this. And they're just like, they're right. like, oh, I'm not going to admit it. But, uh, like, that's what right. you think because you're taught that. You're taught right. that ever, everyone knows this is true. They're just don't, they just don't want to admit it. But then you start to actually read it for yourself and ask and like ask questions, and you're like, wow, this is completely tampered with. And the last thing I want to ask you about, real quick, is you were met talking about this Eucharist thing, the blood and the uh, are the the wine and the bread, the body and the and the blood. And this is another reason why I think this is coming out of Egypt, because in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, Osiris yeah. tells you to drink drink my blood and eat my flesh. And it turns out it's cakes and wine, which is bread and wine. Right. So, I mean, is there, and, and like my question is, is there anything in Melchizedek that's trying to tie this Eucharist to the old Testament somehow in some weird trickery way? So there's a misappropriation. So wine and bread are really important in Judaism, but, and it should not be misappropriated. What's unique about wine and bread? Oh, here it is. A great wine is unique because a grape vine, let, unlike, an, let's take an olive tree, which is all over Israel. And it's considered, so an olive tree is not only valuable for the olives, but also olive wood is really valuable. Olive wood is used for some of the finest furniture in the world. So an olive tree has both the fruit and the actual tree. The branches are very valuable, very useful. What's striking about a grape vine is, although the grape is very valuable and it naturally becomes wine, the fermentation process is, is natural, the vines have no purpose at all. There's nothing you can do with it. So the point is that our purpose is to serve God and our purpose on earth has served. We're not here to be doctors and lawyers and accounts. We're here just to serve God. And therefore, only the grape matters and the vine doesn't matter. Other kind of trees, pomegranate trees, the tree has value, not the grapevine. It's not even going to provide shade for you. It's nothing, just the grape. Same thing with wheat, the bread. The wheat has is very striking. Why? Because you have the, the kernel of wheat, but you also you have the chaff. The chaff is completely inedible. It has no purpose, nothing you can do with it. You have to just toss it away, maybe grind it up for animal feed. It's worthless. So what is striking about wine and bread is that they only the bread is valuable, only the wheat is valuable, the chaff has no value. Only the grape is valuable, the vine is worthless, unlike almost anything else. So that's the real message. What Christianity then does is it misappropriates the very important wine and bread, which every religious Jew blesses the Sabbath with on Friday night on Shabbat. So it really is important to us. But then it and then pushes in a ritual cannibalism, which is mysteries. I think I think that's what they were doing. They were trying to tie in the mysteries so they can so they course. can sell this. they can sell this to a Roman audience. But, but what is the mist what what is so let's take it a little deeper because this I, I want this all to make sense for you the viewer and not to be mysterious. C cannibalism is is was practiced exclusively not for nutrition. It almost never was. People never ate people because they liked the way people taste. But rather, the thinking behind all ritual cannibalism, which is still practiced to this day in Papua in Indonesia, um, is that is the thinking is that if you eat the body or drink the blood of your victim, you gain the power and the strength of your victim. That's the thinking behind ritual cannibalism. So it, it, we call it a myst mystery religion, but there's really not much, there's not, this is not mysterious at all. Uh, and, and you see that in the Gospels where uh, the, on the first Easter in the book of John, Jesus breathes on the disciples and what happens to them as a result? They gain his powers. What happens in Luke's version in in Pentecost, in Acts chapter 1 and 2. But suddenly the Holy Spirit is now upon them, and they then have the powers to go out and, and, and they can do everything from forgiving sin to performing miracles, and that's what they do. So the ritual cannibalism, the element of it that's very attractive is that here you have Jesus, he's way out there. How do I, be, how do I get Christ in me? And that's the point is 
Christ in you? Are you part of the body of Christ? These terms are not accidental. These are Pauline, this Pauline language that as Christ dwells in you means that the power of Christ is in you. And how do you gain that through the Eucharist? Whether it's in the Roman Catholic and Orthodox view, which is transubstantiation that goes back very, very far. Lutheran, it's still a high presence, Calvinist, symbol. Whatever it is, it's ritual cannibalism, which is seeking, it was so pervasive because it's sought to convey that you can then gain the powers of the gods and you can then snake bites won't bother you and you can eat any poison thing because you you have become a god in a sense in a way the mormons are right you kind of become a god by doing this wow and then and then what's so crazy is like in a weird in a weird series of events you what you're doing is you're taking the bite of that apple the forbidden fruit by Mm -hmm. and and i don't know if that's on purpose or not but it's like it might be like so a, a crazy coincidence, but at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is, like we said from the beginning, the author of Hebrews is trying to speak the language, but also pull you outside and bring you outside of the camp and bring right, you right. into the world, into the Roman world, the Greco-Roman Hellenized world, and just say, look it, this is the real way. Look, mm-hmm. we have the right, we have it. We're the real ones. We're the true ones. That never worked. This is going to work. Trust that's us. Right. And that's what, it, that's what it ends up on. That's that's what this whole thing's about. Right. right. You, you could see why, Neil, that, you know, even the book of Hebrews, its canonization is include, uh, uh, its inclusion in the Christian canon was highly controversial. There were uh, church fathers who didn't think it belonged because they didn't think Paul wrote it. Um, but you could see why that although there was doubt over the authorship, which was important to to the church, that we had to have an apostolic authority, either an apostle or a companion, the, the book was so well uh, s- um, synchronized Pauline thinking in such a way that Paul wasn't even as articulate in that you could see why they would take the book of Hebrews and go with it and whether... It's interesting that today, I think, I think the consensus among the evangelical Christians is that Paul didn't write Hebrews, right? I mean, if he didn't write Hebrews, though, who wrote it? You know, but you can see that they don't care. Not that they don't, they don't care. They don't even take because Hebrews so encapsulates Pauline theology even better than Paul could have ever done it. Yeah, and um, wow, this was. I think we picked it apart pretty good. Yeah. I mean, what else? What else is there to say? I mean, they're they're, what they're they're trying to make him into all these different different things that aren't supposed to be the same thing. Like, okay, you're if you're the son of God, but you're also the Messiah, you're also the King, you're also the High Priest, you're also of these order Melchizedek, but you're also a son of David. Those are all things that can't be the same. And then you're 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 the you're the Passover Lamb, but you're also you know the sin offering, which two different things. And again, so what they're doing is they're taking the whole entire context of the law and the books of Moses and turning it onto its head and then saying, follow us. And it's like, it really is shocking that they can, that they sort of pulled it off that way. Really is shocking. If you feel worthless, if you feel that there is nothing you can do to satisfy God, if your self esteem, is on the floor. If your worst critic is the person you see when you look in the mirror, and when you see photographs of yourself, you don't see anything attractive, Christianity is going to be very appealing to you. That's the key. Christianity is extremely successful because it affirms our worst fears and says, it's okay, you are a sinner, you are worthless. You'll never be Christ, and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. But there's a way here. You can eat the body of Christ, drink his blood, figure it you literally. Jesus, he's perfect. He never sinned. He's above Moses. He's a son. He's not even a servant. This is the language of Hebrews. And you can be saved. Not that you can do it yourself, but through the body of Christ. And just raping the text of Psalm chapter 40, altering it. No Christian looks this up. This is why, you know, you start off by asking me, like, you know, we talk about times where I talk to Christians, like, how do I, you know, remain even keel? I, I know what's happened to them. I can see how vulnerable they are. And just go back to the original, and it'll surprise you. 
Wow, well said. And um, any any last thoughts on what we talked about or anything you wanted to just promote while, while we're on here? Well, I'll be speaking in Dallas on July 9th and 10th. And I will be um, Saturday night and Sunday evening. And, and, and I will be engaging in a debate with Professor R.L. Salberg in Nashville, Tennessee on July 17th. Sunday afternoon. And if you'd like to attend, you need to pre-register. And some of those events are almost sold out. They're not quite, but they are almost. And just go on to a website, com, and that's B-E-Y-N-E-Y-N-U.com. And you can then register and join us at the debate. Look forward to meeting you. Or in Dallas, I'm looking forward to uh, spending some time in the United States before I return back to Israel. So thank you, Neil. It's great joining on this fascinating journey. Absolutely. And I put a link in the description for the link that you just said. And um, last thing real quick, I am coming to Israel in a couple months. Yes. So if you're there, me and Derek will be there and we'll stop by. We're going to not just stop by. We're going to have a in-person, con- long conversation about all this. Over falafel. I'm kidding. No, but over. <laughs> We're well, definitely going to hang out. That's, that, that's over. it. Yeah. All right. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus. Welcome to the Gnostic Informant. I'm Jesus, the Logos Incarnate, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And we're going live with Rabbi Tobias Singer today. And um, yeah, so start submitting questions. I see people already started sending some super chats, which is great. Uh, before we get to that, though, I just want to send, uh, I just want to give you guys a little bit of a tease that's going to happen. Right, it's, it's in the works. 
almost finished editing is a video that uh, Rabbi did, did with me about the book of Daniel. And so I have a clip. I'll play the clip. It's about a minute long. And then we'll, we can uh, give a couple teasers and then we'll go right to the super chat. So you guys can start submitting those whenever you want. And thank you for those. I appreciate it. Here it is. Like I said before, last time you were on. Right. Was, I get these emails from people. And they watch my. They watch us. They watch you, and they're listening intently, and they want to learn. I'm like, oh, you guys are making good points. These are unfalsifiable points you're making. We can look these up. We can check the Hebrew, and sure enough, you guys are right. But and I always get these. You always get these buts, and then there's a couple more questions added tackled on. It's like, okay, Isaiah 53. Okay, you're right. It's the suffering servant of Israel. We got it. You guys, you guys are right. All right, and then I'll say, like, okay, the, the, the virgin thing. You guys are right about that. Okay, whatever. You're, you're right. You know, Alma, Batula, you got that. But now I got you. I got you in check now. I'm like, okay, what is it now? Daniel. Daniel 9. Who else could Daniel be talking about when he talks mm. about the 70 weeks the anointed one will be cut down? Right. It's so clear that that's Jesus. It should be said from the outset that if someone um, concedes Isaiah 53, which they would have to, as you said, the context demands it, you then can throw the, the New Testament in the place that it belongs, the garbage, because that demonstrates that Matthew was misappropriating passages from the Hebrew Bible. But Daniel 9, you're right, stands out alone, very, very unique, because Christians will say... Daniel 9 is very different here because here we have a precise prediction of exactly when the Messiah is going to be killed, going to be crucified. We have the timing. It is perfectly set up and is outlined in the last four passages of the ninth chapter of Daniel. How could you deny Christ? Now, what's very striking about this, I brought up the Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 7. Not just because you did, but there's something very striking about Daniel 9. And that is the writers of the New And that's all you're getting for now. You better stay subscribed. And it's going to be on Patreon before it hits the, hits the public market. So join my Patreon as well. That's going to be on there tomorrow night. Um, so, yeah. And let's get right to the questions. I see there's a bunch of lined up already. Rabbi, I cannot see them, but I can see them. Um, if the mods are here, I see melodies here. The mods, you see anything uh, anti-Semitic, anything just rude or inconsiderate, just, you know, be just delete it. I'll give you all permission to delete it. Um, I can't see everything, so. But, but yeah, for the most part, we're going to, I'm not going to, filters off for most, for the most part, as long as you're not disrespectful or, you know, uh, racist or anti that's, that's where the line gets drawn. But anyways, anything else, ask away. If you're free, there's going to be no censorship whatsoever. And the first question, I believe, is from Yakuvi. Thank you for the super chat. Yakuvi says, I would like to ask Rabbi Singer, when was the name Yodhivavi Tetragrammaton prohibited to be uttered and replaced by Shem? So, all right. Great question. So let me start off by amping up the question. There is only one unforgivable sin. In the Torah, of the 613 commandments, only one of them, if you violate it, God will never forgive you. And it's precisely for doing that, saying God's name in vain. In fact, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the prohibition against saying God's name in vain comes before swearing falsely. And it's that's counterintuitive. Like, why is saying God's name in vain the most, the worst thing you can do in essence? Now I'm not going to go into it now unless someone asks the question, or we're going to we're going to go off the rails. In fact, the Ten Commandments does not have a prohibition of cursing God, which again seems counterintuitive. It's a really bad idea to swear falsely in the name of God or to curse God. But saying God's name in vain is the worst possible thing you can do. Yeah. Again, if someone asks why, I'll explain. If not, we'll just move on. As Tex says it, please read the first handful of verses of Exodus chapter 20, where you find the Ten Commandments. 
But as it turns out, there are many names of God that are used in the Torah. There's not just one name. There are many names. The Tetragrammaton conveys that God is infinite. He has no beginning. He was, is, and will be. And because our minds can't comprehend eternity, infinity, we know what the word means, but it's just a concept, so that we cannot say it. But the name Hashem is used in the Torah as well. And it's used, the, Hashem first of all, literally in Hebrew means the name. So it's, let me give an example. Um, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 11, you have the term Hashem. The, the context there is someone who curses God's name. So therefore, when Jewish people, when religious Jews speak about God or mention God in Hebrew, and we're having a conversation. I mean, it's not it's not prayer. We're not reading from a Torah. We're not reading from a scripture. But we're mentioning God in Hebrew, and it's a it's not a sacred um, liturgy. So we say Hashem, and that term we find also in Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight. So Hashem means the name, and we'll only use that in conversation. We will never use the ineffable name of God. Only the high priest would use that on, um, on Yom Kippur, or else it would never be said. And as I mentioned, it's an unpardonable sin. Wow. So we use both, right? There are other names of God. You, you made them, one starts with Ado. We would say that name, which means the master of all things, in prayer, when in prayer, when we're reading the text, uh, Elo, and then ends with him, we would use that name. That name is used exclusively in Genesis 1. If you ask me what I'll explain to you, each name of God conveys another feature about Hashem, another feature about the Almighty. And um, But the name Hashem is deliberately used in the Torah when we're, when it's when it's profane, and that's why it's found in Leviticus twenty four verse eleven. Interesting. Great stuff. question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Good way, good way to start it off. This one is a little bit borderline weird, but whatever. Hey, thank you for the super chat. Why do you see that Hebrew Aleph, uh, Hebrew Lamech, is the he so Al is the Hebrew name for Allah? Why do you not see that Esau was a prophet who was killed like the other prophets? <laughs> it's a, it's a Muslim. I don't, clearly a Muslim by saying. Well, let's. No, well, um, Muslims are not fans of of Esau, so not necessarily. But let's let's make this really easy. Let's take something what appears to be at first it's glance Esau, Esau G, the Jesus word for. Oh, Esau. I thought you meant Esau. Okay. No, no, no. Esau. That's Jesus. Okay, yeah. Maverick. Got it. Okay. So let's clear this up, make this really easy. Throughout the Semitic world and beyond, the name Al means power. In all the gods, Al, in not, in not just Hebrew, Arabic, and all the languages that we would expect to find in the Levant and beyond, the name Al, since we're talking about the name of God, always conveys power. And therefore, we would expect to find the name Al in is part of the name of gods of all the peoples of all the religions. So let's take um so the, the name Elohim, let's just take that, means almighty, quite literally. It is for that reason that in Genesis chapter one. Uh, we only find that name of God and no other. So when in Arabic, just going to the Islamic element of the question, in Arabic, Elah means God, but it doesn't mean necessarily the true God. It can mean God, lowercase g, or uppercase g. Allah means the God, which can only mean God Almighty, and it in Islamic tradition, there are 99 names for God. All of them are attributes of God. Okay. But that's really how it works. So you're going to, like Baal, right? All these names that have the Al in it. Al means 
power. Havu Lashem Elam. Just a standard Semitic name you'd find everywhere. And that just became, and then later on, it just becomes God. Is that how that works? Well, yeah, but that has a you know Latin derivative. But sure. right, right, okay. right. So very religious Jews, by the way, just to link these questions together, just to make a point, very religious Jews, when writing God, meaning G-O-D, capital G, will actually write G hyphen D without the O in it. Oh, wow. You're not, requ we're not required, Orthodox Jews are not required to do this, but... It's a sign of reverence. Leviticus okay. 28 says, be very fearful of the name of God. So religious Jews are very, very careful about the name of God. You're not required to do it, but it's an extra way of showing reverence for something. Sure. Good, good, good question. Good answer. Constellation Pegasus comes with a giant super chat. Probably the record, breaking the record I've ever seen in my show. So... If that's a mistake, if that's some sort of error, just email me. We can, we can figure, figure out. But thank you. Either way, whatever, if this is a mistake or not, uh, thank you. I really appreciate this. Uh, so we'll take your time. We'll, well, let's really try to answer this one. What is three Baruch and does the text mean anything to Jews today? I am an ex Jehovah's Witness and spent over $3,000 on old literature to prove what I was learning about them was true. I'm atheist now, but if I did believe in God, and it would be, I'm sorry, if I did believe in God again, it would be through Judaism now. I really respect your knowledge. So this is a good one. All right. So third Baruch, that's a an apocryphal writing. It, as you said, it is, it is not part of the canon. It's a pseudepigrapha. It, it what the dating for third baruch is somewhere in about anywhere from let's say very early second century. You can some scholars, very few, would place it as early as after the destruction of the second temple. It means a little bit after seventy, and. The consensus is that it is probably second century. There are some who believe that it's third century. So this is a really, really late book. It's and for Jewish people, it just it's not written by a prophet. It's not the word of God, but I'm going to explain more. So the reason it's not in the canon of the Hebrew Bible is because it wasn't written by a prophet. In fact, it's a very late book. Like as an example. The Book of Maccabees, First Maccabees, Second Maccabees, Second Maccabees is much much earlier. It's those books are not in the Hebrew canon for an altogether different reason. So first, it's dating. Dating is let's say uh, maybe from the year eighty, meaning as late as the Book of Matthew. I mean, as early as the Book of Matthew. You know, it's basically the time as early as the Synoptic Gospels, Third Baruch. So it's really really late, but probably somewhere in the second or third century. But the reason why third, it's the idea behind third Baruch, first of all, who is Baruch? Who is this? This is a pseudepigrapha. So who does the author purport to be? So let's set that up. The author purports to be a disciple of Yirmiyahu, of Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived at the very end of the first temple period. Jeremiah became a prophet at the age of 15. He prophesied for 41 years. He, when, when he was 56 years old, the first temple was destroyed, and he went to exile in Egypt. He had a, a disciple, scribe disciple, named Baruch ben Nirya. And there are a whole bunch of people since that period who who wrote pseudepigraphers, that means they weren't really written by Baruch Maneria, that presented themselves as him, okay? So that's who third Baruch is, is claiming to be, okay? So now we know that, and this is becomes very important that the author wants you to think that a disciple of Jeremiah, again, Jeremiah lived during the Babylonian Empire, okay? Okay, got that. Now, the third Baruch has a 
a dualistic view of the temple in that although the temple was destroyed, by the way, it's the same theme in the earlier, in second Baruch, although the physical temple on earth has been destroyed, don't worry about it, because the spiritual temple, the celestial temple continues. And in that, we have a temple. That's the whole thing. It's not hoping for what we find in Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, like Ezekiel, the last three passages of chapter 37, that's 26, 27, 28, that's going to be another temple built. Chapter 40 through 48 in Ezekiel describes the final messianic temple. So therefore, this this book is a pseudepigrapha, but the ideas conveyed are not spiritual, spiritually edifying, even as a even as a non-canonical text. That means a person might look at 1 Maccabees and go, wow, we can learn a lot from 1 Maccabees, and we can historically. Right. We might be able to gain a lot of information from 1 and 2 Maccabees about spiritually where the Jews were at, but there isn't straightforward heresy in the book of Maccabees. In 3rd Barak, it's a highly dualistic world where in the dualistic, in the Gnostic in the Manichaeist, they're all iterations of dualism. The celestial world is what really matters, and the terrestrial world, the earthly world, is broken. That's the theme that runs through all of it. It's, you find that in Paul, heavy in Paul. And therefore, it, both its dating is very late, and the the content of third baroque is completely antithetical to judaism which says that we have to raise the terrestrial world to the spiritual and never discount physical resurrection and so on that's a really great question thank you really good question very good question and by the way constellation pegasus thank you so much for that i really appreciate you and being really um supporting this show and I, like i said if there if this was an error on your part you just my email is in the description of the channel just send me an email let me know but if not even if it was regardless thank you so much i appreciate you more than i can possibly express so thank you for that gaius julius windex with the 499 thank you for that super chat why do evangelicals say that donald trump is a messiah like king cyrus <laughs> it's a funny question and as a representative of the evangelical world, I feel particularly suited to answer that question. <laughs> ah, so um, the reason why some evangelical Christians advance the notion that Donald Trump was a Cyrus figure is because Cyrus figures huge in the Jewish Bible. And very famously, he is quoted in the book of Isaiah, and he's called God's Messiah. And as it turns out, this contributes to the way scholarship views the book of Isaiah, because after all, a prophet writing during the Assyrian Empire couldn't possibly know about the Babylonian Empire or its fall and the rise of the Persian Empire. But because Donald Trump was so, not just pro-Israel, but Donald Trump sought to and did move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to the capital, to Jerusalem, many evangelicals saw him as a, a type of Cyrus figure. And they suggested that given that uh, Donald Trump was maybe coincidence, the 40 fifth president of the United States, correlating to Isaiah 45, verse 1. There it is. So therefore, they saw um, a typology where Donald Trump fulfilled a Cyrus faith. Because Cyrus, look at how Ezra chapter 1 begins. The book of Ezra begins by Cyrus saying, go back to Jerusalem, rebuild it, right? What's Isaiah 44, 28, and 45, 1? I say to you, Cyrus, tell the, you know, the Jews, go back and build your temple and return. So therefore, that's why some, not all, but some evangelicals definitely saw Donald Trump as a Cyrus figure. 
good, good question. Great answer. Imposter Sir Spence. Thank you for the super chat. Is Matthew Jewish? That's it. That's all he said. There's, there is no way to know if Matthew is Jewish. In fact, there's no way to know anything about Matthew. We don't know his name. We don't know where he lived. And people say they do. They don't. Let alone that he was Jewish. The author of Matthew does not claim to be Matthew. In fact, it, in in Matthew 9, 9, when it says, and Jesus passed by and he saw a man, man called Matthew sitting at the place of a toll, and he said to him, follow me, and he arose and followed him. All third person. Then he said to me. So nobody knows if he's Jewish or not. Um, it's called the Jewish gospel because Matthew, more than any other gospel writer, uses fulfillment citations. In fact, the way he uses uh, the Jewish scriptures is different than the other three gospels. The, the, Tanakh is quoted in all four gospels, but the way Matthew says it, and this is this is the fill what was spoken to the Lord by the prophet, saying, that's really so because also Matthew begins with an infancy narrative telling us that this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and he stops at Abraham in his genealogy, in contrast to Luke chapter three, where Luke goes to Adam, right? So that that's the reason why people suggest that uh, that Matthew is Jewish. But no one, no one could possibly know that. There's no access to that information. The it's not other, in Hebrew. It's in Greek, right? It's written in Greek, and it's not written in Hebrew. That's all nonsense. Guess you want to know something crazy? Before, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off, but I was just talking to another scholar about this. And they were arguing that Matthew's more Zoroastrian than Jewish. It's got the Magi. It's got the scene where he's in the desert and then he gets rushed upon by the devil. Like there's a, in the Zen of Vesta, there's a narrative where Zoroaster's in the, in the, in the wilderness and he gets rushed upon by Anger Manu. And he says the same thing to him. I'll give you the boon to rule all nations. And he, reg- he, he re- says, no, I'm going to, and he starts chanting to Ahura Mazda and then the devil, and then, That's right. the devil. but so, there, this this scholar who I was talking to was like, if you read Matthew, it starts off with the Magi, and then it's it's constantly reminding you that this is a a, a new Zoroaster in a way. So I right. can argue that it's a more of a Zoroastrian text than a Jewish text. So this is vital to understand that whoever assembled the Book of Matthew, I selected that term very deliberately. Whoever redacted the book of Matthew is not one. It's not a guy sat down and wrote the book of Matthew. He had a, he had all sorts of sources in front of him. He quotes almost all the book of Mark verbatim. Right. He's using a source which we don't that is shared with Luke. That means well over two hundred passages appear in Matthew and Luke that appear nowhere in Mark, and they're the same type of passages. Meaning they're saying of Jesus, not the birth, not miracles, but saying. So the problem that's a very that's almost certainly a very primitive source, probably much older than the Book of Mark. So, and then he has these sources, including the M source that you're referring to right now. It's ab- absolutely, whoever wrote Matthew is collecting all all sorts of stuff. But Ma- the the other reason why people think that Matthew was written by a Jew or was written in Hebrew is because of the second century church father Papias. Now. We have nothing, nothing survives of what Papias wrote. Now, Papias, let's say it is believed that Papias wrote in the first half of the second century, but there's nothing, there's nothing we have, nothing survives of Papias. We only have much later church fathers that claim Papias said that Matthew gave us conveyed the logi, which is not a gospel, but it means the sayings of Jesus in. Aramaic slash Hebrew. And and look, the church loves this. The, I, I need to a- and put this point in. This is a big problem for Christendom. And why is the Christian Bible written in Greek? Okay. Like what the heck happened? Like 
the Tanakh is all written in Hebrew with a little Aramaic, but Aramaic is a sister language of Hebrew. I mean, really close. Yeah. Okay. It's just, I'm not saying it's the same. It's not, but it's almost the same. It's as close as you could possibly be. I mean, if you read Hebrew, you can make they out. They use the same alphabet too, right? Yeah, of course. They're using that. Forget about it. But it's just for right now, just taking over for the almost, they're not identical, but right. they're almost identical. Okay. So just right now instead. Why is God moving to Greek? That's crazy. The reason why this question is so is 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 so problematic is it would be roughly the equivalent of God writing in German. Like what? Like of all the languages, German? Like what? See, Greek is oh yeah. Greek is the language of Antiochus Epiphanes the Fourth. Greek <laughs> was the language of Hellenism. Greek was not just another language or the lingua de franca of the of the empire. Greek was the language that 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 everything was wrong with it. It was completely antithetical to Judaism. Judaism rejected Greek thoughts, Neoplatonic ideas, the dualism of of that's found in Platonic ideas. All of that. So Greek was the enemy language. Like what? Like God's choosing Greek? Why, why would He choose Greek? Choose Chinese? I'm just kidding. Like why would the Holy Spirit be speaking in Greek? So. No, I just right. tell you, tell you this: if they actually found a second century Hebrew text of Matthew, which in Hebrew, and it's never going to happen. But if they did, oh my God, that would be like that would be like uh, you know like a bar mitzvah for the church. That would be the biggest thing in the world. It's never going to happen. And Matthew really was originally written in Greek. We know that for many ways, including there are devices in the in the language of let's say the Beatitudes. Right, right at the opening of Matthew chapter five, you have the Beatitudes that are all using alliterations, which means that the consonants line up, and it's, you know, like she sells seashells. So you have the same. You have Greek devices that completely collapse any alliteration in any language when you translate it from one to another. The alliteration will completely collapse. So Matthew was not written in Hebrew; it was written in Greek. That's the original. Uh, language and but there's reason why Christians would like to go to Papias, even though Christians recognize that Papias was hugely problematic. And Eusebius referred to him as an idiot, essentially. I mean, <laughs> so I'm not making that up. So, but you know, sometimes I don't want to say it together, but some people like to use Papias when he's convenient and then reject him when he's inconvenient. Simply said. Wow, good answer. And by the way, just real quick, just, just to add to what you just said, the name Matthew didn't get applied till like 180. That's right, 180. That's right. That it didn't yeah. begin to Irenaeus. That means they're using we, Matthias is like a, a priestly name, so they're trying to make it look Jewish. Well, the the text in the New Testament does refer to you know Matthew as a, as a Levite, so you know it's very right, text. Right, right, I mean, right. but it is Irenaeus, a very important church father, one of the most important church fathers who says these are the four gospels and he has his reason for it. Irenaeus is a very strange fellow. He came from the east, meaning he came from what's current modern day Turkey, Asia Minor, but sure. he served as bishop of Lyon in, in the west in modern day France. And he's really really important. He says this is in, this is out. Right. Yep. That's awesome. Uh Gerede Dacian, thank you for the super chat. Question for the rabbi. His take on Genesis cosmology, solid dome over the earth, etc. Some say the real point is morals cosmology is irrelevant. I I I didn't I I, I didn't what? understand it. I may not what be is, familiar. What I don't is the take on the cosmology, basically. You mean cosmology as the cosmologically the beginning or yeah. that's what it looks like. Uh let's see, let me look at me see. Genesis cosmology, yeah. So yeah. Genesis cosmology is that the world comes into being ex nihilo from absolutely nothing, and it, you you wouldn't have to go back that far, 60, 70 years, when that's what scientists thought. the The Bible's view is that there was absolutely no Vaharetz so Genesis one verse two, Vaharetz, which means in this case the universe, Hayu Sohu Vavo, was just empty and void. And it's really the same word. V'choshek al uh, and there was just darkness on the depths. Okay. 
and the spirit of Asha, all that existed, it's not doesn't mean water there, but all that existed was the spirit of God. There was nothing. And then God spoke the the earth's existence, the universe's existence, into by uttering words. This is very important in Jewish thought. Uh, Psalm chapter 33, verse 6, which means the Hebrew language is an intrinsic language in in biblical cosmology. God uttered a Hebrew word like or, meaning light, and that's the first thing that God creates. God literally utters the word or, and from that word emerges light. And for a long time, people didn't understand why God created light first. And the reason why this is problematic at first glance is that God doesn't create the sun until day four. So what's the rush, right? Uh, perhaps, I, we don't know, but perhaps light was necessary in order to have time. But in the view of the Torah, light was essential. Without light, you can't have time, and that is created first. But prior to that, nothing existed except for God's Spirit. There was just nothing. That's interesting. Now, I just got a real quick question. Is there? I saw someone in the chat saying about crackling. Is there crackling noises? Is this just one person, or is this... Is everyone seeing this or no? I just want to make sure. I haven't had. I only saw two. Or, I think one person say that. Let's just just leave. I'm just gonna leave that out there. But I'll move on. If uh, if I see anybody bringing up this, anyone else bringing this up, let me know. Um, okay. But yeah, that was a good answer, by the way. Let's see. The next one is from Derek Myth Fishing Podcast. Hmm. How you doing, bro? <laughs> he says, between Neil and me, who is your favorite goy? And who do you see making a better Noah hide? Ha ha. Looking forward to our discussion May 3rd. Neil, keep up the great work, brother. Thank you, Derek, for that super chat. So uh, I might as well say it now. I don't think Derek would mind. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, how do I say this discreetly? Derek is an imposter Gentile. <laughs> He has not shown up for synagogue in two weeks already, and don't think we didn't notice. He has not showed up in shul for already a couple of weeks now. He's a little nervous about people noticing him because he's afraid that if they see him in synagogue, myth vision is going to tank. But I want you to know that you you and me, he has we're like this. It's just between you and me and everyone watching, but Derek, it's okay. But two weeks no shul, like what's going on? You could put a talus over your head, no one would see it. No right. one would know. Okay, so we'll have a conversation after the show. No excuse to Derek. What's going on, man? Yeah, what is that? All right, next one. Mika Valin, thank you for the super chat. Doesn't Elohim mean the gods? What do you think about scholars who say Israelites were polytheistic for a period? It's an interesting question. Okay, it's a very interesting question. So first I'm going to ask the answer the first part of the question as i mentioned earlier the name al means what means power for that reason as we would expect the name of god elohim appears in genesis chapter one exclusively that can't be said about later chapters but because god is creating that is the only name of god in the ancient world People worship the sun. That was the chief god, the sun, sun worship. I mean, that's why when you see pictures of Jesus and Mary, they've got the, the halo behind them. The sun was behind it all. People worship the different celestial bodies, and they believe these all, all the powers that we see in the world are all governed by different, uh, different gods. They, they could, and understandably so, I understand the pagan world, they just couldn't imagine that the God who governs fire and the earth can govern the stars. It was inconceivable to them. I mean, you look at the stars and you see perfection. And then you look around you and you see death, destruction, disease, broken wheels. So they, you, you, women, for some reason, couldn't conceive and other women did. Some cows can give milk, some, and they assigned different gods to each of these powers. The name Elohim is there to convey that God is the source of all the powers. And, and that's why you can find in the Bible, incidentally, as an example, that 
if you'll ask me later why this is, I'll explain it, but just for now, God's when Moses is reluctant to be the person to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, he's going back and forth with God and saying, I'm not worthy of this whole thing. And his final argument is, I'm an oral sifasayim. I can't even talk. I mean, he had a speech impediment. And in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, God says, I will make you an Elohim to Pharaoh, and Aaron will be your prophet. He'll be your spokesperson. Because Aaron didn't speak with a lisp. Moses did. That doesn't mean there are multiple Moseses, because it's in the plural. That intensive plural is not just a, a linguistic device. It is conveying that all the powers that you see are really quite coming from one source. And therefore, the name Elohim should always be viewed as, a, there's a perfect English word for this, and that is almighty. Now, you, you watching this, you're wondering, well, why am I using Elohim as the name of God when Jews don't ordinarily use it in conversation? And that is because right now it's very important for me to that no one should worship idolatry or think anything. Now, so all that, so Elohim means exactly almighty. What does almighty mean? Almighty means that it's the power behind everything. Okay. Now, I'm going to convey something um, just a little bit deeper that's required. There's one footnote on this. There are two possible worldviews of Judaism. There, one is that if you're a, a theist and you believe in Judaism as the core of your faith, then you believe that the the world, the first man, the world began with monotheism, and then people started going, I mean, God is way up there. He's completely, he's running the, the planets. Like, he can't pay attention to me. Maybe I could start to pray to something else, and it will be an intercessor for me. And we see that bleeding into Christianity, where there's, you know, Paul says, you know, there's one God and man, and then there's, you know, and then there's the man Jesus Christ who's the intercessor, you know, the paraclete and John and so on. So, so one world view is that the world starts off with monotheism, a pure faith, and then it becomes corrupted. Follow? So it starts with monotheism. If you're not a if you if Judaism is not the foundation of your faith, meaning you don't believe in Judaism at all, so then you're going to believe in a different worldview entirely that the world thought of in, as a, a in polytheism. That means there were many many gods, because like how could the ancient ancient world know that there was one God governing everything? Today we know it. That means even an atheist would concede that if there is a God, there can only be one because we're all made up of carbon. It's all hydrogen is the most plentiful element out there. We're all protoplasm. That means we know that you and a monkey shares 99% of your DNA. So we know now that there's either one God or there's no God. Polytheism doesn't work anymore. But in the ancient world, they didn't know any of this stuff. So therefore, in the other world, this just second worldview is that in a non-religious worldview or non-Judaic worldview, everyone was polytheistic in the ancient world. And at some stage, the, the ancestors, the, the Jews came up, the Israelites, this tribe came up with the idea that there really is one God, and that idea stuck. So it's two completely different directions, depending on your religious worldview. If you believe in Judaism, and all Christians and Muslims do, right? They all believe that Judaism is the source. You believe it all began with one, and then everything got corrupted. Conversely, if you're if you're an atheist or you're sub, whatever, something else, then you go, it's all it was all over the place, and the Jews came up with the ancestors of the Jews came up with the idea of one God. It's really that simple. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny that you said that because Christians and Muslims have to believe in Judaism to a degree. There has to be some level of accepting the Torah, the, the Tanakh, in order for those other two to even exist at all. To every degree. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. It, right, right. It, 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 Right. If you don't in Islam, if you don't believe in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as prophets, they'll throw out. I mean, you're you're out the door. I mean, right. you're done. <laughs> Absolutely. Almost all the prophets of Islam are Jewish. 
Right, yeah. And a lot of their names are Elijah, like Elijah. Why is the name Elijah there? You know what I mean? Like, the na- whatever. That's another subject. But anyways, Samantha Pedigree says, who is Hillel and why is it translated to Lucifer in Latin? Oh, 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 okay. We're talking about Isaiah chapter 14. Yeah. Okay, so, all right. So the, what is meant in Isaiah 14 is... Halal Shachar, which means the morning star. Context for Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah is mocking the Babylonian Empire and Babylonian kings. Isaiah lived about 200 years before the Babylonian Empire. And he is saying that he is mocking all the future kingdoms. And in these chapters, what's in view is that the, the Babylonian Empire would rise to something enormous, but God is bringing you down, even though you think you're it. Okay, this is very important. And he compares the kings of Babylon to the, I think in chapter 14, verse 12, he compares the 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 kings of Babylon to the morning star. What does that mean? Now, the morning star is the planet Venus. Today, we don't pay attention to the stars very much because the art is gone. We don't need it. We have cell phones, we have watches, we have calendars, and there's too much light pollution. But in the ancient world, the stars are really important. All right. So even if it's during the day, let's say where you are right now, it's during the day. And although you can't see the stars, they're there. But you can't see them because there's too much life in the sun, so they it disappears. The brightest celestial body is the planet Venus, by far. And therefore, as morning comes, as the, at, as the morning begins to come, all the celestial bodies begin to disappear, which... A celestial body will disappear from our vision last, the brightest one, which is the brightest one? Venus. And that's where the name Lucifer, lucent light, comes from. So Isaiah mocks the Babylonian kingdom and going, you think like, it's just a parable, like the planet Venus seems to be going, look at me, although all the other stars have disappeared, but I'm still here. We know that in another moment, as the sun becomes stronger, the planet of Venus will disappear as well. So Isaiah mocks uh, the the kings of Babylon at like they're portraying themselves like they're never going to disappear. Isaiah says, you're going down. You're going to disappear. So the name Lucifer will then make it, this Latin word will then of understandably creep its way into the Latin translations, the Vulgate, and then... Um, then the church will then associate Lucifer, Lucifer with Satan, and the King James actually will use the term Lucifer, even though it's a complete, crazy, ridiculous translation. But the name Lucifer appears nowhere in the Christian Bible. In fact, Jesus is the morning star in the book of Revelation, which is odd uh, in its own. Which right. is very, very interesting why they would do yes. that. That was I just showed a picture right. of Venus. This is Metis right before the morning's coming. So the morning right. the sun is rising. But Venus is still light, bright, which is why they gave, which is why they gave it that nickname. By the way, Julius Caesar was known as the son of Venus, and when he died, Augustus styled himself as the son of God. These were the coins that were in circulation at Rome. Divius Ilius, divine Julius, and that's Augustus on the other side, his son. Which right. uh, some of the coins said Divius Filius, God's son. So that's right. the reason why I bring that up is because this is already a common trope in the in the pagan ancient world. Of course, and and Constantine, that wonderful person. What would we do without him? Um, you know, even after his conversion in the fall of three twelve, he still believed in Saul and Victus, and that that means the unconquerable son. Yeah. And it appeared in Roman coinage long after his conversion to Christianity. That's why I said from the get go, the sun was the epic god because it's the source of all life. Light. I understand the pagan world. Judaism was there. Say no, you got it all wrong. Everything, every power in the world is all from one source. Almighty Elohim. So that's yeah. that's great. And uh, Jason Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners. Thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate that. And we have some more. Get into those. Let's see what we got. A lot of comments. Thank you for the comments, by the way. Here we go. Constellation Pegasus. Again, 
<laughs> thank you. You don't understand how much I appreciate you, Constellation Pegasus. Like I, every time I see your name pop up on the in the comments, I I just love it. I love it. Thank you. Is it accurate to say Christianity is nothing but a late religious movement and a cult like Jehovah's Witness and a Seven Day Adventist? Also, Islam. Yeah, the the word is and whoever asked this question, you could refine it, amp it up a little bit if you'd like to. It's up to you because it's the word cult really in our conventional in our conventional language is a pejorative, but the word cult doesn't really mean that. Um, so. When we refer to the J witnesses as an example as a cult, we usually mean that as a pejorative in the sense that um, there's sort of mind control in the group, um, and they will um, and they would use deceptive practices, even though, and they seek to replace your family as your new family, and and you can get excommunicated just for disagreeing and so on. So the word "call." The problem with that word is, I wish I had a, you know, perhaps offer a better word for it, but so the word "call" just has an elastic meaning to it. But if the term cult is seeking out an orthodoxy and dismissing people who disagree with orthodoxy as people who are not just heterodox, but heretics. So certainly Christianity could be seen that way, but where the word is too vague. Let me, I just want to refine that for a moment. I want to refine that last point for a moment. I think it will help. So you all know that orthodox literally means the correct opinion. All right. But then there's this word heterodox, and then there's word heresy. And heterodox and heresy are synonyms, but they're not the same. They're not the same. And this might illustrate the difference between them. And that is uh, heterodox just means another belief. But it's not the correct belief, but it's another belief. The word heresy is that, but it's more. Heresy comes from a word which means um, to choose. That means to what is conveyed there is to willingly choose something that you know to be wrong. So it's amped up much more. So to the extent that Christians would allow fellow Christians to believe something similar but not identical, uh, for instance, people who are Lutherans versus Calvinists, so they they might not say that the other is unsaved, right? But in a strict cult, they would go only this way and any other way is unacceptable. And in the early church, there was, there was. I mean, look, I've often talked about how much, how, how, how so many things the church fathers said about the Jews was so terrible, and they are really terrible. But church fathers said things much worse about fellow Christians than they did about Jews. It just wasn't as personal. So in the church, it always was that if you did not believe in the correct Christology, even if you coined the term, the term Trinity, as Tertullian did at the turn of the third century uh, from Carthage, but Tertullian didn't believe in the orthodox understanding of a hypostatic union. So so it's hard to you know it's hard to apply the word cult, but if you mean the word cult as only one way, and then your brother says this kind of was, but I don't think it's the same extent as you would find in Branch Davidians, and they they're still around. And, and and I don't want to go further with this, but evangelical Christians believe that as an example, I have a totally different view of what the word cult even means. Uh, um, evangelicals would say that any group that believes in the New Testament but doesn't believe in the Trinity is a cult, right? So they would. So that's a completely different definition. So the word is just too elastic to say, mm, this is a cult, this is not, because the word doesn't really convey that. Sure. And I, I, I couldn't help but think of the quote, uh, God created Mormons so that Christians can, knows, can know how Jews feel. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> because, because that's the whole deal. 
I mean, Christians don't get that the reason why Judaism doesn't accept the Christian Messiah is because we do we use the same uh, method methodology that the evangelical Christians use to reject the Church of the Latter Day Saints. The same thing, right? Yeah. And including linguistically, like why is the Book of Mormon loaded? Why is the Book of Mormon loaded with chapter upon chapter of quotes directly from the King James Bible? Like, why would the King James appear in the Book of Mormon? Well, you reject that, and why would you think that God is using the Septuagint in the New Testament? Like, just I don't, I don't, I'm, I know that sounds like it's, you know, I'm being, but like, no, why? It's, it's a good just, question. It really is. Right? Yeah. Should like, well, like if you think that the that the Book of Mormon, for many, many reasons, can't be the Word of God, including that the Book of Mormon directly co quotes a 1611 King James. I'm not talking one chapter. I think about 20 chapters of the Book of Isaiah. It's like a lot. Like, And you're going, well, why would the angel Moroni like, speak in Jacobian English? Well, if you really believe that, if, you, if that makes sense to you, I tip my hat to you. But then you have to ask the question, like, why would the Rising of the Testament be using greek and be quoting from a septuagint from a greek translation i mean i mean just use apply the same rigorous methods yeah. to there you go right exactly this next question from ted francis by the way i appreciate the super chat it's a it's like a seven part question i don't <laughs> want to answer all of it but i'll just read it anyway uh what is olam haba and then won't come. and and then he says why does the serpent talk how did Balaam speak to God if he was wicked? And what's up with his donkey, too? Like I said, I told you, there's a lot of parts going on there. I don't know if you want to pick part of that, you want to answer. Uh, but yeah, they paid. Uh, thank you for the super chat. So let's take Olam Haba means the world to come. Okay. And it can refer to two stages of life. In Judaism, there are three stages of life, the life we're now experiencing. But then the word olam haba literally means the world to come. And those are divided into two stages. One is the afterlife. And then there is, so that's life after death, life after death. Okay. But then there's life after life after death. And that's the resurrection. Okay, so sure. Olam Haba just refers to anything past on the other side of the grave. The second question is really brilliant. Why does the serpent have the power of speech? So I want to, like, I want to just amp that up if we can just talk about the serpent because one of the things that I think people don't get is why is the serpent uh, bothered by Adam and Eve? Like, why is he messing with them? And people begin a chapter three and don't read the um, the buildup. So there are many things about the serpent. Listen carefully. The serpent could speak. I want you to think about what the serpent sounds like. Let's go through the quality of the serpent. We're told that the serpent can speak. The serpent could walk. Okay. By inference, the serpent was a connoisseur of good food because the curse later is that everything will be like dust, right? And the serpent was more intelligent than any other creature, any other creature, okay? He's the wisest of all creatures. So the serpent has the quality of walking, talking, intelligence, and enjoys good food. I ask you the question, enjoys good what, what does that sound like? Sounds like a human. Sounds like a human. That's exactly it. The point of Genesis 3 is, that remember what happened in Genesis 2. Adam is shown all the creatures in the world. He names them, but knows that he's not compatible with any of them. Now think about that for a moment. What is this, some sort of game? Is this ridiculous? Like Adam went hippopotamus? I don't know. Maybe not, right? Like what is happening there? Like, is this some sort of game? That's exactly what occurs right before the serpent emerges. So the serpent is something as close to human as possible as not human. The serpent's argument in Genesis 3, I'm not going to get deep into this, but this is important to know. What's really happening, what's being conveyed in the book of Genesis is that the serpent is as close to human as possible, but it's still an animal. And the serpent is suggesting to Eve that follow your instincts rather than what God says. Mm -hmm. Animals follow a primary instinct. They feel something and then they act upon it. Human beings, what would, I mean, if you had a creature that could walk, talk, speak, and was highly intelligent 
and enjoyed good food, that's about as close to human as possible, right? Then right. what is the difference between that creature and human? The only difference is that the human being is created in the image of God in the view of Genesis, and therefore distinct. The, the who of all the creatures in the world, who would feel most rejected by Adam's choice? Who would feel most rejected by Adam's rejection? That serpent. Why? Because if anybody would be suitable for Adam, it would be the walking, talking, thinking connoisseur of good food. And that would that serpent, that creature, would then seek to destroy the first couple. That's what's really going on there. And the serpents are like, what is the argument of the serpent? Like, why is the serpent is going to Eve, going, God said this. Like, we don't in the animal world, we don't follow what God says, no animal ever believed in God, we follow our instincts. And there's the clash. And what's being conveyed in Genesis, rather than a story about a walking, talking serpent, what is being conveyed rather is the distinction between man and all other creatures of the world. And that is to hear the voice of God. And that's what comes out so deliciously in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, where they hear the movement of God. Who do you what are you listening to? to? Are you listening to God through your instincts or through your ear? And no other animal in the world has ever believed in God. And that's why Genesis is so delicious. But you do have to understand what's happening. There also sounds like a silly stories. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's a good answer. Now, what about the Balaam part? Balaam speaking to God, but he was wicked? How does that work? Right. So every there's free will. So anybody could talk to God. Oh, uh, interesting. Right, right, right. So it's anybody, not as, so Judaism is not as... Uh, exclusive as people try to make it out to be. Right. That means that that's correct. That means in reform theology is the ultimate, the, I want to use the right term here. In reform theology and Calvinism, that's like the, the mother load of being a chosen people that God chose you to win the ultimate lottery that you're saved. Okay? Right. That's Calvin's view. That's really Augustine's view. And that really the argument easily made, that was Paul. I mean, Augustine didn't pull it out of his head. It was basically Paul and the Manichaeist world that he emerged from. But that's Reformed theology, okay? Uh, Judaism is it's accessible to anyone, and the Jews are just here to be a light to the nations, and everyone, every human being is creating the image of God, in the image of God, and has the potential to have a relationship with God and to speak to God. And the so, last, the last part of the question is just, what about his donkey too? You know, I mean, is just do you want to? Oh, so what's happening is the donkey could see we, you know, we spoke a moment ago about the serpent and what really is right. the definition of a human being. You know, the definition of a human being is that, you know, it, it, how is it different than an animal? Well, it's because it can, it can believe in God. So the point is that Bilaam was so wicked, he had become so depraved because of his own choices that he's making. What is conveyed in the text is that here his donkey is able to see an angel that Bilaam can't see to show oh, how blind, spiritually blind he is. So see, what's happening in Genesis, what's happening in the Torah is that, if, of course, it's describing uh it's using historical story, using stories to convey a message. It's not interested in walking, talking snakes. It's right. really trying to, it's talking about a person's blindness, how far a person can fall by his own choice. In Christian theology, that's impossible. Man is infected with the original sin. There's nothing man can do to save himself. If what I said to you makes no sense, it means you've never been to church before in your life, Romans chapter three. So that's what's going on there. It's really quite beautiful. Yeah, that makes sense. Good answer. Really good answer. Adam Green, thank you for your super chat. Who does Esau slash Edom represent today? And what will happen to them in the end times? Is your goal to convert Christians to Noahides? A lot of these double party questions, if, if I may ask people, well, actually, we're, we're, this is, we're probably getting towards, there's a few left after this. So let's, let's try to hold off on, if you're going to, if you're going to submit them, try to keep them one question, please. Just because we have, it's already been an hour you know, this takes a lot of time, but go ahead. Sorry about that. All right. So I just, I got the first question. Is Edom, um, what is today. Edom? Represent. Represent. Yeah. What was, what, who, who does Esau slash Edom represent today and what okay. will happen to them in the end times? Oh, so that, that's really easy. 
So Edom is Christendom. It is the implacable enemy of the Jewish people. That means it's not another religion that's just different than Judaism, like, I don't know, Buddhism or whatever, or Hinduism is different than Judaism. But in fact, Christendom, Christendom is the implacable enemy of the Jewish people. And the last kingdom, there are four enemy kingdoms of the nation of Israel that are that subjugated the Jewish people. And Edom, Edom is just the worst of everything. And that's Rome slash Christianity. The nature of the final kingdom in Tanakh, the fourth of the four kingdoms, is that it just morphs and morphs and changes. Remember Daniel chapter 7? So you have the, the lion with the wings and, and you have the um, uh, the bear with the three ribs in its mouth, Persia. You have the leopard four heads, makes sense. That's Greece yeah. and the four kingdoms. So when Daniel sees the fourth beast, he's going, he doesn't even, what am I looking at? And so there are uh, 10 kings, or uh, consensus is that that's from um, Julius Caesar to Vespasian, 10 Roman leaders, and then the small horn is Titus. But notice how the Roman Empire just morphs into Christianity. Uh, Christianity, uh, Rome did not convert to Christianity. Christianity converted to Rome. And it wasn't an accident that when the first Christian emperor, Constantine, following his conversion, he then assembles the Council of Nicaea in 325 in that summer, and then has it declared that the doctrine of the Trinity uh, is the orthodoxy, and the very immediately means the Council of Nicaea takes place in the summer of 325. Immediately after that, immediately after the Bishop of Alexandria wins and Arius is rejected, uh, following that, no Jew is allowed to walk into Jerusalem from 326 for 35 years, from 326 to 361, to Julian the Apostate, meaning a Christian, an emperor that reverted back to paganism, no Jew can enter Jerusalem. And then Julian, who wouldn't rule very long, would allow Jews back. But it was always the Jew, the Byzantine Empire, the heir to the fall, the Roman, the Byzantine Empire, the East, where it would continue. Now is Christian, Theodosius, that's the end right. of the fourth century. So, so Ace of Edom is the implacable enemy, enemy of the Jew. And an identifying feature of it is that it's constantly morphing, changing, but it's really the same thing. It only appears different, but it's really that fourth horse that has just many different colors. Yeah. So, and okay. Another thing that I, I noticed, and I'm not, and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Julian the Apostate, didn't he want to bring Jerusalem back to the Jews? Yeah, yeah wow. this is this is so interesting. It means he opens the door. You know, when if you're a Christian, please don't be offended. I'm a million, but you know, when people say, you know, only a Christian loves the Jewish people, you know, you know, the Christian emperors hated the Jews, and it, it took a guy to leave Christianity to go. They, they oh, either, I don't. I, they either kept him in ghettos or did Inquisition right. trials or forced him to convert or die. And they right. didn't treat him very well. They banned their Talmuds. They banned Jewish writings. Like, they were rough. Like, the tal the Holocaust is, is, is like, this is regular business. Ha like, I'm not saying it's that the Holocaust. The Holocaust was the worst of all. But it's not surprising when you look at the history before the Holocaust that it would lead up to that, if, that, if I'm not mistaken. Let, let's be brazen. The Holocaust only occurred in Christian countries. Yeah. And it was you know, non-Christian countries that saved the Jews. Let me amp this up more. I mean, so we're dealing with recent history, okay? My yeshiva, I studied in the Mir Yeshiva. So the Mir Yeshiva was saved by the Japanese, meaning the yeshiva I went to, of course, going a long time ago, ultimately made its way during the, literally during the Holocaust, made its way to occupy China and then Japan. And the Japanese were accepting Jewish refugees by the thousands. 
And the Germans are going, I mean, the, the, the reason why this is so significant is that Japan during World War II is definitely not a Christian country. They believed in God, but it wasn't, it wasn't the Christian God. So the Japanese were saving Jews by the thousands. And as you can imagine, the Germans were not happy with this because, hey, we're like buddies. Why do you, these are the exact people that will take over your government, your power will take over your economy and so on. And the Japanese said, well, that's the exact kind of people we need and let, and let thousands more in. And there's there many important books written about this. So the Japanese, which was not a Christian country, was saving Jews while Christian countries were sticking them in ovens. Absolutely. It's not yeah. an accident. Yeah, that's just real history. Right. And right. so Gerade Decian is back again. Cosmology question was about, so they're going back to their question. The cosmology question was about the solid dome does Rabbi take that literally? Some say moral of the story, not astronomy. I don't see, and I have never seen any evidence for this at all. I, in in Tanakh, um, uh, the Earth is referred to as a, a circle, and that the Earth is hanging in bulima, in nothingness. There is nothing compelling in Tanakh that would convey that the that the Earth is made of a of a dome. I I've looked at all the sources and I've never found anything that re resembles that. Courageous has a question: What is the suffering servant Isaiah fifty three about? Christians incorrectly believe it's about Jesus. I know we did a whole video on this, but if yeah, you want, you, you could just you could just give a quick little. Just a quick sure. little answer if you want. The problem for Christians is that they know Isaiah 53 by heart. They know it really well. But if you ask Christians what is Isaiah 52 or 54, they have to look it up. And the question is why? So there's such a selective knowledge that they get themselves into a lot of trouble. As you can imagine, you could take any book, Holy, Not Holy, that has 66 chapters. And if you began with the 53rd, you wouldn't know what's going on. And Isaiah in particular, 90% of the book of Isaiah is poetry. It's using biblical poetry, not like Shakespearean, but it's, it's poetic. Only six of the chapters are using standard prose and standard chronology. So as it turns out, Isaiah 53 is the fourth of four servant songs. One of the things that every Christian must answer is, who is speaking in Isaiah 53? specifically who is speaking Isaiah 53, verse 1 through verse 8. If you don't know who's talking in a text, who's the speaker, you can go home. You'll never understand the text. I mean, that, that makes complete sense. And if you ask Christians who is speaking in Isaiah 53, who, who's speaking, you'll get answers like God is speaking or Isaiah is speaking, and none of those are correct. In Isaiah 53, the nations of the world are speaking in, in their numbed astonishment. How do you know? It says it. Isaiah 52, verse 15. That's the passage right before Isaiah 53. One, the, uh, the chapter break is artificial. So shall he shock, stun, cast down many nations. Nations will shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not told to them, they will see. That which they never considered, they will finally hear. And they begin by the Gentile kings of nations begin the 53rd chapter with a question. Right. Who would have believed such a thing? So the non-Jews are speaking in the Messianic age. Now the question is, who are they speaking about? Now, as it turns out, there's only two places in Isaiah 53. One actually is in 52, verse 13, and in, in 53, that the servant is the the one who it's speaking about is Avdi, my servant. Now the question is, who is my servant? Well, the only way to know is if Isaiah 53 is the fourth of four servant songs, what we would expect to find exactly what we discover. And that is, if we just back up going to the first of the first four servant songs, meaning Isaiah, and I'll give it to you, and if someone wants to type this in, you, so you you look it up. Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9. Literally, it describes the servant as Israel, okay? Isaiah 42, verse 6. There we have explicitly a 
Brit Am, a covenant nation, and an oral agreement. Isaiah 43, verse 10, the servant is more than one person. Atem Mashem, Avdi you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. Isaiah 44, verse 1, Isaiah 44, verse 21, Isaiah 45, verse 4, Isaiah 48, verse 20, you use Isaiah 49, verse 3. You see where this is all going. I don't want to overwhelm you. So when we go to all the texts that 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 precede Isaiah 83, we know exactly who the servant is. Let me say this to you. And if you're a Christian, I really want to talk to you for a moment. There are many things that Jews and Christians could disagree about, but there is something axiomatic, and that is we can say with certainty that the, the author of the book of Isaiah presuppose that if you're reading the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, you have already read the chapters that introduce it. If that's not axiomatic, then then we can throw the whole thing out the window. Especially, this is true, when you're looking at, at, at texts that are all using, employing poetry. Again, not poetry in, in, a, in a Shakespearean sense, but it's using symbolic language. All of it is. So therefore, if 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 you just know 53, because that's what you learned in church, to memorize that, and you don't know what Isaiah 50, 51, 52 is, do you know how much trouble you're in? <laughs> and this is what happened. This is why I care about Christians, because what's happening is they're they're taught selectively. They don't have access to the original Hebrew. And I haven't gone into the Hebrew text how it's been altered. I'm just being this is very superficial. Right. So that's it. It it, it says you, right here, Isaiah right. 44, verse 21. It says it can't, this can't be any clearer. This is literally the clearest it can possibly get. It says, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, you are my servant. I have for you my servant, O Israel. I mean, I don't know what else to say. If you can't get it, if you can't grasp that, right? you're just, exactly. you're just not trying. You're just not trying. Right. But right. Uh, we, have, we have about five more I want to get to, if that's okay with All you. All right, sure, go. Okay. Constellation Pegasus is last one. Why is the Pallades constellation in the Bible? Believe it or not, Jehovah's Witness actually believed God lived there. Yes, that's a fact. I have, I have no idea. <laughs> I Hey, we don't know. We're not. Out, we're not all knowing. No, I, ne I never even heard that before. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Well, thank you for that super chat, and um, let's go to the next one. Let's see. There's a couple more. There's like four more, I think, after this. Maybe five. Let's see. Dion Yasion. Chiastic structure is used extensively in fiction and mythic writings like the Rig Veda, Odyssey, Aeneid, Harry Potter, etc. Why should I assume that the Bible is an equally fictional? when I see the structure in the Bible. Right. So, so because we see um, different literary devices in Tanakh, we would then expect that those literary devices would not be used by other peoples and other nations. I mean, does that follow? Let's just for a moment. If, if, we have an event described in the Torah. Would we, and the Torah is saying that it's a historical event. Let's take something, wow, an event that the Torah says occurred roughly 4,500 years ago, the flood, right? So if the flood was historical, for a moment if it was, then we would expect to find the flood in other narratives all over the place. So if Tanakh is using linguistic structures, and then other um, cultures would be using the same. That doesn't mean that 9 11, you know, there's something happened. Probably, you know, we know who flew those planes into the buildings, but and into the Pentagon, but there are other people who have other ideas. Doesn't mean that one view is not correct because other people have borrowed and then changed it. So there's nothing to suggest that, uh, and look at look, look at the world. More, about one out of two people on this planet believe that the Jewish Torah is the Word of God. Um, but they have other ways of viewing the Jewish Scripture. So why would we expect anything else? Sure, that's a good answer and good question as well. Henry M. Thank you for the super chat. Says thanks for all you do, and thank you for the super chat. I really. I really appreciate it. Like you guys have been awesome today, but with these, a lot, I've, this is a lot of super chats today. This is 
they must like you, to Rabbi. So I'm, I'm a big to, hit over I, here. I'm gonna have to have you back on soon. <laughs> right. Rex Profanus. Thank you for super chat. Do any Jewish groups or any Jews that you are aware of have any take on Roman elite family, the Pisos? Any Pisos from the first to second century? No. <laughs> no. I apologize, but no. Is that like a Roman providence type of yeah. thing? Yeah. Yeah, I'm there's nothing like that in the Talmud, so it's not there. You know what I think that if you're gonna go Roman providence, forget the Pisos. There's a there's a character named Tiberius Julius Alexander. He was the second highest in command next to Vespasian. And he was living in Alexandria. He's a Jew of he's a genetically a yeah, he's a Jew by birth, but he's an apostate. He's not a worshiper, he's not if you're gonna go with Roman providence, go to that guy. Start right. studying with that guy because you got a right. guy. He was there for the temple being destroyed, mm-hmm. so you might you might have something with that guy. But the pisos, I'm just like I don't. I'm not seeing just, it. just like you say Nazi. Did you? If you say like Nazi, you know, one of the key figures in developing Nazi Aryan ideology was a man named Otto Winninger, who was a genius. And he developed the idea of an inferior race. And he did it at a very young age. Wow. And he was an Austrian Jew. He was so self-hating that his ideas um, his ideas were key for the Nazis in developing and fully developing their ideas. Uh, he's not the only person, but he's he's key. He hated himself so much that he, of course, converted to what do you think? Do I need to tell you? He converted to Christianity, not Buddhism, right? To eradicate the Jew in him. But that wouldn't do. And he eventually blew his brains out, killed himself. Because wow. it was the only right. Otto Winninger. So throughout history, we've had these Jews who had such self-hatred that they, we go back to the Bible. The guy who's, who represents Sancher of the Assyrian Empire was a Jew. His name was Rav Shaka, and he's screaming in Hebrew to the Jews to surrender, and Hezekiah refuses. So that's a theme we find throughout our history, that the, the Jews were very much, I mean, Jews are capable of producing prophets or producing the, the, or producing the most evil people on earth. Absolutely. Good point. It's a good question. I like I like people. I like going in topics like that. It's fun. Anyways, Canadian Catholic says thoughts about the Septuagint. Could have been a little more specific, my friend, but uh, yeah, that's the question. I'll, I'll blow to you. So here's the deal. Okay, I'll no, I'll blow this out and I'll just fill it in. The original Septuagint was translated by 70 slash 72 scholars, about 250 before the Common Era, okay? That was a translation of only the five books of Moses. Right. Okay? It, was, it was done for the Alexandrian Library. It doesn't exist anymore. Scholars, real scholars of the Septuagint, refer to that as the proto-Septuagint, okay? So the original Septuagint was just the five books of Moses. The sources for this are, is almost endless. That means you have the letter of Aristide, you have Josephus, you have Jerome's introduction to the Book of Chronicles, you have the Talmud, it's all over, just, just the five books of Moses. Now, subsequently, uh, people started translating not just the five books of Moses, but all of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language. Problem. They kept calling their translation the Septuagint. So people think today that when you go online on Amazon and order a Septuagint, that you're getting the thing written by rabbis 2,200 years ago. That's complete nonsense. The original Septuagint is gone. It is lost. I have an entire chapter on this in volume two of Let's Get Biblical. What, what I'm telling you is not, a, this is just, you just, now what happens later subsequently is that Christian writers, most importantly, is the church father origin. He's a genius. He was one of only two church fathers that were completely literate in Hebrew. He and Jerome, that was it. And Origen would ultimately reproduce the Septuagint we have today. He's most re- responsible for the current Septuagint. And he would then insert, he's not the only one who would do this, insert Christologies, which means produce a Greek 
translation that matches the corruption in the New Testament. And then you are told in Christian schools that the writers of the New Testament were using a Septuagint, even though the Septuagint is never mentioned in the New Testament. And why would God be using a Greek translation? So that's why it is important. So when you really want to refer to the Septuagint, that's the original Septuagint, that's only in the five books of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch. And that's called the, the Proto-Septuagint. And that's gone completely. There it is. And, then, and there's a whole story about that in book 12 of Josephus about right. uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus and his obsession to translate all the books into Greek. And he wants to find the, the sacred, he calls them the sacred books of the Jews. And he, he commissions 72 Jews, like you said, to come over to, to Alexandria. And the story goes that they all magically came up with the same oral Torah, which we don't know if it's true or not, but. They were all placed into separate rooms. Each right. translator was put. There was seventy-two rooms. Each was, uh, each was given a pen and something to write on. Right. And each, and then when they were all done, they all produced the same exactly the same story, exactly yeah. the same translation. There's an old joke, Jewish joke about that, and that is so. The, the idea there, uh, letter Aristides, but the 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 idea is that it was a miraculous translation. Because seventy-two people individually rendered the Torah, in, and and the the joke is that a bigger miracle would be that if you can get seventy-two Jews into one room and they can all actually agree on the translation, that would have been a great That's miracle. That's a good joke. I like that. Yeah. If this you show- borrow it, I'll sue you. I'll get my Jewish lawyer after. You. I'm just saying, if it comes up, <laughs> if if it comes up on on Gnostic informant my Jewish lawyer is going to be knocking on your door. All right, all right, fair enough. Vishanti, the $2 super chat, thank you, says, Kol Hakavad, Rabbi, Rabbi Singer. Kol Hakavad. Kol Hakavod, which means, uh, it literally means means literally all the honor. It means thank you very much. Wow, interesting. It means, it, it means like. That's a great super chat. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see. There might, be, there might be one or two more. I think, here we go. Blake. Thank you for the super chat, Blake. Can a male still be considered Jewish if he refuses to undergo the cutting of the flesh from Genesis 17? Yes. That means that if a male is not circumcised, so that person is obligated to circumcise himself or have someone circumcise him. And if he doesn't do that, so it's a... It's a sin for which God will forgive you. I'm giving answering as straight as possible. That God would forgive you if you if the person would repent of that. Um, the prohibition would be if a person, a male, was uncircumcised, is that he would not, for example, be able to eat from the uh, carbon pesach, the Passover sacrifice. But a person is Jewish, but a person is. Um, every male of the Jewish people is obligated to be circumcised. Good question. The, uh, right. Go ahead. That was a good question. Good answer. And sure. uh, Constellation Packet says, love you, Mr. Singer. Thank you for the super chat. Thank you. And I think there might be one or two more, if I'm not mistaken, but that might be, it might be it. I just don't see them in front of me. I got to, got to scroll down to see if that was the last one. Here we go. Dion Yassian. Thank you for the incredible answer. Oh, because they have they, they asked a super chat question before. And thank you for the second super chat, by the way. So appreciate that. And uh I think that might be it. Oh, here we go. All right. What were you gonna say? No, I was it's no, it's fine. It works out. Well, well, here it's in Jerusalem, it's 1 30 in the morning, 1 20. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to get to that. This, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this might be the last so, one. Okay. Gorilla Radio says. Any info on St. Lawrence and Jewish history? Let me just see how many are left, depending on how long we should. That's the last one. Okay. This is, the question is, any info on St. Lawrence and Jewish history? This is the last one. I'm, I'm not familiar with St. Lawrence. I couldn't tell you, so maybe we can. Maybe you can just uh, wrap that one up then. All right. Thank Here. you for the super chat. And uh, yeah, like I, you know, we're not all knowing. We're not omnipotent over here. We're just, you know, there's just two guys and trying to answer questions. And Right. But yeah, that is the final one. And I really thank you for coming on today. This has been fun. And uh, by the way, just want to remind everybody on my 
on my um, Patreon tomorrow night will be, so people who are watching this later, right now, my, on my Patreon, the exclusive video for Rabbi and me talking about Daniel 9 and what it mm. actually means. I mean, this is talking about 70 weeks the Messiah will be cut down. How can that not mean Jesus of Nazareth, right? Well, we have the full hour and a half, I think it was, explanation of what exactly this text is talking about and that you can find on my Patreon. It will be public very soon as well. I just like to put it on there first. So stay tuned, stay subscribed for that. Anything you want to uh, promote before we go? No, I, I our website, outreachjudaism.org, and the YouTube channel is just my name, Toby Singer, and it's a joy um, uh, joining you here. And I can't see you, but all those who join us, it's really, uh, thank you very much for joining me here on the show. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you.